Afro pessimism Afro pessimism 3 pp INDD 1 Afro pessimism 3 pp IN Afro pessimism also by FRANKBWILDERSON3 Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid red, white and black cinema and the structure of U.S. Afro pessim Afro pessimism Frank B W I L D E R S O N three L I V E R I G H T Publishing Corp. Published names and other potentially identifying characteristics of some people in this book have been changed. Some people depicted or composites. All rights reserved. Printed in the United States of America. First edition excerpts from Close Up, Fugitivity, and the Filmic Imagination. Social excerpt excerpts from Big No Speech. Reprinted with kind permission of you. To Anita Wilkins, Afro pessimism, Afro pessim To Anita Wilkins, for your love, to doctors Ida Lorraine and Frank B. Wilderson Jr. for molding my mind, to Asada Shakur and Winnie Mandela for everything. Afro, Afro pessimism, contents acknowledgments Shi'i Chapter One for Halloween I washed my face Three Chapter Two Juice from a neck bone Nineteen Chapter Three Hattie McDaniel is dead. 55 Chapter 4 Punishment Park 147 2 Chapter 5 The Trouble with Humans 191 Chapter 6 Mind the Closing Doors 231 Chapter 7 Mario's 253 Epilogue The New Century 309 Notes 343 Afro Pessimism 3 pp INDD 9 Afro Pessimism 3 pp Acknowledgements In 2013-2014 I spent 11 months at the University of Bremen, Germany, as an Alexander von Humboldt experienced research fellow. In Germany, I started writing an academic monograph that explained how and why human capacity, the power to be a subject of relations, is violently parasitic on black flesh. Why Orlando Patterson's brilliant delineation of slavery needed to be abstracted in a way that showed how the human is not an organic entity but a construct. A construct that requires its other in order to be legible, and why the human other is black. I was, and am, deeply indebted to the works of key thinkers who have also grappled with this highly controversial claim, Saidiya Hartman, Zakia Iman Jackson, Joy James, David Marriott, Jared Sexton. Hortense Spillers, and Sylvia Winter. I took them to Germany the way Isella takes his Bible abroad. The idea for a book that would become a cross between creative nonfiction and critical theory came to me toward the end of my time in Bremen. For eight months my labors had been torn between a novel I was writing and the monograph I was funded to write. Without the freedom from teaching and administration, coupled with the library resources at my Afro Pessimism 3 pp, INDD 11 Afro Pessimism 3 pp, acknowledgments XII disposal, and the intellectuals, activists, and artists I communed with. I might not ever have considered embarking upon a book that weaves the abstract thinking of critical theory with blood and gut stories of life as it's lived. The hybrid seed you hold in your hands. In addition, EUC Irvine's Humanities Commons gave me a publication support grant that helped me in the home stretch. Bob Weil, editor-in-chief and publishing director of LiveWrite, is someone steeped in knowledge of the black literary tradition. From having edited some of the most influential black writers of the 20th and 21st centuries, not only did he bring laughter and friendship to our encounters, but he brought a unique improvisational literary vision needed to help me reconcile diverging characteristics of theory and storytelling. A project that many other editors might have found too daunting to attempt. Gabriel S. Kuchuk, Bob's editorial assistant, is a jack-of-all-trades who has yet to meet a problem he can't solve. My thanks also to Amy Medeiros and Dave Cole, for the fine copy editing work they did. Peter Miller, Live Rights Director of Publicity, and Cordelia Calvert, Publicity Manager. Worked tirelessly with Liz Cole of Evil Twin Booking on Gretchen Crary of February Media to launch a remarkable media and appearances campaign. My agent, Charlotte Gousset, and her intern Sophie G.V.U., Julia Murray, and Richie Stone were invaluable in the help they provided me during the production of the book proposal and in pitching the book to editors. Special thanks to Jocelyn Burrell, Adam Fitzgerald, Fred Moten, Claudia Rankin, and Alexei Sishin, whose friendship, support, advice, and critique go far beyond what I can acknowledge here. 
In addition, there are many activists, scholars, artists, and traditional healers who have also supported and encouraged me throughout the writing of this book. Alexis Hernandez Abreu, Babalawo Radamar Hernandez Abreu. Acknowledgements XIII Babalawo Noel M. Heard, Sam Paderak, Franco Barchiese, Jed Bickman, James Bliss, Heinrich Bomke, Wellington Bowler, Sebastian Borsma, Nicholas Brady, Sabine Broke, Gregory L. Caldwell, LaShonda. Bridget Cooks, Cecilio M. Cooper, Huey Copeland, Ben Crossan, Jerome Dent, Patrice Douglas, Paula Von Gleich, Jay Gossett, Venus Green, Sora Han, Zakia Henderson Brown, Othi Mangazil, Eli Joja, Karsten Junker, Peter Kent Stolp, Ellen Lewis Prathnalor, Marinage of Denmark, especially Mika's Lang and Yannick Nehemiah, Dana E. Martinez, Kirsten Mertens, Andile Mengshi Tama, Jaleel Abdul Muntaki, David Mirat, John Murillo, Athena Ngamso Esther Nikopo, Lynette Park, Raja Gopal and Radhakrishnan, Omar Ricks, Miriam Sauer, Hannibal Shakur, Sarah Maria Sorrentino, Samira Spatsik, Kai Thomas, Salama Witt de Terefe, Joao Costa Vargas, Parisa Vaziri, Carol Vaubel, Cassian Vaubel, J. Austin Williams, Wendell Woods, and Milandi Zandi. Finally, with love and gratitude I extend my appreciation to my wife, Anita Wilkins who counseled me to make the problem your subject during those frustrating moments when seemingly insurmountable problems of writing haunted my forward momentum. More than that, she shared this intellectual journey with me in late-night discussions on the challenges Afro-pessimism presents to storytelling when the narrator is a slave. Afro-pessimism 3pp, INDD 13 Afro-pessimism 3pp, IND Afro-pessimism 3pp Afro pessimism. Afro pessimism. Three. I I came into the world imbued with the will to find a meaning in things. My spirit filled with the desire to attain to the source of the world. And then I found that I was an object in the midst of other objects. France fan and I'm prized most as a vector through which others can accomplish themselves. Cecilio M Cooper. Afro pessimism. Three P P I N D D one. Afro pessimism. Afro. Pe 3 Chapter 1 For Halloween I Washed My Face 1 A psychotic episode is no picnic. Especially if you know you can't call it madness because madness assumes a change in the weather, a season of saw and a why. I was moaning, sobbing, the crisp disposable sheet that lined the gurney rusped as I shifted. I sat up when they came into the room. No one was going to strap me down. But I didn't climb down for fear of giving them cause. In the glare of fluorescence, they, the doctor and the nurse were white as dust. The gurney rattled as I shook and cried. They didn't approach. They didn't call for help, not for themselves nor for me, a monstrous aphasic too black for care. That's how I saw them see me. And my urge to save them from me eclipsed my desire to be cured. But I couldn't speak, not even to tell them that I wanted to protect them from me. Cluster bombs spiked in my heart. I clutched my chest and cried out. Did they take a step back? Is it your heart? The doctor asked. I wanted to laugh. The funny thing about a mouth is that it needs to Afro-pessimism 3 Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 4 close as well as open if a word is to be made. Mine wouldn't close, if it closed, I knew it wouldn't open. The hinges of my jaws made moans or howls but not words. I thought, how funny is that? I answered him in the words of a bird as its throat is slit. You keep clutching your chest, he said. Are you having a sharp pain, somewhere in the region of the heart? I nodded my head. Tell me more, he said. But I felt my lips twisting grotesquely, I didn't want to start sobbing again. He told me to take my time. The nurse nodded gravely, as though she were peering at a pug-nosed puppy in a cage. I had an urge to answer her gaze with a pug-nosed puppy bark. As this surge grew, her sadness deepened. My bark and her sad, saucer eyes were headed for a collision. Rough, rough, give me a biscuit. My head was splitting and so were my sides but not in the same register of emotion. Sir Belly laugh rose up from my torso and met Mr. Why the fuck am I alive, who had fallen through my raging skull and landed in my throat. The sadness drained from the nurse's eyes. She was her frightened self again. 
The puppy love had morphed into her need for self-preservation from this hulking black mass with matted, uncombed hair and orbs of fireworks bursting from holes where the eyes should be. The doctor sat on a stool, with one foot on the lower rung, one foot on the floor. But the nurse remained standing. He massaged the luxury and eyebrow with his index finger and waited. Laughter is good, he said. Why don't you tell us what's so funny? I wanted to say, would it be alright if I barked? I realized, however, that I would seem crazier if I asked his permission to bark than if I showed some initiative and simply barked without making a big deal of it. I fell through the chasm of laughter and tears. No one had taken me to the student health center. I got there on my own. As I sat on the gurney, sobbing, hearing the fear of the world in the doctor's and nurse's eyes. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 6 The apartment was small, just a bathroom, then a bedroom, a kitchen, and a living room. In each room I found something for my hand to hold the closet door, the stove, the back of a kitchen chair. In each room I found something for my hand to hold the closet door, the stove, the back of a kitchen chair the rows of living room bookshelves that ended at the front door. The front door closed behind me. I was overcome with vertigo, as I looked down those seven steps, as though I were looking into a deep ravine. The urge to faint and the urge to vomit went to blows in my body. Bad karma, I thought, through wet blurries. I thought I would pass out. My Honda Civic dozed at the curb like a small blue lizard. My keys scratched the wrought iron railing as I stumbled down. We're going trick-or-treating, I thought with a laugh, we've washed our face and we're wearing our school clothes. A beast with insane rage struggled to burst through my skin in a shower of blood and bile. I wanted to cry. One palm pressed against the window. One set of fingers fumbled with the keys. Help me, somebody, I sobbed into my neck, hoping no white person would hear. Please, somebody help me. Now, lying on the gurney, I recalled the threads of silver puke spooling onto the hood of my car. Then, without knowing how or why, I was on a bus in downtown Berkeley. I saw myself seeing myself through the eyes of passengers on the bus as I slumped to one side and softly sobbed. Make them feel safe, I had thought to myself, even though I had never felt more at risk. I would think it again when the nurse and the doctor first came into this white sepulchre where I lay. Make them feel safe, the cardinal rule of Negro diplomacy. Now, alone in the clinic, trombones of light blistered my eyes and the room grew cold. But if I closed them a string of past lives skidded down my skull like a train that had jumped the rails above a ravine. Each cascading car was a carriage of time. The engine was the time of now, the time of this moment on the gurney. Then came tumbling down a carriage of time that carried my life in apartheid South Africa, Afro-Pessimism 3 pp, IND, AFROPESSIMISM 7 where Mandela's promises flickered and choked like the last gasps of lampposts. All that bloodshed for a flag and anthem nation, the mist of mythology, and tough love from his cronies who rebuked the so-called ultra-left with, now, comrades. You must understand that you cannot eat your principles. The next car that shot down the cliff face was the 1980s, a first-class compartment of nerves and ulcers. I was a newly minted college graduate who thought pain, like anything else in this life, could be traded on the floor of the exchange. For eight years between graduating from Dartmouth and immigrating to South Africa to fight against apartheid, I worked as a retail stock broker. The first black stock broker in Minnesota, I was told by the sales manager who so proudly hired me. Two those eight years all but ruined my health. The side of my face twitched and shuddered at will. An ulcer cinched the lining of my stomach. My internist wasn't the first person to make this prognosis. Jasmine, a secretary at Merrill Lynch's head office on Wall Street, whom I'd met one summer during a month of training, had also told me that I didn't belong in that profession. She was right and I knew it at the time, but money is a great motivator. Now I'll stood a good chance of spending all that money on long-term care if I didn't do something fast. You're not a capitalist, my intern has told me. You don't have the gut for it. I want money. I need moan why.
You drink 8 cups of coffee a day. Your cheek blinks like a Morse code lamp. You should wait till your ulcer is the size of my pinky, is that what you should do? I tried to slow down, which meant my sales slowed down, and Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 7. Frank VWILDERSON38 Soon it became clear that I should quit before the sales manager embarrassed me and ushered me out. I took a job as a waiter at an exclusive lakeside beach club, which did not admit Jews until the late 1960s and didn't have its first black member until the mid-1970s. The clientele ran the gamut from Dan Aykroyd and Jim Belushi, whose entourage left the interior of the ballroom in need of, to say the least, repair, to the old blue blood families that had tried to keep my parents out of the neighborhood in 1962. One day I walked into the ballroom balancing a large tray of nine Caesar salads on my shoulder. The tray wobbled and almost fell when I saw the faces at the table I'd been sent to. They were colleagues former colleagues from the brokerage firm I had left two months ago. I slowly got hold of the lie I'd told them when I left. Tired of working for the man, fellas. Going to try my hand as a private dealmaker, with a little financial planning on the side. One by one I laid their salads down. My name sputtered out of their mouths, Frank, a question tucked into a gasp. I quit a week later, which made no sense, they had seen me, the lie was laid bare, and went to work for less pay at an art museum. I worked as a guard at the Walker Art Center overlooking downtown Minneapolis and I licked my wounds from the Calhoun Beach Club and ate ethically bankrupt years as a stockbroker. The first intifada had just begun in Palestine and I had a dear friend from Ramallah who was also a guard at the museum. His name was Samir Bashara. He was a photographer who studied at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. We shared the same politics, revolutionary, and star sign. Aries. Two people who were often wrong but never in doubt. If we were in an airplane, Samir once told me, and we crashed in the desert and a survivor's detail was formed, some people would be tasked with finding water. It would be the job of others to forage for food and firewood, and we would need a team to build a shelter from what could be salvaged from the crash. But you, Frank, you would be the F A F R O P E S S I M I S M 91 sitting back giving us orders. I didn't spoil the satisfaction he got from the dig by telling him he had mapped onto me traits that were just as applicable to him. Most of the guards were either artists or writers or students, but only Samir shared my politics of insurrection. We bonded early and kept our distance from the others. I told him of my college dreams of going to Zimbabwe and fighting for Sanu, Zapu or to New York to join Asada Shakur and the Black Liberation Army. Samir longed to return to Ramallah in order to make what he thought would be a more meaningful contribution to the Intifada than the talks he gave to moist-eyed Minnesota liberals. He was 25, I was 31. In five years, I would be the same age France Fanon was when he died in the custody of the Central Intelligence Agency. By the time Fanon died, in 1961, he had fled Martinique, his native land, joined de Gaulle's army, and had been wounded fighting the Nazis. He had also completed his internship in psychiatry and medicine, joined the FLN in the Algerian Revolution, and penned four books on revolution and psychoanalysis. I had five years to catch him, a bar set high by my shame demon. Hubris at low places was where I lived. Much the same was true for Samir. What a waste, he told me, photographing Scandinavians and loons when he felt he should be back home making bombs. We had different shoulders but they bore the same chip. I was convinced of this one morning when he came to work smiling, despite the fact that his right eye was slightly bulbous and closed. Last night, he informed me, a friend of mine from Palestine and I met these two gorgeous women. Wait, of course, he added under his breath, and I didn't bother to question this, of course. Because I wasn't sure that he wasn't wrong. That white means beauty goes without saying is the message one is fed all of one's life. To protest the contrary is like saying, it's not about money, after you've been shortchanged. F. Frank Vwilderson 310 Samir said that he and his friend could have taken them home if three rich Kuwaitis hadn't sauntered into the lounge. 
When one of the Kuwaitis made a move on the woman Samir was talking to, Samir told him, in a kind way, to go back to his booth. The man scoffed, you don't even have your own country. But he went back, as the night wore on the Kuwaiti sent champagne to Samir's table. Then all three of them approached. They offered to take the women to an exclusive after-party at a penthouse suite in the suburb of Edina. Just you two, the Kuwaiti Samir had sent packing said, not these stateless ones. Since the Kuwaitis numbered three and Samir and his friend numbered two, the Kuwaitis accepted Samir's offer to discuss the details of the after-party in the parking lot. The teeth of the time clock pierced Samir's time card. I followed suit, as he donned the blue museum blazer that we all wore. We walked together to the main gallery. As I continued walking, to take up my position on the mezzanine level, he smiled and whispered, we beat those Kuwaitis until we retired. It wasn't as much buck horns locked over the pride of possession of two forbidden females that sparked the dust up in the parking lot, though that was surely part of it. What seared the flesh on his skin the most was the Kuwaitis' ridicule of Samir's statelessness. I thought I had the same loss too, because I thought my suffering was analogous to his. I was not an Afro-pessimist then. I would have beaten them too, I said. A high, grassy knoll abutted the building that housed the Walker Art Center. The knoll is gone now, scalped clean as a root canal to make room for a restaurant. But when it was still a hill, Samir and I would take our lunch there. In springtime, when the cold broke and the sky cleared, the hilltop commanded a sweeping AFROPESSIMISM 11 swans tracing Loring Park Lake. Distant cars in downtown streets sparkled like sequins in the sun. And from that knoll you could see the Basilica of St. Mary's Copper Dome corroded by melted snow and driving rain to a blue-green brilliance that made me think ruin was the only true object of love. The knoll was also a vantage point from which death in the making would be seen. Just below it was the bottleneck, an intersection where three streets converged into one, a place where some of the most horrifying collisions occurred. As a tween reading spy novels, I used to imagine the bottleneck is a stretch of the German Autobahn where John Le Carre's ill-fated spy, Alec Lemas, saw two young children waving cheerfully from the window of a small car, and the next moment saw it smashed between two large lorries. That hill was where Samir told me about his cousin who was killed in Ramallah, blown up while making a bomb. But he wasn't a suicide bomber. It was an accident. Samir blamed himself, the way that survivors often do, no matter how near or far in space and time they are from their dead. He survived by being here and not there. My friend spoke openly as we watched the world below us rush by without even looking up to pay its respects. At one point Samir spoke of being stopped and searched at Israeli checkpoints. He spoke in a manner that seemed not to require my presence. I hadn't seen this level of concentration and detachment in him before. That was fine. He was grieving. The shameful and humiliating way the soldiers run their hands up and down your body, he said. Then, he added, but the shame and humiliation runs even deeper if the Israeli soldier is an Ethiopian Jew. The earth gave way. The thought that my place in the unconscious of Palestinians fighting for their freedom was the same dishonorable place I occupied in the minds of whites in America and Israel chilled me. I gathered enough wits about me to tell him that his feelings were odd, seeing how Palestinians were at war with Israelis. And white Afro-pessimism 3 pp. I and Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 12 Israelis at that. How is it that the people who stole his land and slaughtered his relatives were somehow less of a threat in his imagination than black Jews, often implements of Israeli madness, who sometimes do their dirty work? What, I wondered silently, was it about black people, about me, that made us so fungible we could be tossed like a salad in the minds of oppressors and the oppressed? I was faced with the realization that in the collective unconscious Palestinian insurgents have more in common with the Israeli state and civil society than they do with black people. What they share is a largely unconscious consensus that blackness is a locus of abjection to be instrumentalized on a whim. At one moment blackness is a disfigured and disfiguring phobic phenomenon. 
At another moment blackness is a sentient implement to be joyously deployed for reasons and agendas that have little to do with black liberation. There I sat yearning, in solidarity with my Palestinian friends yearning, for the full restoration of Palestinian sovereignty, mourning, in solidarity with my friends mourning, over the loss of his insurgent cousin. Yearning, that is, for the historical and political redemption of what I thought was a violated commons to which we both belonged when, all of a sudden, my friend reached down into the unconscious of his people and slapped me upside the head with a wet gym shoe, the startling realization that not only was I barred, ab initio, from the denouement of historical and political redemption, but that the borders of redemption are polished by whites and non-whites alike, even as they kill each other. It's worse than that. I, as a black person, if person, subject being are appropriate, since human is not, am both barred from the denouement of social and historical redemption and needed if redemption is to attain any form of coherence. Without the articulation of a common negrophobogenesis that relays between Israel and Palestine, the narrative coherence of their bloody conflict would evaporate. Frank Bwildreson 314 of Undecidability, which locates the site at which the text most obviously undermines its own rhetorical structure, dismantles or deconstructs itself. But when I say that black people embody or deconstructs itself. But when I say that black people embody a metaporia for political thought and action. The addition of the prefix meta goes beyond what Erda and the post-structuralists meant, it raises the level of abstraction and, in so doing, raises the stakes. In epistemology, a branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge the prefix meta is used to mean about its own category. Metadata, for example, are data about data, who has produced them, when, what format the data are in, and so on. In linguistics, a grammar is considered as being expressed in a meta-language, language operating on a higher level of abstraction to describe properties of the plain language and not itself. Meta discussion is a discussion about discussion, not any one particular topic of discussion but discussion itself. In computer science, a theoretical software engineer might be engaged in the pursuit of metaprogramming, i.e., writing programs that manipulate programs. Afro-pessimism, then, is less of a theory and more of a meta-theory, a critical project that, by deploying blackness as a lens of interpretation, interrogates the unspoken, assumptive logic of Marxism, post-colonialism, psychoanalysis, and feminism through rigorous theoretical consideration of their properties and assumptive logic, such as their foundations, methods, form, and utility, and it does so, again on a higher level of abstraction than the discourse and methods of the theories it interrogates. Again, Afro-pessimism is, in the main, more of a meta-theory than a theory. It is pessimistic about the claims theories of liberation make when these theories try to explain black suffering or when they analogize black suffering with the suffering of other oppressed beings. It does this by unearthing and exposing the metaporias, spurn-like landmines in what these theories of so-called universal liberation hold to be true. Afro-pessimism 3pp, INDD 14 Afro-pessimism 3pp, INDD AFROPESSIMISM 15 If, as Afro-pessimism argues, blacks are not human subjects but are instead structurally inert props, implements for the execution of white and non-black fantasies and sadomasochistic pleasures. Then this also means that, at a higher level of abstraction, the claims of universal humanity that the above theories all subscribe to are hobbled by a metaporia a contradiction that manifests whenever one looks seriously at the structure of black suffering in comparison to the presumed universal structure of all sentient beings. Again, black people embody a metaporia for political thought and action, black people are the wrench in the works. Blacks do not function as political subjects, instead, our flesh and energies are instrumentalized for post-colonial, immigrant, feminist, LGBTQ, transgender, and workers' agendas. These so-called allies are never authorized by black agendas predicated on black ethical dilemmas. A black radical agenda is terrifying to most people on the left, think Bernie Sanders, because it emanates from a condition of suffering for which there is no imaginable strategy for redress.
no narrative of social, political, or national redemption. This crisis, no, this catastrophe. This realization that I am a sentient being who can't use words like being or person, to describe myself without the scare quotes and the threat of raised eyebrows from anyone within earshot, was crippling. I was convinced that if a story of Palestinian redemption could be told, dot dot, its denouement would culminate in the return of the land, a spatial cartographic redemption, and if a story of class redemption could be told, dot dot, its denouement would culminate in the restoration of the working day so that one stopped working when surplus values were relegated to the dustbin of history, a temporal redemption, in other words. Since post-colonial and working-class redemption were possible, then there must be a story to be told through which one could redeem the time in place of black subjugation. I was wrong. Frank BWILDERSON 316 I had not dug deep enough to see that though blacks suffer. The time and space subjugation of cartographic derosination and the hydraulics of the capitalist working day. We also suffer as the hosts of human parasites, though they themselves might be the hosts of parasitic capital and colonialism. I had looked to theory first as a creative writer, and only much later as a critical theorist to help me find, create the story of black liberation, black political redemption. What I found instead was that redemption, as a narrative mode, was a parasite that fed upon me for its coherence. Everything meaningful in my life had been housed under the umbrellas called critical theory and radical politics. The parasites had been capital, colonialism, patriarchy, homophobia. And now it was clear that I had missed the boat. My parasites were humans, all humans the haves as well as the have-nots. If critical theory and radical politics are to rid themselves of the parasitism that they heretofore have had in common with radical and progressive movements on the left that is, if we are to engage rather than disavow the difference between humans who suffer through an economy of disposability and blacks who suffer by way of social death, then we must come to grips with how the redemption of the subaltern, a narrative, for example, of Palestinian plenitude, loss, and restoration, is made possible by the re-instantiation of a regime of violence that bars black people from the narrative of redemption. This requires an understanding of the difference between loss and absence, and b an understanding of how the narrative of subaltern loss stands on the rubble of black absence. Samir and I didn't share a universal, post-colonial grammar of suffering. Samir's loss is tangible, land. The paradigm of his dispossession elaborates capitalism and the colony. When it is not tangible it is at least coherent, as in the loss of labor power. But how does one describe the loss that makes the world if all that can be said of loss is locked within the world? How does one narrate the loss of loss? What AFROPESSIMISM17 is the difference between something to save and nothing to lose? Samir forced me to face the depth of my isolation in ways I had wanted to avoid, a deep pit from which neither post-colonial theory nor Marxism nor a gender politics of unflinching feminism could rescue me. Why is anti-black violence not a form of racist hatred but the genome of human renewal, a therapeutic bomb that the human race needs to know and heal itself? Why must the world reproduce this violence, this social death, so that social life can regenerate humans and prevent them from suffering the catastrophe of psychic incoherence, absence? Why must the world find its nourishment in black flesh? Three, when the doctor and the nurse returned, I was finally able to speak. They asked what had brought this on. I told them it was the stress of graduate school. The best way to deal with an interrogation is to weave a bit of truth into your lie. I couldn't tell them I had suddenly realized what it meant to be an Afro-pessimist, that my breakdown was brought on by a breakthrough. One in which I finally understood why I was too black for care. They asked me about my current medications, in order to know whether the medications that they might prescribe would clash with whatever I was on. Like a bat darting through a cave, my mind echolocated for the answers. But no torch cast its light on the medication I took, instead, I discovered the forgotten lines of my poem. For Halloween I washed my face and wore my school clothes went door to door as a nightmare.
Afro Pessimism 3 pp. IN 19 Chapter T Wo Juice from a Neck Bone 1 at the age of 11. I lay at night alone in the dark on the floor of our living room listening to Gregorian chants phonograph recordings of my mother's cantorum, the choir of which she was a member at the Basilica of St. Mary, in downtown Minneapolis. Alone in the dark, I saw myself ten years in the future, draped in a white cassock, followed down the cold stone aisle by two altar boys. Traced with incense was the cool cathedral air. It was humid in Minnesota that summer of 1967. The summer of love on the California coast was a moist, mosquito-harassed season in the land of 10,000 lakes. But it was cool on the floor, so I would lie shirtless on the carpet, and surrender my skin to the sonorous sounds. Wake upon wake of mounting waves through which I tunneled and imagined myself as a priest. Sanctuary I was no Afro-pessimist at the age of 11 and my knowledge of what gave me so much anxiety was bereft of a critical race vocabulary. But I knew I was black not because smells of filet powder and Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 19 Afro-pessimism Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 320 Smoked sausage thickening in a gum of rue wafted from my house and no other in the neighborhood but because we were the only ones they called Negroes. I would not be black until the following year, 1968, when I turned 12. In the dark, at 11, lying on the living room floor, I knew I was a Negro not due to my cultural elements but because it was my source of shame. The shame not shared by the neighbors. The Gregorian chants trembled in my chest, extending the darkness in long, hollow catacombs that stretched through me and out the other side where I saw myself in the future a future where I was revered by my parishioners, instead of shunned. As I was in first grade by a little girl who wouldn't hold my hand for fear that my soot would stain her. In the sound tunnel of my future, the children and my teachers genuflected when I passed they stood and knelt on my command. They confessed their sins to me before being worthy of the body of Christ. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I wouldn't hold his hand because his soot would rub off on me. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I called him a monkey when he climbed up the rope in gym class. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Between my teeth and my upper lip, I wedged my tongue and scratched my armpits when he climbed down. Bless me, Father, for we have sinned. We laughed. Bless me, Father, for we have sinned. We pressed his face in the snow. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I called him, friend, and brought him, home to my mother's curiosity. How does it feel, she asked, to be a negro? Bless me, father, for I have sinned. I made him face the class and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. My chest, my arms, and the Cabernet carpet soaked their confessions like a field of wheat repeating the sound of rain. When my aunts and uncles came up from New Orleans, or from the sweet pungent soil 40 miles upriver, they'd ask me if I wanted the light turned on. Children down south didn't brood in the dark. No, Aunt Joyce, I want the dark. You relaxing, bye bye. Yes, I. A F R O P E S S I M I S M 21 relaxing, when what I really meant was I'm composing my hymn of redemption. I was at rest, but I wasn't relaxing. Relaxation is a state of being in the present, living scenes of the present. As a boy I seldom lived in the present. It hurt too much to be in the present. When I occurred to myself I was myself in the future. The present was the penance, what I had to pay for my soot. I dreamed that the present would pass one day. But I arrived each year to find that the present had already packed its bags on the road to meet me. It was standing in the lobby with my room key. Even as I lay on the floor of our living room and took confessions from sinners of the present in their incarnation as supplicants of tomorrow, I knew, in some deep place beneath the chance that the present would always be waiting for me, at the end of that summer, sixth grade would be no different than the slow, acid drip of years gone by, another year of seeing myself through the eyes of others. Our young Negro neighbor, the Wilderson boy, cleaner than you might expect, polite, well-spoken, fresh smelling, too quick to fight, behind in spelling, ahead in spelling, reads above his grade level, late with his math homework, ashy legs, gorilla lips, been known to wet the bed. That Christmas passed, my teacher recommended that I repeat the fifth grade. 
In the fourth grade, they said I was so smart I could skip fifth grade. My parents, however, did not like the idea of kids skipping grades. Then, in the fifth grade, I began to wet the bed more often and my mind shut down. I couldn't, or wouldn't, get up in the morning. Months passed without one assignment being turned in. That summer as I listened to Gregorian chants I marveled at how I made it out of fifth grade. In March I had gone to my teacher and asked for all the assignments I hadn't turned in. She said, how about everything since October? Over Easter break, I closed the door to my room and completed six months worth of math and reading assignments in one week. I Afro Pessimism 3 PP IND Frank B W I L D E R S O N 322 dumped them on her desk in April. She graded them all and gave me all A's and B's. It took her a week to grade them and she scolded me for giving her such a fright all year. I took my praise by proxy. Had I been white, my athleticism and my charm would have made me popular. My friends would have been popular too. But my friends were from the land of misfit toys. Liam Gunderson couldn't distinguish between the threat of a bear and the threat of a butterfly. He hyperventilated and bit his arm when someone raised a hand to him. His father and mother came from Norway and had been tortured in a Japanese internment camp when they were missionaries in China. The children on the playground got their kicks whenever Liam bit his arms. He was the youngest of 13, who were grown and gone. His brothers had left behind novels by Graham Greene, John Le Carre, and Ian Fleming. Liam and I spent long hours reading them in his attic. In the three years from 11 through 13 I spent in Liam's attic, I didn't understand those books as well as Liam did. Nor could I translate the smattering of French words that Graham Greene dropped on the page like spare change. But Liam could. Oscar Nilsson's dad was a chiropractor, which meant which doctor? In the rich, white enclave of Kenwood, where parents were executives, bankers, architects, attorneys, doctors, and statesmen like Senator, soon to be Vice President Walter Mondale, and Mark Dayton, a politician whose family owned Target and B. Dalton bookseller. Then there was Elgar Davenport, who was short and stout and looked at the world through Coke bottle glasses and a left eye that wandered as if lost. Elgar was a quiet embarrassment to his mother, who was blonde, trim, and sporty and always walked ahead of him. Elgar had red hair and freckles. Mr. Davenport drove a red Corvette and played the market for a job. I thought it would be cool if my father bought a sports car in my color, but then, as quickly as it came into my mind, the downside followed. The downside of owning a sports car in my afro pessimism. AFROPESSIMISM 23 color was something I felt without having words for. But knowledge is often deeper than words. Elgar Davenport, Liam Gunderson, Oscar Nilsson, and I were playing secret agent on the grounds of a dark stone mansion across the street from my house. The house had an elevator and 10 bedrooms, I was told, though in the 16 years I lived across the street from it I was never inside. It changed hands, at one point a wealthy family with almost as many kids as bedrooms though they were too young to be my playmates, at another time, Senator Mark Dayton. It was his family home away from Washington, and they would live there until he became governor and moved to the governor's mansion in St. Paul. We played secret agent on the far grounds, away from the main building, near a one-bedroom carriage house at the end of the wide gravel drive. The mansion served its purpose, it was vital to the mise en scene of our spy games. Sometimes it was the Soviet embassy in a dark wooden corner of Washington. D.C. Sometimes it was a smirch center for the training of assassins who were being prepared to kill James Bond. Our spy games were more Salvador Dali than Ian Fleming. For example, a low wire fence ran along one end of the property separating the backyard of a smaller mansion from the Dayton home. We called this wire fence the Berlin Wall, without making any geographical adjustments, such as relocating the mansion from Washington, D.C., to Berlin. The surrealists in us ruled over cartographic realists. If we didn't draw straws we'd end up being four boys playing CIA agents and no communists. Once our day, Algar and I drew Soviets by straws. Liam and Oscar were the good guys. The game involved two witless Soviets running and screaming at two witless Americans who also ran and screamed as they tried.
to hurdle the low wire fence of the Berlin Wall and get back to Checkpoint Charlie before the Soviets caught them. Afro Pessimism 3 pp. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 324 Elgar and I crouched behind the carriage house at the end of the gravel drive. The Americans would come from somewhere up near the mansion, but we didn't know which side of the mansion. Normally, one of the boys who played the good guys would be the decoy. The one who would come out from a tree on the side of the mansion and run at breakneck speed toward a far end of the fence while the other boy waited until both Soviets had been drawn away. Then he would try to make his escape. Elgar and I peered out from behind the carriage house waiting for the two American spies. We curled our thumbs and forefingers and held them to our eyes as binoculars. Hey, Elgar whispered. Yeah, I whispered back. My mom told me to ask you, how do you feel being a Negro? I dunno, I said, not as softly. How come? Pretty good, I guess. Here they come. Oscar and Liam were on the move. We caught Liam, but Oscar made it to Checkpoint Charlie in the McDermott's backyard. The next time I saw Elgar, he told me his mom didn't like my answer. I was worried. I asked him if she was mad. No, he told me. I asked him was he sure? Sure, I'm sure, he said, she wants you to come to lunch. I said okay, but I'd have to ask my mom. Selena Davenport was visibly taller than her husband, Elgar Sr. She didn't have red hair like Elgar Jr. or Elgar Sr. before we sat down to lunch. She brought me to the living room and she showed me the mantle with her tennis trophies from a college she said was one of the seven sisters back east where they didn't have any boys. In her husky dry martini voice, she said the place had her climbing the walls. Elgar knows how I climbed the walls, she said, mussing his hair. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-25 she led us to the kitchen. I was so uptight about being there, and I didn't know why, that I was only half listening to her, which meant I only half understood what she meant. But I had been taught that when you don't know what to say to someone, rather than let uncomfortable dead air pass between you, you ask them a question. So I asked her why she wanted to climb the walls. She looked at me as though I'd asked her if they ate cat food for dinner. Then she laughed and called her maid, Mrs. Shemiski, to serve lunch. We ate in the kitchen, Selena Davenport, Elgar, and me. Mrs. Shemiski set a platter of sandwiches on the table and poured lemonade for Elgar and me. Mrs. Davenport drank lemonade too, but with a splash of gin. As covertly as I could, I lifted one edge of the bread to have a look. I wasn't covert enough. Something wrong with the sandwich, Frankie? Mrs. Davenport asked me. He doesn't like that name, Mom. What name do you like, hun? Frank, I said, trying not to sound cross like Eljar. Your mother calls you Frankie, when she calls you to come inside. This startled me, because I didn't know she knew my mother. I knew she knew of my mother, but the Davenports had signed a petition of 500 households to keep us out of Kenwood. And most of the neighbors never spoke to my mother. I didn't say anything. She asked again, what's wrong with the sandwich? Frank, nothing, Mrs. Davenport, tell me, I won't be offended if you don't like my sandwiches. The irony of this statement slipped past me at the time, because they weren't her sandwiches, Mrs. Shemiski made them. I wanted to see where the meat was so I could move it to the MID Dila. This tickled Elgar's mom. It's an Italian sandwich provolone, Afro pessimism 3 pp. I Frank B W I L D E R S O N 326 spinach and tomatoes, all with a little pesto. You'll bloat if you eat meat in this heat. That's what my mom says, I said. She makes these sometimes. Does she now? Mrs. Davenport nodded and lit a pal mall. Don't torture yourself. You don't have to eat it, she said. This was a momentary reprieve from a death sentence, until I remembered my mother told me to be on my best behavior. I took a generous bite. Nausea toyed with my intestines as I tried to swallow. The mayonnaise, the rubbery cheese, and the acidic tomatoes, all combined with that touch of pesto, struggled down my esophagus into doji high, half-chewed wads. Then Selena Davenport asked the question Elgar had asked me at the carriage house by the Berlin Wall. 
In a chair directly opposite to me she sipped her lemonade and gin, took another drag of her cigarette, and looked directly at me as she waited for me to answer. I stopped eating. I would never hire a man who salts his food before eating. One of my father's axioms. It means don't act or speak in haste, Frankie. If you don't know the answer think take a moment to figure out what's being asked. I took in the room. Her lace curtains billowing in the breeze through the kitchen windows, her polished green gas range with a gold antique knobs, her frigid air that gleamed like Marvel comic silver surfer. With an ice maker in the door, along with a water dispenser so that ice and water could be dispensed without having to open the appliance, something I had never seen before. Her white pleated tennis skirt, white sneakers, her weltoned legs, and the way she waited without blinking. She stares like an East German border guard. The wrong answer, and you won't make it back. She's not just a pretty tennis lady and those aren't just pretty tennis shoes. There are razor blades in the toes of her shoes and she will kick you in the shin if you forget what dad said and speak in haste. Mom, said Elgar, I already told you what he said. Afro AFROPESSIMISM27, I can't trust you to bring the right change home, Elgar. Pretty good, I guess. Elgar, that's how you talk. His father's an educator. I meant to say more, I apologized. Of course you did. Elgar didn't give you the chance. She looked pleased. I wanted her to stay that way. Every spy knows how to keep the guards smiling. I told her it was nice to be a Negro. She blew yet another thin cyclone of smoke. She didn't look pleased, so I told her Negroes get to do cool stuff. Like what? She said, more alert. I was stumped, so I told her about Mason Gate Resort on Gull Lake, near Brainerd, Minnesota. I said our family and a bunch of other Negro families spend a week there every August, fishing, boating, swimming, and water skiing. She knew of Mason Gate Resort but something in my story didn't gel with what she knew of it. She asked me if I was confusing Mason Gate Resort with someplace else. She stood up and leaned on the counter, with her back to the window. She lit another cigarette with the first and flicked the stub of the first one out the window. What would Smokey the Bear say? Elgar asked with alarm. You'll make someone a good wife one day, Elgar, she said, but she was looking at me. The first and only time she took her eyes off me was when she used her lighter to light her first cigarette. Now she took her eyes off me again and exhaled to the side. When she looked at me again there was still no warmth in her face. I was lying on she knew it. We didn't stay at Mason Gate Resort, we stayed at Twilight Loon Cabins, two miles away from Mason Gate, on the side of the lake with marshes where sandy beaches should be. A part of the lake where there were no speedboats, no Grand Lodge with nightly entertainment, no water sports like jet skiing. No elegant afro. Frank B.W.I.L.D.E.R.S.O.N. 328 Restaurant Serving Walleye Pike and Roast Potatoes Instead of Mason Gate's lush, air-conditioned rooms, Twilight Loon Cabins had self-catering cabins with screen doors in need of paint, and the sounds of their closing slapped across the lake. The ground's lights were so far apart that at night you needed a flashlight to walk from one cabin to the next. It was only the previous year, 1966, that the four Negro families had begun taking the kids up to Mason Gate to have dinner and enjoy the activities there. We didn't stay there, however, and something told me Mrs. Davenport knew. She doused the new cigarette under the tap. Elgar Sr. doesn't think the twins will make the World Series this year, she said, as though she were talking to someone who wasn't in the room. She ran a glass of water from the tap and drank some of it. Where's his home team spirit? Two goops of mayonnaise, cheese, tomatoes, and raw nerves, all combined with the new sensation of pesto, sloshed in my stomach as I bundled up the hill from Elgar's house to mine. As I came up the back porch stairs I could hear a Dinah Washington song on the radio. S and H green stamps and a booklet to paste them and lay on the kitchen table, next to a textbook on statistics for students of psychology. Mom was taking a break from studying and pasting stamps into the book. So, she said, there's no meat in her sandwiches. Mom laughed and turned the radio down. We're in Minnesota, she said, but we're not of Minnesota. Bull Connor could save money on dogs if he'd had that woman's food. Mom. A 
AFROPESSIMISM29, yes. Not HIing. What is it? How do you feel? I feel like I should be on my veranda with a mint julep fanning myself instead of breaking my brain over statistics or licking S&H green stamps. I hadn't moved. Why do you ask? She was seated, just the right height to look me in the eye. So I know what to say next time. What next time? Next time Mrs. Davenport asks me how it feels to be a Negro. No, her face was a violent wish. No, she didn't. She pressed her palms on the table as though she were about to stand up and go knock Mrs. Davenport out. And then what? She must have thought because she didn't stand. And then what? She was learning something valuable about white upper crust northerners, something that she would not have imagined possible before she moved to Kenwood. How one can fight a war by proxy through someone else's child. She knew now how it must feel to be killed by a guided missile. What kind of woman would hurt you through your child? The good, the beautiful, and the true, was a Du Boisian axiom that my mother cherished. Those must be our aspirations. And it starts with how you treat people. This long-range messing with my mind, and my son your guided missile, if that's what she thought when I came home. Then she also would have reminded the Selena Davenport deep inside her skull how she makes Elgar and all the children in this neighborhood feel at home when she's with them. How she scoops the ice cream cones for them always with a half scoop extra, how she makes red, white, and blue gunboat hats for the kids on Afro Pessimism 3PP, INDD 29, Afro Pessimism 3PP, INDD 291, 22, 20th, 9, 45 a.m., January 22, 29, 45. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 330, the 4th of July, and lights their sparklers as they walk up the hill on parade. But you twist my son's stomach into knots. One night when I was older and almost living on my own, I came home late and quietly. Mother was alone in the dark, in front of a fire. Dad was stretched out on the sofa, asleep. The soft glow in the fireplace was the only light. She was sticking needles into little stuffed cloth dolls, naming them with the names of two of her white co-workers. And this one, she said deliciously, as she stabbed the doll, I leave shaking with the palsy. I smiled and went up to bed, without her knowing I had seen her. She's sane, I thought, as I climbed into bed. After all she's been through, she's sane. 3. The next time we played secret agent at the mansion across the street, I drew a Soviet straw. Again, I complained. Liam Gunderson was a Soviet agent with me, Algar and Oscar were MI6 agents. I caught Algar at the Berlin Wall and locked him in the guardhouse with its imaginary walls of air. I dashed along the fence to help Liam catch Oscar before he crossed into West Berlin. I hadn't gotten far when I heard Elgar yell. I escaped. His short, stout body rolled over the fence. I yelled back, you're caught, you have to stay in the guardhouse. He yelled, you didn't handcuff me. He was over the fence now, dashing through the McDermott's backyard, on his way to the Tyson's backyard. I was livid. Don't run, fuckface. Afro-pessimism 3 pp. AFROPESSIMISM31, his red hair flounced in the wind. He turned his freckled face around and laughed. My foot nudged something solid on the ground next to the fence. It was a plastic bottle of emerald colored palm olive dish soap. I bent down and picked it up. Its heft in my hand was substantial because it was nearly full. I gripped the bottle by its neck. I felt my arm sling back. Then it slung forward and over and the green bottle world, now a tomahawk, now a want, as it shot toward the sun, the high noon light prismed in the green liquid, until the bottle disappeared in the jaws of the sun. I closed my eyes so as not to go blind. Plop, splat, Elgar's knees buckled, he was face down in the McDermott's backyard. We raced to his side. Green dish soap oozed into the grass from a crack in the plastic bottle. Blood oozed from the back of Elgar's skull. A temple of his coke bottle glasses was torn from its hinge and lay beside his head on the ground. But the word blood took a few moments to find me. At first what I saw on the back of his skull was a cow like a red tuft of hair gone awry. Then I saw it as a small spurt of water like the spurt of water from the fountain outside of Mrs. 
Anderson's room that was so small your lips touched the faucet when you drank. Liam and Oscar ran for help. I stood there, the sun beating down upon my neck, my eyes beating down upon Elgar as he bled. It would be wrong to say that I meant to hurt him. But now that he was hurt, I didn't want to help him. I knew that I should want to help him, but that was knowledge stripped of desire, and it voiced itself in the second and third persons, you should want to help him. Or the Wilderson boy should want to help him. Voices up the back stairs and a little to the left of what I really felt. Afro Frank B W I L D E R S O N 332 The tiny gurgle of blood from the soft spot in the back of his head died within seconds. But I stood there waiting for the tiny geyser's return. Elgar Davenport bleeds. If Elgar bleeds, his mother bleeds. Until that point people around me in Kenwood seemed bloodless and eternal. Three years later, in the spring of 1970, when we lived in Berkeley, a Black Panther handed me Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth in a study session that he and others held for junior high kids. That night I read what I could of concerning violence, where Fanon wrote about the moment that the native of Algeria sees the French settler bleed. That moment when the Algerian finds out that the settler's skin is not of any more value than a native skin. And it must be said that this discovery shakes the world in a very necessary manner, and I thought of that day with Aljar. I felt a twinge between my legs. The same twinge of bliss I felt at night when, half asleep and half awake, I wet the bed, the pleasure of release that could last until I felt the wet spot. When the paramedics parsed the story, one said to the other, landed on the fontanelle. Explains the bleeding. His partner nodded. On the three count they hoisted Elgar onto the gurney. One of them said Elgar was lucky his fontanelle wasn't as soft as a baby's or the injury would have been far worse. Elgar's eyes were open but he didn't say anything. The first paramedic shook his head. What are the chances? One in a million. Not even. When I saw Mrs. Davenport pleading with the paramedics to let her ride in the ambulance, I knew my parents would beat me. But they didn't beat me. They were too dazed, their arms too limp and useless to lift something as heavy as a belt. Not only was I not spanked but Afro-pessimism. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-33 My parents didn't even punish me. The next day they were still shaken, but not enough to keep them from differing over how Elgar's injury should be explained to me. My father, who knew Latin and who had taught speed reading to corporate executives to earn money while he earned his PhD talked to me like I was one of his graduate students. A space in the skull where ossification is not complete, Frankie, and the natural sutures haven't been formed. The baby's soft spot, Mom said, sighing. Talking goo goo, ga ga won't improve his vocabulary, Ida Lorraine. Dad frowned. She said we'd have to go over to the Davenport's house together. But before we did, she wanted me to tell them, again, what had happened. They sat side by side on the sofa in the living room. I stood before them. I told them everything all over again. How Elgar was captured at the Berlin Wall. How Elgar broke the rules when he left the guardhouse. How I reached down and snagged a dish soap bottle by the neck. And I threw it. Not at him, Mom. I just threw it. My dad had quit smoking cigarettes several years ago. He was trying to give up his pipe. It was unlit. With his mouth closed over it, he nodded stem gently. He looked at me as though I were one of the children in the psych ward he once managed, a mixture of admiration and horror. Twenty yards or more and you cracked his fontanelle. Dad almost smiled. His voice was strange, as though he were talking about someone who had broken a track and field record. I looked at my mother. I didn't mean it, Mom. Then I sobbed. She held me. I know. I know, she said. You're a good boy. I know how bad you felt. When she said this, I recalled how my first bursts of feelings afro pessimist Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 334 had not been kin to remorse. But how could I tell her and still be a good boy? Mom baked a casserole with extra ground beef and extra cheese. I told her, Mrs. Davenport doesn't serve heavy food. I said it three times, and each time Mom told me, it's the thought that counts. Mom said this without looking at me. Looking back, I wonder if the thought that counts, had more to do with Mrs. 
Davenport's interrogation of me and less to do with my attack on her son, or perhaps the two were inextricably bound. Instead of slapping you into next week I baked a meal you can choke on. Bon appetit. Mom and I walked down the hill to the Davenport's. Elgar was still in the hospital under observation, but Mrs. Davenport said he was fine. I told Mr. and Mrs. Davenport how sorry I was, which was true. But there was another truth that couldn't be spoken, not even to my parents. What I wondered between regret and desire would come of this duel in the heart. For I survived the next year, 1968, on quotations from film stars, espionage novels, and by the end of August, quotations from Chairman Mao. A monk with malachite beads, I clenched the words of others. But of my graceless lurch through that white grammar school, was it Stevenson or Poe or another wine and revolver scribe I pledged to memory and took to my mother? Before a man dies he must write a book, love a woman, and kill a man. She eyed me as though I were a parcel intended for the neighbors. You mean, what does it mean, she asked. No, I mean is it true? We were alone. Windows in the living Afro pessimism 3. AFROPESSIMISM 35 room were open. The drapes shuddered softly, refusing to say why she looked away. In 1968, something cracked inside of me. I still lay in the dark on the living room floor listening to music as I did the summer before when I was 11. But Gregorian chants had been replaced by the music and the voice of Curtis Mayfield urging me to be a winner of the good black earth. The first time I heard Curtis Mayfield sing, No More Tears Do We Cry, and We Have Finally Dried Our Eyes, I wept. I thought if I listened long and hard enough, Curtis Mayfield's voice would strain clear and fierce through the phonograph needle and shield me from hell people said I was blessed to inhabit. There are boys in the ghetto who don't have it as good. As the year began, the Tet Offensive laid siege to our living room. Just before midnight, our living room crackled with white noise as my parents, thinking they were alone, searched for a signal on the radio in the hi-fi. Sometimes I hid on the front staircase and tried to get a glimpse of them through the spindles of the balustrade. They often sat on the floor, I could see their outstretched legs. I didn't dare go below the first landing for fear of being spotted. And the first landing was close enough for me to hear the radio and wait for my uncle's name in the call of the dead. The music stopped. The DJ announced that the station would soon be signing off but first the nightly bulletin from Vietnam. A mechanized infantry convoy from the 2nd Brigade, U.S. 4th Infantry Division was ambushed two miles northwest of Ple Morong in Kantum Province. Convoy security elements returned the enemy fire while Army helicopter gunships and artillery supported the action. One helicopter was hit by enemy ground fire and crashed in the area, wounding all five persons on board. Then the roll call came. At this point the clink of ice in my mother's cola stopped. The bones of my father dried in my bones. They afro- Frank BWILDERSON 336 didn't move. They seemed not to breathe. The only living thing was the radio. Tuesday, August 29th. The announcer paused. Was he sipping water? Was his right hand on the mic and his left hand cupped over a cough? 242 servicemen have died in combat this week. We close this broadcast as we close every evening, with the names of those who have fallen today followed by a sampling of the messages our listeners have left on our answering machine. The views and opinions do not reflect the views and opinions of the management here at WGBH, nor the views and opinions of the stations that broadcast this show. Specialist William C. Gearing, 22, East Lansing, Michigan. Lance Corporal Joseph L. Rhodes, 22, Memphis, TNNESSEE. Captain Michael C. Volheim, 20, Hayward, California. Private First Class Craig E. Yates, 18, Sparta, Michigan. Private First Class Ramon L. Vasquez, 21, Puerto Nuevo, Puerto Rico. Private First Class Calvin R. Patrick, 18, Houston, Texas. After the announcer read the names, his voice continued in its bedside manner, as though tucking the dead soldiers into bed. Now, he said soothingly, a selection of your voices from our parent studio. A small beep, as he pressed a button to play the messages from the station's answering machine. 
a woman with a coal town twang thanked the station for telling her of her son's death two days before the Marines came knocking at her door. It meant she didn't crumple to the floor when they came. She had done that already, in private. Her neighbor down the way had slumped on her porch at those two Marines' feet. It's a shame. Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 36 Afro-pessimism 3 pp. AFROPESSIMISM 37 She said, they're not allowed to hold you or pick you up off the floor. Thank you for sparing me that indignity. A man from Tulia, Texas, demanded the station stop reading the names on the air. You are supporting the anti-war demonstrators who are traitors to this nation. A girl from Seattle said two nights ago she heard the name of someone who'd graduated last year from her high school. He scored the winning touchdown when we won homecoming. We think we should cancel the homecoming parade this year and hold a candlelight vigil instead. Please advise. A woman from Ohio said, I'm a white woman, but I always wonder how many southern black boys lay claim to the names you read each night. What did they die for? Tar paper shacks, malnutrition, degradation, and no jobs? Please, somebody tell me. I heard the clink of ice as my mother dared to sip her cola again. Your brother's alive, she said softly. My father said, yes, another day of life. I heard them saying they're our fathers together, and I knew they were on their knees. One of Dad's students fled to Canada to dodge the draft. The Canadians took him in, no questions asked. I wondered if they'd take me in, no questions asked, if I fled my war in Kenwood. I turned 12 in April, the same day Congress passed the Fair Housing Act, and seven days after the murder of Martin Luther King. I watched the riots on television with my grandmother, a New Orleans Catholic who had taught second grade and at one time played piano with the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Grandmother Jules loved all kinds of sports. Her husband, 2-2 two two Jules, named for his ability to strike out a batter every time the call was two balls in. Two strikes turned down an invitation to join the Negro National League and work the rails as a porter. And then as a plasterer when the Great Depression Afro-Pessimism 3 Frank B.W.I.L.D.E.R.S.O.N. 338 came. But he was dead in 1968. When Grandmother Jules came north to visit us, she spent time with me and my father watching baseball, football, and basketball, and never hunted for antiques with my mother, her daughter. She loved pickled pig's feet and a beer called hams, which was brewed across the river in St. Paul. The murder of Martin Luther King in the Tet Offensive changed my family's relationship to radio and TV. My parents listened for my uncle's name in the nightly broadcasts of casualties. My grandmother and I watched the riots. One night her feet shot up from the easy chair and damn near knocked her beer and pig's feet off the TV dinner tray. As I steadied the table, she laughed like I'd never seen her laugh before. Go ahead, son, she cried. I'd heard her say this many times over, whenever Tony Oliva made a base hit, or when Gail Sayers ran for a touchdown. But neither Oliva nor Sayers were on the screen. I caught her joy and laughed out loud too. A knot loosened in my chest, a phantom tumor that had been there since first grade. We were watching the riots, and my grandmother laughed my pain away. If I said that for the past six years I'd hated the vast majority of students and half the teachers at my school, I would be lying, it was never that straightforward. But it would be accurate to say that I was never at ease in their presence, and since their faces were with me even when I was not with them. It would also be true to say that I was seldom, if ever, at ease. Go ahead, son. She wasn't talking to me, she was talking to the man on the screen, but, at that moment, she and I were triangulated with that man on the screen. And I felt loved. I'd like to say the city on the screen was Cleveland, but it could have been Detroit, D.C., Cincinnati, Chicago, Kansas City, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Trenton, New Jersey, or Wilmington, Delaware. AFROPESSIMISM 39 could have been anywhere and everywhere. No fires were visible, but smoke plumed over ruined buildings. Skid marks scarred the street where a shirtless man with a do-rag snapped around his conch nosed a shopping cart down the boulevard. Grandmother Jules laughed like her chest was full of carbonation. I knew there and then that for me the priesthood was dead. I was going to grow up to be a looter and make my grandma proud. 
Our racket roused the Killjoy giants who owned the house. My mother came downstairs and told her mother not to say such things. I saw my mother in silhouette framed by the living room sliding French doors with light from the dining room at her back. She was graceful even when she was still. She and Dad modeled in fashion shows that the Boule and the Lynx, two of the black middle-class social groups to which they belonged, put on. The whole room hushed when the two of them came down the catwalk. Mom's friend said she looked like Danielle Luna, who took the world by storm in 1966 when she became the first black woman to grace the cover of Vogue. And I struggled to see how the blood in my mother's light skin and slender body was the same blood that ran through my grandmother, who was short and dark, sucked juice from a neck bone, and stomped the damper pedal when she played the piano. At the age of 36, my mother stood in the threshold framed by her reproach, and spoke to her 63-year-old mother as though their ages were reversed. My grandmother and I looked at her like two kids caught being naughty. Don't say that, mother. Next thing you know he'll be saying that at school. He's wayward enough as it is. When we turned back to the television, the man with the conch, the do-rag, and the shopping cart was gone. Mom went upstairs and we went back to our antics. Why are we mad? I asked my grandmother as we gazed at the plumes of smoke rising from the flat roofs. AFROPESSIMISM41 The world tells you you are needed, needed as the destination for its aggressivity and renewal. The antagonism between the post-colonial subject in the settler, the Sand Creek Massacre, or the Palestinian The antagonism between the post-colonial subject in the settler, the Sand Creek Massacre, or the Palestinian Nakba cannot and should not be analogized with the violence of social death. That is the violence of slavery, which did not end in 1865 for the simple reason that slavery did not end in 1865. Slavery is a relational dynamic, not an event and certainly not a place in space like the South, just as colonialism is a relational dynamic. And that relational dynamic can continue to exist once the settler has left or ceded governmental power. And these two relations are secured by radically different structures of violence. Afro-pessimism offers an analytic lens that labors as a corrective to humanist assumptive logics. It provides a theoretical apparatus that allows black people to not have to be burdened by the ruse of analogy, because analogy mystifies rather than clarifies black suffering. Analogy mystifies black people's relationship to other people of color. Afro-pessimism labors to throw this mystification into relief, without fear of the faults and fissures that are revealed in the process. Grandmother Jules would turn in her grave to know I thought of her as an Afro-pessimist. She was a Catholic woman whose confessions never lapsed. But once she retired, her speech was relieved of the ruse of analogy, which meant she could let herself say that we weren't mad for the reasons people who suffered class oppression, gender discrimination, our colonial domination were mad. Their anger had grounding wires internal to the world. We were the world's grounding wire. We were the targets of rage that would otherwise be turned in on itself. Black people were the living, breathing contradistinction to life itself. And when we were too old, like Grandmother Jules, or were too young, like me, to know what my mother knew, we refused the ruse of analogy and let our rage speak its truth. Human life is dependent Afro-pessimist. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 342 on black death for its existence and for its coherence. Blackness and slaveness are inextricably bound in such a way that whereas slaveness can be separated from blackness, blackness cannot exist as other than slaveness. There is no world without blacks, yet there are no blacks who are in the world. You had to be young or you had to be old for this Eucharist to touch your lips. A schism soon wedged between my parents and me. I had more contempt than compassion for them. My mother was finishing her Ph.D. and, sometime during this period, she worked as a public school administrator for the Minneapolis Public Schools. My father was a professor and associate dean at the University of Minnesota. Both of my parents were psychologists who, in addition to laboring as academics during the day, held down a private practice. And they threw themselves into MLK's dream of racial equality and Lyndon Johnson's dream of a great society.
This meant that they lent their skills as grant writers to grassroots initiatives, and hosted endless social and political gatherings in our large living room, where a patchwork of people who might not have otherwise met university administrators, liberal businessmen, urban planners, activists, and students came together to jumpstart job training centers in the black community outreach programs for Native Americans, mental health programs for people without means. In 1968, the year the Fair Housing Act was passed, my parents went door to door in Kenwood handing out leaflets that explained the act in such a way that they hoped would not be threatening and would encourage the same people who worked so hard to keep them out of Kenwood to welcome one or two other black families with open arms. They conducted several fair housing workshops in the homes of wealthy Kenwoodites and asked them to drive the wooden stakes of fair housing signs in their lawns. It soon became clear that the demographic of these workshops were white women whose hus afro pessimism. AFROPESSIMISM 43 bands were away at the office. The housewives loved my dad and tolerated my mother, even though they both were beautiful. Dad was over six feet tall. In marble foyers he removed his full-length leather coat where underneath he wore cuff-linked shirts and suits that looked tailored. He looked them in the eye when he spoke, and they smiled at him and nodded like supplicants. When it was my mother's turn to speak their attention waned, and the tinkling of demitas cups and saucers salted the air. Mom had tried to throw herself into the times as best she could. To this end, she had bought an Afro wig and wore it. At the end of each workshop, it was time for the big ask. How many of you would like to take the fair housing signs we have in the car and place them on your lawn? A woman raised her hand. Bypassing the issue at hand, she asked my father if he had ever done any modeling. If not, she continued, she knew a man who knew a man who ran an agency. With a clenched smile, mom tried to steer the conversation back to fair housing. Another woman raised her hand to concur that Dad would be such a handsome model. Then yet another shot up her hand Dad that as much as she would like to place one of the signs on her lawn, her husband would not approve. Mom left the room, bypassing the model's suggestion. Dad told them that he and Mom would be happy to return to anyone's house for a one-on-one -on -one with anyone's husband. Mom watched them from the foyer, where she sat on the bottom step of the stairs. She removed the Afro wig from her head and placed it on the step beside her. By the year 1968 was also when the American Indian Movement was founded in South Minneapolis, only three miles from Kenwood. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 344 Overnight Issues of Native American Sovereignty in the Demands of AIM were part of the University of Minnesota Landscape. Dad was running a program on a reservation several miles outside of the city, it was a joint program with the tribal government. The board meetings were held with urban Indians, tribal leaders from the reservation, and Dad, in South Minneapolis. As with the fair housing workshops, my parents let me go to these meetings. At once, it became clear that the people on the reservation did not want to adhere to some of the requirements of the University of Minnesota, which funded the project. Politically, I thought Dad's institutional interests were wrong, and the indigenous people's interests were right. I thought the university should turn over its resources to the Native Americans without insisting that they account for how they spent the money. The room was packed. All 20 of the seats at the large conference table were taken. Another 15 to 20 Native Americans stood against the wall and sat in the deep window sills. Jeers and insults were hurled at my dad whenever he tried to speak, but he never jeered back. There was an effective charge in the room that had more to do with my dad as a black person than with him being a representative of the university. At one point, a native man with whom I shared a windowsill seat lurched forward. We don't want you, a nigger man, telling us what to do. The crowded walls detonated with applause. What I couldn't see then, and had no interest in seeing then, was that the wealthy white housewives in the fair housing workshops shared the same psychic space as the Indians in the underserved neighborhoods of South Minneapolis. Despite the fact that the women who attended my parents' workshops lived in a part of town as divorced from the streets where AIM was launched as Atlantis as divorced from Mars, 
To be sure, the myth of manifest destiny, upon which these Afro-pessimism 3 AFROPESSIMISM 45 white women were weaned from childhood, was inextricably bound to the near annihilation of indigenous life. It would be wrong to say that the white women of Kenwood and the indigenous man seated in the windowsill beside me, who called my dad a nigger prayed at the same church. But in the final instance both their worlds were sustained by a need to distinguish themselves from the same alien embodiment. In the plush drawing rooms of Kenwood, the women fed their negrophilia on my father's flesh, and pushed my mother to one side. In the tribal meeting hall, the Indians had no use for either of my parents whether we are white and wealthy or red and poor. We don't want a nigger telling us what to do. The white women expressed their refusal to be authorized by blackness through their unconscious negrophilia. Have you ever been a model, Professor Wilderson? Coupled with the need to remove my mother from scene of their fantasy. The Native Americans expressed their refusal through their unconscious negrophobia, we don't want you, a nigger man, telling us what to do. The force of both white and indigenous effect spoke with one voice, a chorus of libidinal economy. In the collective unconscious of indigenous imagining, the specter of blackness was a greater threat than the settler institution that had dispatched a black professor to do its dirty work. My father looked up from the table. He maintained eye contact with the native man seated next to me, while the room exploded in his ears but he did not show anger. And pain appeared in his eyes only after his eyes met mine, with their approval for the voices that cheered him. A father stared into the deering eyes of his son. I took pleasure in his pain, because his ruin made me a part of a community. By jeering this nigger, I was one with the we. Afterward, my father and I sat in the car for several minutes. The key was in the ignition, unturned. He didn't speak to me. My father never showed rage or pain in public and I was now as much Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 45 Afro-Pessimism 3PP, Frank BWILDERSON 346 member of the public as the Indians who drove him from that room. I could see the expansion and contraction of his chest. He let out a long, slow breath. Why not just give them what they want? It's their land. It's their money, I said. He sighed. He sparked the ignition. He put the car in gear. I was too young to know how anti-blackness is driving the quest for sovereignty as much as it drives the desire to get rid of the settler. And he was too numb to explain. The Native Americans were speaking as sovereigns to one who was not. The essential problem is not in the name they called my dad, that is to say, the essential problem is not in the performance of their antagonistic feelings, but in the structure of an antagonistic relationship between indigenous people with something to salvage and a black person with nothing to lose. My parents carried their rage-like vials of nitroglycerin packed in straw. Unlike me, they knew the fallout of black rage. My parents knew and taught the people who were being gunned down and the students who fled to Canada to avoid the draft. And they knew that they themselves were being watched by the FBI. I, knowing little of the anvil that weighed on them, thought they were simply sellouts. I thought they held their tongues when their white colleagues made racist statements because they didn't care about the revolution that was raging around them. Slowly, after years of being at odds with them, my view of them changed when I went into academia and was hit firsthand with what Jared Sexton calls the hidden structure of violence that underwrites so many violent acts, whether spectacular or mundane. Dissemblance had been a survival tool, an implement they used to stay alive and put food on our table. They knew that black intellectuals could push the envelope only as far as their non-black interlocutors were willing to accommodate. They also knew that they needed AFROPESSIMISM 47 to know the limits of what their white colleagues and interlocutors could handle, especially if those interlocutors didn't know where their own breaking point was. My parents had to know on their behalf. Imagine the black man the white man wants you to be. And be him, or, at least, mime him. David Marriott writes in his treatise on lynching. Oh, or unconscious is given over to that work of second-guessing, of dare and double dare. There's no place here for what the black man wants, or for a black unconscious driven by its own desire and aggression. 
I watched the world put my parents' desire on lockdown, while I marveled at my grandmother and her jailbreak conversation. Black desire is a runaway crime. America no longer needed grandmother for nurturing, for confirmation, for a woman to blame as the nation split at the seams, the way it still needed my mother. I am a marked woman, Hortense Spillers writes, but not everybody knows my name. Peaches, and brown sugar, sapphire, and earth mother. Auntie, Granny, God's holy fool, and Miss Ebony first, or black woman at the podium, I describe a locus of confounded identities. A meeting ground of investments and privations in the national treasury of rhetorical wealth. My country needs me and if I were not here, I would have to be invented. America was finished with my grandmother as its invention. She was free to kick back and kill them, if only in her dreams, or with me, when we watched the riots in 1968. But America was not finished with my mother, a 36-year-old black woman in her prime. Just three years earlier, in 1965, Daniel Moynihan had named the Amigo of my mother as the source of a destructive vein in ghetto culture. And in the black family, she didn't enter a room as a woman with a PhD. She entered as the foremost reason men feel castrated, as a drag greater than anti-blackness. On the black man's dream of a far horizon, my outbursts of joy at the sight of a looter would only confirm Afro-pessimism. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 348 But the world already knew about her. For Moynihan, I was a monster of my mother's making. 6. We went to Seattle that summer, a summer sabbatical for my father, a summer of research for my mother. Not a day went by when I wasn't surly. When a bishop came to catechism class on a cool Wednesday evening and asked the scrum of 12 and 13. Year-old girls and boys to part that week with their allowance and donate to his mission in Africa. I raised my hand. As in my catechism classes in Minneapolis, I was the only black face in the room. Sister Mary Elvin beamed. The bishop nodded with pious encouragement. A nod I knew well from six years in an all-white grammar school back home in Minneapolis. Look the Negro boy is going to speak. See how politely he raised his hand. Did the Africans ask you to come over? I blurted. The bishop looked at Sister Mary Alvin. Then the bishop looked at me. The Holy Spirit needs no invitation. One must, of course, repent and be baptized. I told the bishop my 35 cents was going for a Snickers bar. He could have my allowance next week if he flew to Africa and came back with a letter from the Africans stating that they wanted him there. News of this reached home before I did, where a spanking was waiting for me. It became apparent to all that I excelled in sports. And my parents must have thought that the sheer exertion of football and baseball afro a -F -R -O -P -E -S -S -I -M -I -S -M 49 would sweat the surliness from my pores. On her way to the University of Washington, Mom would drop me off at a community center. It was more of a boys' club. I don't recall my younger sister going with me, nor do I see any girls in my mind's eye when those days return to memory. I can only surmise that she and my father thought that it would do me good to be around what I had never been around in my neighborhood. A group of black men, boys, really, but unless you were in love with your dentist you wouldn't call them boys. It was here that I came close to what I had only seen on television with my grandmother. Not only did I come to understand that Surly was not a personality deficiency of mine and mine alone, but was instead a communal inheritance, as was rage and strong laughter at all the things that made most white people sad. But I also learned about the Black Panthers at this boys' club. I heard the full throttle speech of thoughts I had harbored as wishes without words, such as I'm three seconds off a honky's ass. The first time I heard those words spoken at the community center in Seattle, I laughed out loud. How could one word bring so much joy? Honky. It tickled me for days. I'm three seconds off dad honky's ass. I knew that my parents would not be tickled if they heard it from my lips. That I'm three seconds off dad honky's ass wasn't what they had in mind when they decided Seattle would be the place where I'd meet young black men as role models. I was clever enough to know that that phrase could land me at a white community center for the rest of our summer in Seattle. But I couldn't help myself. 
not since my grandmother's go ahead, son, had I been so inspired by words. To the far corner of our backyard I would go just to hear all the different ways I could make those few words sing. I'd sing them deep in mellow, in Barry White's baritone voice. I'd sing them like Aretha insisting on R-E-S-P-E-C-T I'd sing them falsetto like Eddie Kendrick's breaking glass with his voice. Alone in the backyard, I'd go F. Frank B-W-I-L-D-E-R-S-O-N-350 toe-to-toe with the honky tree, let it know big don't mean bad. I'm three seconds of your honky tree ass. Mom came to the back porch. I don't know how long she had been standing there. All she heard was the sound of my laughter. All she saw was that I was talking to a tree. In her mental health voice, she asked if I was all right. Oh yeah, copacetic, I said. About to beat the bark off this here honky tree, that's all. And I would have to hold my gut to keep it from busting open. Glad to see you smiling, son, she would call out to me before going back inside. There was one, honky, that wasn't a tree. He ran the principally black community center in Seattle. His name was Reg, but we seldom called him by his name, except to his face, which made perfect sense because we weren't talking to his name. Reg had the ambience of a large but fit and bearded cop I saw on several occasions when I later lived in South Africa, a man who went to black watering holes called Shabines in Soweto and bought the Africans beers. He had tortured some of them and, when it was over, made them turn the meat on the barbecue grill. He would sit down at the picnic table with them to show them that there was nothing personal in the way he had tortured them. Reg thrust his chin out when he spoke, either to praise the younger boys like me or caution the older ones. Whether in motion or at rest, he fired short, instinctive breaths between his words. He hastened from the playground, through the parking lot and gym, with the sang fright of a man who rules. A dust up went down in the parking lot under a rainless sky. I was inside the community center playing dodgeball when someone yelled, The shit is on. What was the shit and why was it on? Everyone who raced for the door seemed to know. I was the only one who had no clue. I knew, everyone knew, the hazy contours of why it had happened. The whole world of the center revolved around Reg's rules. Reg decided who could have the basketballs and who couldn't. Reg chose Afro Pessimist. A F R O P E S S I M I S M 51 The activities for the week. Reg put a demerit by your name in his book if you cracked out of turn, or just spoke too loud. Three demerits and you couldn't come back for a week. He'd given Luke, a boy of 17, his third demerit. Reg wanted Luke to step off the property. I knew that much when I rushed outside because they had been inside when Reg gave Luke his third warning. Luke had let Reg lead him to the parking lot. But he had stopped, as though he'd changed his mind, and turned to go back inside. Reg's hand was at Luke's elbow, steering him away. A crowd began to collect around them. I minnowed my way through the crush of man-childs who wanted Luke to get their licks in for them. Touch me again, I heard Luke say. Luke and Reg were toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I watched with astonishment as Reg inched closer. Reg was a man of at least 25 and he looked like he lifted weights, whereas Luke had the build of a small forward on a high school basketball team. Reg said, the rules apply to everyone, even to me. To which Luke said, touch me again, all right. Luke slipped his hand into his pocket. Reg's expression indicated that he knew exactly what would happen if Luke's hand reappeared and how much the outcome was desired not only by Luke but by all the boys around. And Reg seemed to know that his desperate courage would be devoured if he made one false move. Reg stared at us for a moment and he came nearer to tears or an apology than I had ever seen him come. I was aware of how short I was compared to the others, most of whom proper teenagers were older than me. I had to look up to see who was speaking when someone cussed Reg or told Luke to get busy. Birds strafed the sun like a fist of pepper in the last good eye of God. Luke looked like he was tickling his thigh from inside his pants pocket. Reg's voice was cracking, but he couldn't stop reciting the Afro-pessimism th Frank B-W-I-L-D-E-R-S-O-N 352 rules. I heard the click of Luke's switchblade before I saw its straight stiff gleam. Mom used to joke that in the part of New Orleans where she grew up you could get stabbed over a peanut butter sandwich. 
Even though she laughed when she said this the glint in her eyes and my fat hers sure enough convinced me she knew what she was on about. I, however, had never seen a stabbing, blood drawn with singular intent. The blood I drew from Elgar Davenport was a result of the lack of wind in the pull of the earth, not the force of my intentions. The forward intent of Luke's switchblade bore scarce resemblance to a chance parabola of a dish soap bottle that arced and fell and split Elgar's head. That's right, put your hands on me again. Someone behind me said, bleed his ass. Then someone to my left said it bleed his ass. Then a third someone sang it like a hymn. Reg shook his head, more in prayer, it seemed, than defiance. He glanced up, but the clouds had run for cover. I heard a woman's voice. No, no, you don't want to do this. I knew that voice. Sometimes, in church, if I closed my eyes, it would thread the rich fabric of Gregorian chants and touch me in my pew. My mother had shoved her way to the front, pushing us all aside like wind in tall grass. You all don't want to do this, she kept repeating. She stood between Reg and Luke. That is to say, between Reg and Luke's blade. Someone in the crowd said, who's this lady? And before I could slink back into the center, another voice said, ah, uh, that's Leoman's mama. She told Luke to take everyone inside. To my astonishment, he closed his switchblade and obeyed. That wasn't the worst part. AFROPESSIMISM 53 worst part was that she made me wait in the parking lot with the honky while she went inside to speak with Luke. When she came out, she said only one word, come. She bundled Reg into the front seat of her car. She made me sit in the back. As we drove away, Reg's cheek twitched. Sweat pasted his bangs to his forehead. My mother asked him what street he lived on and he told her. After that, no one spoke. We dropped him at his house and drove off without my being allowed to sit in the front seat. I held her in contempt for the rest of this summer, and I held my father in even more contempt for saying she did the right thing. Now I know she wasn't trying to save Reg so much as she was trying to save us from how short our futures would be cut if Reg got bled. Like her, we had our whole incarcerated lives ahead of us. 55 Chapter 3 Hattie McDaniel is dead 1 This is a story I've never told before. Not to my brother or to my sisters. Not even to the women I've partnered with and married. Nearly 40 years came and went before I could bring myself to say what happened to Stella, her daughter Malika, and me. To go into it I've always thought would only cause embarrassment for me, a sudden need to be elsewhere, which is the natural response to a confession. Even now, I'll admit the story makes me squirm, living with the shame of wanting out when I thought I could die. For years I've had to live with it feeling this shame, trying to push it away. There have been times when I've tried to write about it in hopes that through this act of remembrance putting events down on paper, I could relieve the pressure on my conscience. Courage, I seem to think comes to revolutionaries in finite quantities, like an inheritance that you stash away, let it earn interest, and draw down on when the day of reckoning arrives. It was a comforting theory. It offered hope and grace to a fool. Frank BWILDERSON 356 I believed that when it was time for the get down I would face the man like Blah soldier Asada Shakur faced the man on the New Jersey Turnpike when the state troopers shot her in the chest. That I would get busy like Jonathan P. Jackson got busy at the courthouse in Marin County, California, asterisk. If the stakes ever became high enough, if the revolution required my sacrifice, I would simply tap a secret reservoir of courage that had been accumulating inside of me from the age of 12 when I read Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice. And when my junior high and high school teachers were the doppelgangers of the defendants in political trials, like the Chicago 8 and the Panther 21. Stella happened to be one of those doubles. We were together almost 10 years, though we never married. She was 38 when we met, I was 22. I thought it all started when I met Stella at the end of March 1978, just a week after Dartmouth College sent me home for leading black students in a campaign in solidarity with the people who made the food and cleaned the toilets and lived outside of town. Apparently, some frat boys had complained to the administration that the people from the Appalachian Trail had facial and other deformities brought on by what some Dartmouth fraternity brothers called hillbilly inbreeding. 
seeing those people from the Appalachian Trail eating in the same room with them gave them indigestion, the letter claimed. The asterisk Asada Shakur is a Black Liberation Army member the Bla liberated from prison in 1979. She was granted political asylum in Cuba. Since her escape, Shakur's life has been depicted in songs, documentaries, and various literary works. Chicago 8 8 anti-Vietnam War activists charged with conspiracy to cross state lines to incite violent demonstrations at the August 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Panther 21 TWENTY1 members of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party were charged with 156 counts of conspiracy to blow up subway and police stations. Five local department stores, six railroads, and the Bronx-based New York Botanical Garden. On May 12, 1971, they were acquitted of all 156 charges. Afro-pessimism 3 AFROPESSIMISM 57 administration responded by ruling that the service workers in their dining hall in the buildings and grounds workers must from that moment on eat during off-peak hours and only in antechambers of the dining room that would be set aside for them and them alone. I lobbied the nearly 300 black students on campus. This was a fascist decree, I argued, and we had to take action. But many others pointed out that the workers who came from nearby backwater towns like Lebanon, New Hampshire, and many two-store and one saloon towns skirting the mountains flew the Confederate flag in some of the bars and yelled, nigger, from speeding pickups when they drove past us. Once there were three of us lost in the countryside in a time when not even Dick Tracy had GPS. We drove past low-roofed houses ranged along a forest road like matchsticks spilled on the floor. Every fourth or fifth car was a rusted carcass with cinder block wheels. I was startled by the lack of hatred in the eyes of the children who stared at us as we drove by. When I turned in my seat and looked back at them, they were still staring, as though waiting for God to help them name what they had just seen. In the end, the Afro-American Society voted to launch a civil disobedience campaign aimed at forcing the administration to rescind its decree. During the campaign I was arrested and jailed. A dean waited for me outside the Hanover, New Hampshire courthouse. He handed me a two-page, single-space charge sheet. I told him the town had dropped all charges. He implored me to read the letter. Your troubles with the town have just ended, but your troubles with Dartmouth College have just begun. Two years prior, the FBI had tracked me to Trinidad. Like most intelligence files, by the time they are declassified, mine is riddled with redactions like sprigs of buckshot etched on the flank of a deer. The name of the agent who tailed me to Trinidad in the winter of 1976, the winter of my sophomore year at Dartmouth College. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 358 had been redacted. Nor did he or she seem interested in what the not quite 20 year old young man he or she shadowed was studying. At the University of the West Indies, he studied Caribbean theater. He did field research on Rada, a major family of Loeth spirits, in Trinidad's incarnation of the West African religion vote on. His third course was an independent study he designed himself, a 50-page thesis paper he wrote on his experiences as a participant researcher of the Communist Party in Trinidad. The FBI file referenced none this. During his stay in Trinidad, Wilderson was in contact with a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Puerto Rican Solidarity Committee and he promised that individual he would attempt to make contacts in the United States for that organization to obtain literature for it and to attempt to procure financial aid. Wilderson allegedly claimed to be a member of an unspecified revolutionary group in the United States. He was born on April 11, 1956, in the United States, is a student at Dartmouth College, possesses U.S. passport, no. F2,316,717, and his mailing address is in Min, Box, Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire, 03755. This report was sent from Legat Car ACAS, the legal attaché in Venezuela, to Clarence M. Kelly, Hoover's successor as director of the FBI. 
According to official propaganda, the FBI legal attaché works with the law enforcement and security agencies in their host country to coordinate investigations of interest to both countries. The role of legal attachés is primarily one of coordination, as they do not conduct foreign intelligence gathering or counterintelligence investigations. No explanation is given as to why the legate for the FBI in Venezuela was running an asset in Afro AFROPESSIMISM 59 Trinidad to spy on an American student or what the nature of the joint operation between the U.S. and the host country, Trinidad or Venezuela, might be. The report begins, the confidential source abroad mentioned in the memorandum is. The redaction is nearly two lines long. In other words, more than a name is being withheld. It continues blank, requested to be informed if WILDERSON has come to the attention in the past for political extremist activities in the United States. Then, the Bureau and the Boston office are requested to advise if WILDERSON has come to prior attention in connection with security activities. This, however, is not the story I had never been able to tell. That story I'm going to tell you now, but this FBI report complicates that story. It corrupts the causal links that had helped me make sense of the violence that Stella and I were subjected to four years after I returned from Trinidad. Two years after Dartmouth College had kicked me out for leading a civil disobedience campaign on behalf of workers who are white and to our black and lonely student minds, unrepentant racists. The FBI file came in the middle of writing this chapter. It corrupted the casual logic of the events that make my hand quiver as I scratch these words with my pen. Before the file arrived, I thought that at last I can chart a point-to-point -point pilgrim's progress of the chain of events that drove Stella and me and Malika, her young daughter, from our home, events that left us no alternative but to send Malika away to live with relatives for her own safety. Events that drove Stella and me from the state of Minnesota when we ran out of friends and sanctuaries. The FBI file came when I was finally steadfast in my conviction that what happened to us had to do with Stella's past, not hers and mine. I even blamed the break-in at my studio apartment by two white men who wanted nothing of value, as collateral heat from Stella's lawsuit against the government. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 362 It's a month before I turned 24, and I've stolen my parents' car. They're in Moscow, Mom and Dad, or Peking, or maybe they're in Bremen or Belize, a two-month tour studying the pitfalls of Soviet mental health clinics. Three weeks of consulting with Chinese special education administrators, a Ford Foundation study of German urban renewal, or a rescue mission for American students who smoke too much dope and we're bounced into jail in Belize, I don't know because I don't live with them anymore. My 14-year-old brother gave me the details, but all that registered was the fact that their car was in their garage. Two years prior, in March 1978, I was, as mentioned, kicked out of Dartmouth College for leading an act of civil disobedience. It was the end of winter quarter in my senior year and I was three classes shy of my degree. To Stella and whoever else asked, I wore indefinite suspension from Dartmouth College, like a combat medal. But no one knows how much I cried on that greyhound back to Minneapolis. Before I left the room of the tribunal, with my pink slip giving me 48 hours to pack my dorm room and leave Hanover, the chair of the committee, a dean, acknowledged that the punishment was harsh but, he explained, a team of psychologists had been evaluating me since I had arrived at Dartmouth. I'd had four years these phantoms of therapy whom I had never met concluded to inculcate the esprit de corps of an Ivy League institution, the dean's exact words and the words, no doubt, of the psychologists. For four years I'd been under psychiatric care without ever meeting my caregivers. In this they were one with the FBI asset who had tracked me to Trinidad and reported to Boston and Caracas, all day, all night, angels watching over me. AFROPESSIMISM 613 Stella had changed from the woman she was nine years prior, when I saw her at the armory on the University of Minnesota's campus. I was almost 15, she had been 31 for three months. 
It was March 1971, the same month and year as the break-in at the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, that would soon blow the lid off COINTELPRO. On that morning William Calley was convicted for the massacre of nearly 500 Vietnamese civilians by Company C, in a village called My Lai. The massacre was in the forefront of Stella's mind as she stood by a bus and told anxious inductees they'd returned from Vietnam wearing the tucked sleeve of a one-armed boy. Richard Nixon took, reassuringly, to the airwaves, American troops are now in a defensive position. Dot dot. The offensive activities of search and destroy are now being undertaken by the South Vietnamese. The bombing of Cambodia was still underway and I was a shoplifter in Dinky Town two blocks away from the campus of the University of Minnesota. The cold front had quickly crumbled and temperatures rose from the 50s to as high as 70 degrees. There was no ice or slush on the sidewalks. My friend Robert Stevenson Stone and I boosted rock albums and sold them to the hippies, at cut-rate prices. With the pavements dry, we could outrun any cashier in Dinky Town. The E Pluribus Funk albums by Grand Funk Railroad, I recall, were completely round and covered with a silver-like film to resemble a large coin. The backside of the cover of this album included a picture of Shea Stadium. To celebrate Grand Funk Railroad beating the Beatles' Shea Stadium attendance record by selling out in just 72 hours, I stole three of them from a record store in Dinkytown, near a coffee shop where Bob Dylan used to play. Dinkytown was not a town or even a neighborhood, but simply two blocks of shops and eateries at Afro Pet. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 362 The Edge of the University of Minnesota our high school consisted of two buildings, one at each end of Dinky Town. Tucked behind the main gate of the university was Pike Hall, which had been the university lab school for the children of professors. At the other end of Dinky Town was an uninspired brick building that had been Marshall Public High School for white working-class kids. The two schools merged in 1968 in a social experiment financed, in large part, by funds from LBJ's Great Society initiatives. The children of liberal mandarins were made to mingle with the children of flour mill and railway workers and to give the experiment demographic integrity. Native Americans were bussed in from the south side and blacks were bussed in from the north side to the tune of 4% and 9 or 10%, respectively. On my way to the record store, where five-finger discounts awaited, I walked through Dinky Town with my face turned triumphantly up to the first real warmth of sun. Bob Stone was long and lanky, sort of like Al Green on stilts. We had been the same height when we started the ninth grade but over the Christmas break he grew like a plant in time-lapse photography. I was jealous of his height so I told myself I had something better, a letter jacket with a gold bars and felt stars for my three sports, football, ski jumping and track and field, none of which Bob participated in because, though he could run, he wasn't athletic. I told Bob to boost only E Pluribus Funk albums. He said we could get more money for some Hendrix LPs. Band of Gypsies won't fit under your shirt, I protested. But Bob wouldn't listen. He damn near got us busted. We always entered the record store separately, and we each had our inherent diversions to offer. The clerks would look up and see my black face. I didn't have to look at them to feel the way their eyes narrowed on my face and my hair. A moment later, I could feel their gaze Afro-pessimist. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-63 settle serenely on my letter jacket. Sports keep him out of trouble. Bob wasn't so lucky. He lived in the projects and he didn't have a sport. Whereas I lived in a mansion and had a sport for each season. So he didn't have a letter jacket, and the windbreaker his mother had not replaced since 7th grade looked like a nylon t-shirt. He went in first. I normally came in second. From the window on the street I watched the clerk watch Bob's every move. When I arrived he focused on me. In the interstice of time when he would decide if I was a good black or just a black, Bob would make his play and slip an album or two up under his windbreaker. I first saw Stella the same day Bob went off script and switched from Grand Funk Railroad to Jimi Hendrix. We'd been in the store five or six minutes. 
the clerk went back to reading Ramparts, that counter-cultural left-wing magazine of the period, and looking up once or twice to watch Bob, who had his back to him, as he fingered a crate of albums at the far end of the store. I had three Pluribus Funk albums lined against my ribs and still had room for two more. I walked to the counter to buy some zigzag rolling papers, hoping Bob could scram while I paid. But the dude at the till was a task stacker. He counted my change with one eye and peered over my shoulder with the other. It would have been a groove if not for the pointed breasts Bob had poking through his windbreaker, breasts he didn't have when he came in. Watch the counter, the man told me as he chased Bob out the store and down the block in the direction of campus. The long, f laxen haired cashier came back winded and sweaty, his cheeks the color of flamingos. You know him? I shook my head. Boosting ain't a hip thing, my brother. We're one tribe, man, the clerk said to me. And he thanked me for watching the cash register. Afro. Frank BWILDERSON 364 Bob and I met six blocks away at the ROTC Armory on campus, a sandy brick fortress with ramparts at each end like rooks on a chessboard. Three chartered buses faced southeast on University Avenue in front of the armory. Five white men and three white women sat in the street, their backs to the bumper of the lead bus. They smoked cigarettes. They held two fingers up in the air. A crowd gathered along the sides of the buses. Bob said we should offload our gear before the pigs came and vamped. Get they cash man, before they get they heads busted. Carbon monoxide puttered from the quiet tailpipe of one idling bus. A line of inductees filed down the steps of the armory and the crowd of protesters began to chant beneath the salmon-colored SKY. She was hard to miss, Stella. There weren't many black men among the protesters and she was the only black woman. She was in front and down the steps close to the buses. The draftees were all down the stairs now. Bob and I climbed the stairs and looked down. It was the perfect place to be in case 5-0 vamped with their nightsticks. They would bust the protesters' heads by the buses, not ours as long as we stood on higher ground. Help no, we won't go, we won't fight for Texaco, yelled the crowd. Not Stella, she spoke to each inductee, individually, as they got on their bus. She asked them if they had a loved one she could contact if they died. She told another one, the people you kill over there will always be in your head. An easy wind rustled the trees. A pair of large Bose 901 speakers in the window of the frat house across the street was playing, the way, take a load off. Fanny. The lead singer's voice was high as a lusty wildcat, as stern as a southern preacher, as depleted as a rebel soldier going back to Turkey Scratch, Arkansas. A dirt farmer at the end of his day. The music kite whistled over the crowd of protesters and the line of young, vacant faces filing onto the buses. Stella thrust a life photograph of Lieutenant Callie up to them as they passed her. I thought she was bulletproof. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-65, you're better than this, she told them. A sergeant snatched the photograph from Stella. He tore it to shreds. Tell them, she said, pointing to the men looking out the window. Turn around and tell them they'll come back with their sanity, as well as their arms and legs. Bob stood next to me on the top step of the armory. He noticed how I marveled at her. That's too much woman for you, Bob said. The hell you say? and look how she's performing for these hippies. They aren't hippies. They're SDS, look man, a couple of our teachers are here. Our school was a lab school. One building was on campus and the other building was on the other side of Dinky Town. Some of our teachers were graduate students going for their PhDs in education. The new left and the hippies are on different tips. Do you actually read the Ramparts magazines I give you? They're all the white unwashed to me. And she's playing to them. I slipped the three albums out from under my jacket and said, We're playing to the white unwashed, aren't we? We're getting paid. She's getting used. The war's not a race issue. It's a class issue. It affects us all. I'm just saying I know her type. What type is that? The type who into white boys. Not like it matters to you, the way you came up. How did I come up? Forget it, Frank. No, tell me. And which is it, she's too much woman for me or we're both the same kind of Oreo?
Go for what you know, Frank. She could burp you at night before you go to sleep. Afro pessim Frank B W I L D E R S O N three sixty six as it happened, Stella, during my high school and college years, worked as a nurse until she broke her back. It never healed well enough for her to go back to nursing, so she went to work as an administrator in the College of Education, where my father was a dean during the Vietnam War. She managed the placement and affairs of graduate students who worked as teachers at the experimental lab high school that Bob and I attended on campus. But in 1978 when we became lovers, she worked as an aide for elementary school teachers and collected welfare to cover the gap. After that first meeting, or rather, sighting, at the armory, seven years would pass until we met again. And the seven years from the age of 15 to the age of 22 were longer in my mind than the seven years she traveled from 31 to 38. Which is to say, less time and fewer memories had passed in those seven years for Stella than they had for me. I had gone from ninth grade to the end of my senior year in college. Unlike me, she grew but did not grow up in those years. So, when she saw me again at a branch of the library near her house, in faded khaki pants tucked into fry boots, an army surplus trench coat draped across the chair I wasn't using, and my hair cornrowed in neat lines along my scalp, she recognized me immediately. But I didn't know where I'd seen this beautiful woman with her wide-eyed daughter before. The next day, I hitchhiked from Minneapolis to Columbus, Ohio. After a month, I came back to Minneapolis and looked her up. By the end of the summer, we were in love. We baked souffles in her large cast iron skillet. In the evening, after supper, when her daughter, Malika, went to bed, we would sit on her front porch and watch the sun redden. And I would read to her from a novel I was writing or she'd teach me how to listen to Miles. The long pauses between notes, Stella said, just under the music. Miles made silence part of his music. Small clusters of intention Afro-pessimism. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-67 without sound, she said. She made me feel comfortable enough to read my fledgling prose to her. She closed her eyes as she listened. So much woe in your voice, she said. You're the Prince of Darkness. You were born on a Wednesday. Am I right? Two bolts of silver gray etched themselves on the front of her natural hair like low sparks of lightning rising above her eyes. Heads turned to watch her when she entered a room, and I felt a surge of manhood when they looked from her to me. That's right people, she's with me. At a distance, folks on campus would take her for Angela Davis, and I was honored as if through osmosis. But even when the mirage had melted they drank of her singular beauty for even in leather sandals she was tall for a woman. She didn't powder her face or rouge her lips. She owed her flawless skin to the fact that she ate organically long before it was the fashion and that she had no truck with sugar. When I first saw those two lightning bolts in her hair, I thought she could take down the world. Some folks called her a troublemaker. I saw a black woman who stood up for herself and anyone else who was being abused. When she sat in her porch chair and watched people come and go across the courtyard of the apartment complex where she lived Stella, a smoked, a corncob pipe without ever lighting it. As my father had done when I was a kid. And it looked just like the one I saw my great-grandmother smoke when I was 12 years old, the one and only time I saw her. In fact, Stella had the same cleft at the bridge of her nose that I see on Grandma Harper when I conjure her. It chiseled both women's gaze. Stella would bring her flute to hear Frank Wess's play, long after he left Count Basie's band. The club was small and half the people weren't listening to the music, so when the band took a break Stella took me to the stage and introduced me to him. Then she took out her flute, and Wess's improvised with her for a moment or two. No way in hell was I going back to Dartmouth. Frank B W I L D E R S O N 368 She saw how depressed I was about being kicked out of school. The stronger my putative pose of indifference, the more seismic my mood swings. I could be in a room with Malika and Stella and I might not say a word for five minutes, the words roiled in my head, loud as fog, horns. Not only had Stella been a nurse, but she was an autodidact nutritionist. She was the first person to tell me how cancer might be cured by diet, something I learned, years later, was called the Gerson Method. 
She and Malika rarely ate meat and very little poultry. I can't remember one fried meal, and places like McDonald's, White Castle, and Burger King, where I had worked in Dinky Town when I first laid eyes on Stella, were off limits. I ate a fair amount of chocolate bars in 1978, when we first got together. She made me uncomfortable, the way she watched me and said, it's your funeral, with the shrug of her shoulders. When I finally moved in with her, she would snatch a Snickers bar out of my hand with Let's see what those criminals are poisoning you with turning a three-syllable word into two. Then, as I looked on with forlorn lust, Stella would read aloud all the unpronounceable chemicals put into it by the Mars, Incorporated, a corporation that I even is a young communist. Saw is my friend who just wanted me enjoy a scrumptious nougat topped with caramel and peanuts and robed in mouth-watering milk chocolate. I had never thought to read the ingredients, nor would I have thought they were poison. But Stella insisted that the high fructose corn syrup and the artificial flavoring were major contributors to my mood swings in depression. On New Year's Day 1979, she made a deal with me. Give up my Mars bars, my Snickers bars, my three musketeers for six weeks. She also wanted me to be a labial sleuth with her in the store, by which she meant we would read the labels of everything we considered purchasing, from cereal to ketchup and discard the products with more than 7 grams of processed sugar or any amount of high fructose corn syrup. If after 6 weeks, I did not feel the fog lift from my brain, if Afro-pessimism, A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-69 the mood swings continued as before, then I could go back to my old reckless ways. Needless to say, Stella's wager worked. I had the kind of clarity of mind that I had not known in my two decades and change on the planet. I often wonder how I might have weathered the storm at Kenwood Elementary School had I known about sugar when I was a child. It wasn't just abstinence she wanted from me. Over those six weeks we read William Dufta's Sugar Blues, a book that argues that sugar was once the cocaine of the Western world, and is still as debilitating and addictive as nicotine. In winter we made stovetop coffee in a saucepan of water and four tablespoons of fine ground coffee floating on the surface. If we got to talking at the table and not paying attention, we would almost let it boil. It had to only almost boil for its rich roasted taste to keep from turning bitter. The year I made up my mind that I was never going back to Dartmouth, we lived five blocks from the campus. The war in Vietnam had ended three years before, and the campus didn't look anything like the place I knew in high school. When Saigon fell in 1975 the atmosphere thinned of the righteous indignation that had thickened the air. It made me melancholy and made Stella sort of a has-been. Gone were the incandescent barricades severing the university's Washington Avenue artery to downtown Minneapolis. Gone were the voices with their list of demands from the occupied windows of Morrill Hall. Gone were the lectures that were thrown out the window when classes and seminars were commandeered for anti-imperialist teach-ins. All that was a brief moment when the world was being remade, and Stella could arrive, unannounced, and she could rise and be applauded before she even spoke. But that moment was no more. The white left had robbed her while licking her face. One, two, three mini Vietnams, she said with a laugh. It wasn't about Vietnam. It was about the shit they hadn't worked out at home. Now they want to go home. That's what you can do if you're white Afro-pessimism. Frank B-W-I-L-D-E-R-S-O-N 370 in this country. You can be a tourist in your own movie. Stella wasn't wrong. Whether underground fugitives were even turning themselves into the police and doing unheard of deals with prosecutors. While members of the Black Liberation Army were still being hunted and tortured if and when they were captured. At one sleepy New York precinct weather underground fugitives made the inconvenient error of trying to surrender in the afternoon on a Friday. They were told to come back on Monday and turn themselves in. Imagine, Stella said, if that was you and me turning ourselves in. Friday be damned. They would stay late, not to book us but to beat us, and be so deep in their pleasure when they got done that they'd forget to put in for the overtime. One night in bed, I said that the two streaks of silver in her hair were beautiful. But I noted that a woman in her late thirties was too young to have grey hair. 
Did something happen to you? I asked her. Something dramatic? I wanted her to trust me the way I trusted her. Stress, she said. Then she turned over and went to sleep. Stella turned me on to the works of Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. Together we discovered Fuentes, Amato, and Garcia Marquez. And though she was almost a generation older and grew up in the South, while well, I was born in the South but grew up in Minnesota, we shared the same way of being in our bodies, the same tonalities in our voices when we were with our white friends. We both knew how to make them feel at home. Our words were effortless and well chosen. They told us not in words, how authentic they felt with us, how they were going to take themselves seriously from now on. The jazz was always soft when they came to our house. With our black friends we discussed what worrisome burdens white people can be. But this duality had limits. Making our white friends feel safe in our presence made them think that we were somehow evolved in a way that the black people they saw burning down the cities in the 1960s were not. AFROPESSIMISM 71 From 1978 until we fled our apartment in the spring of 1980, we hauled crates of apples and organic produce with our white friends at the Wedge. The city's first coops, with its unfinished floors and its funky bins of oatmeal, chia seeds, raw almonds, and stone ground millet in bulk. They felt at home in our home. A sense of welcome they could never feel, even if it was extended to them in the black neighborhood on the near north side of town. Our dwelling was the ground floor of a duplex in the center of a courtyard and drive that was ringed by a ramshackle horseshoe of wooden townhouse apartments just five blocks from campus. There's something about a campus community that makes you feel as though nothing catastrophic can happen to you there, as though the real world begins at the border. No lunch bucket laborers stepping tired off the bus, no deuce and a quarters double parked on the boulevard, no big hats and overcoats slung over one arm in basement nightclubs. No burst of sound in the street that stops the heart. Visiting our home was less strain on their nerves than adding ornaments from far off places to their shelves. And they left with a feeling that they'd marched in Selma or hurled bricks during the riots on the near north side. But that wasn't enough for Josephine, who worked with nuclear fusion and nuclear waste in a lab at the university. I've long since forgotten if she was on the faculty or if she worked as a technician. This amnesia has kept me sane for almost 40 years. She lived above us. Before I came on the scene, Josephine and Stella had issues, mainly their disagreement over the ethics and safety of nuclear power. The Three Mile Island accident had happened on March 28, 1979, less than six months after I became a factor in Stella's and, by extension, Josephine's lives. But their heated debates over this issue, and even the way Stella's routine changed when we became lovers, were not the real cause of the meltdown between these two women. Stella was simply tired of playing Hattie Afro Pessimism 3 p Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 372 McDaniel to Vivian Lee. I've nursed her through her failed relationships, but she never seemed to care about what I was going through. Josephine seemed to think that the downstairs part of the house was simply an extension of the upstairs part where she lived. It wasn't the unscheduled visits that annoyed Stella and me, but the injury Josephine felt when Stella asked her to knock before coming inside or to call first when, Frank is here. When she heard such words, you could set your watch by the sundial on her face. Guilt, resentment, aggression. Malika, Stella, and I were in the back of the house eating dinner at the kitchen table. We heard the front door open and close. Josephine appeared in the threshold of the kitchen with bushels of lilacs in a straw basket. She had picked them in the courtyard just for us. No doubt, in her mind the gift of flowers offset her violation of our space. But, looking back on it, all I see is the extension of the master's prerogative and the way Josephine treated Stella. There's a scene in the film Twelve Years a Slave in which the master, Edwin Epps, bursts into the slave's cabin while they're in bed. He dances in the middle of their sleeping quarters and commands them to rise and make merriment in the big house with him. It has taken me 40 years to understand how neither he nor Josephine had violated anyone's space. The cabin where they slept belonged to him as much as their flesh belonged to him.
The regime of violence that made them his property and prosthetics of his desire made it impossible to see what he did as a violation. This is to say that I was wrong to think Josephine did something wrong. At one time in history, eastern seaboard slaves had grown to believe in the elasticity of accumulation and fungibility, in other words, slaves on the eastern seaboard were not Afro-pessimists, in that they did not see themselves as primarily the objects of captivity, rather, they saw themselves as the subjects of hyper-exploitation, and AFROPESSIMISM 73 Like me and Stella in 1980, slaves of the late 18th and 19th centuries on the eastern seaboard might have imagined that their dwellings were also their homes, and not the always and already home of Josephine and her race. They were in for a traumatic awakening when, starting in 1808, the westward movement of plantation culture to Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, whether it was driven by individual owners who accompanied their slaves or by professional slave traders, tore that society asunder, exiling hundreds of thousands from their birthplace and traumatizing those who remained. Families and sometimes whole communities dissolved under the pressure of this second great migration. In short, Josephine was libidinally within her rights on the day she barged in while we were eating dinner. With as much poise as she could muster, Stella thanked Josephine, and said that the two of them should meet tomorrow for coffee. I thought you said you and Frank were busy tomorrow, Mom. Stella eyed her daughter as if to say, let's not do this now. Josephine was in no mood for discretion. In fact, Stella's poise rankled Josephine more than if she had jumped out of a bag. Why coffee all of a sudden? Josephine said, to talk about boundaries. I thought you were a feminist, she told Stella, as she turned to go. For almost 40 years, I've wondered how this scene between Josephine and Stella played out in Malika's 12-year-old mind. We weren't always the best parents. Stella and I, we never took time with Malika after these tense confrontations with someone Afro-pessimist. AFROPESSIMISM75, you're saying the federal government or someone at Hugh Asterisk knew about all this, I asked her. I meant it as a question. She took it as a challenge. You can ask my lawyer, Noam Davidov, she said, if you don't believe me. You talk like you're used to being doubted. I'm a black woman. What rock have you been under? Noam Davidov came to the house and said that after years of wrangling with the federal government, he had secured a court date for her, November 13, 1980, which at this time was in less than a year. He also said he didn't have the resources, I remember very distinctly the word he used was resources, to help her. Then he looked by way and said, or you, until we go to court. He didn't mean, help. He meant protect, and by, resources, he seemed to be referring to protection. It was then that I would understand the gravity of Stella's lawsuit. The board members of Urban Risers whom she was accusing of graft and maybe even people in the government who ran interference for them or looked the other way could not afford for the recordings and documents Stella had amassed to be made public. Gnome's hair was curly, like Abby Hoffman's. He was a movement lawyer, it was clear he earned more gratitude than money, with his brown corduroyas, his unknotted necktie and his stonewashed raincoat home from the wars. In the early 1970s, Noam Davidov worked with the radical lawyer William Kunstler, as well as Mark Lane, and a group of researchers to represent the American Indian Movement AIM, defendants in the Wounded Knee trial. I didn't know Stella back then, but Stella and Noam had been lovers, and she attended every session of the trial. At Asterisk Health, Education, and Welfare, also known as Hugh, was a cabinet-level department of the United States government from 1953 until 1979. Attorney Mark Lane joined Kunstler's legal team in 1970. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 376, the front door, she straightened the collar of his shabby raincoat. So now a dull, metallic jealousy began to gather at the back of my mind. She and Noam shared a history salted with victories, like the verdict in favor of the Native American defendants Noam had helped to secure. She and I had no history at all, and the history we were making, I feared, a fear that yokes me to this day, was unfolding as a story I would never want to tell.
I wished I'd gone to the kitchen or turned my head to cough. To go back in time and orchestrate a random distraction to prevent me from the sight of her fingers straightening his collar. I wanted him to leave but just as strongly, I wanted him to stay. I believed that he'd not uh, had the credentials to tell her to take the settlement and not go to trial. As much as my heart pained to see them speak so effortlessly together, even when they disagreed, as much as I wanted that to be over. It was clear that if anyone could change Stella's mind it was Gnome, not me. He made it plain that the government would settle with Stella out of court. Gnome was absolutely sure Stella would get $100,000. She would have to hand over all of the tapes of the secret recordings she'd made when she was an employee of Urban Risers. She would have to relinquish financial documents she photocopied to prove corruption, and the secret audio recordings she made of Urban Risers meetings that might be incriminating of Capile Kenyatta, who had been the director of Urban Risers, or employees of the federal government with whom Capile Kenyatta worked. All of this would be sealed. There's one more thing. You'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement giving your word you won't talk about the case. Ever, he emphasized. You talk about this after they pay you, Stella, and they'll come after you. What if I don't settle out of court? Then you're down for next November a week after the presidential elections of 1980. As your lawyer, I have to advise you. AFROPESSIMISM77 Stella scoffed. I've waited years, I can wait 11 months. Take a few days to think about it. You wouldn't settle if you were in my shoes, would you? You never settled with the government. I was never the litigant. And I'm not a single mom with financial challenges. Just say, well fair, no, it's only two syllables. Have you forgotten all the people who were murdered by government proxy during the wounded knee affair? Then Noam turned to me. What do you think? You didn't answer my question, Stella interjected before I could speak. You can start over with that kind of money. He said, still not answering the question, Stella rejoined. A trial could reveal Capile Kenyatta's connection to government officials who can't afford to be linked to someone like him. If you make it to the courthouse. If I make it to the courthouse. I watched these two old lovers talk about death as though they were the heroine and hero of a film noir classic weighing their options against the mob. But as the conversation wound down and Stella had still refused a settlement, I knew it wasn't a film and I knew that I wasn't a spectator. If I settle out of court, Stella said, as Noam set his teacup down on the living room table and inched forward in the easy chair. I'll never know who was behind all this. If it even makes it to the newspapers, and you're basically telling me that won't happen because the money buys my silence. Based on the evidence so far they'd call it another example of the kind of gangsterism in shady business dealings people associate with the ghetto in North Minneapolis. But not Afro-pessimism. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 378 When they think of 3M Corporation in Maplewood, the regional banks downtown, or the Pillsbury Company's assortment of businesses, the government will get away clean. $100,000 is nothing for them to pay if it means they can avoid indictments up the food chain. Gnome stood up and said he understood. Stella had always been a fighter and he hadn't expected her to take the out-of-court settlement. As I watched them and listened, I had the feeling of being 11 years old, seated at a folding table with other children at Thanksgiving, catching fragments of what the adult said at the long old wood table in the center of the room. Gnome picked up his vintage leather briefcase, scooped the files from the coffee table, and put them in. There's more to this than meets the eye, he said as he slung his raincoat on. It sloped to one side. A corner of his collar had folded under and he hadn't noticed. She rose and plucked it free. It was an act of tenderness and joy and, I hope to God, not desire. Oh, Gnome, she chuckled as she patted his lapel with her palm. For the past ninety minutes I had waited for an intimacy to pass between them. He smiled back. They've done this a hundred times before, I thought. I watched her watch him down the stairs. Though I spent nights on end in the lower level of the duplex where Stella lived with Malika, I still had my own apartment when Noam came to Stella's house. It was November 1979. By the end of the year I would be on welfare.
In fact, it was that November of 1979 that Stella and I saw our revolution die. It was the month we rejoiced at the news that Asada Shakur had been freed from a maximum security prison by the Black Liberation Army. It was the month the Ku Klux Klan shot and killed black demonstrators in Greensboro, North Carolina, just rode up to the picket line, got out of the car, and shot them at near point-blank range. November was the month we watched it on the news. The Klansmen opened their trunk. They fetched their afro pessimist AFROPESSIMISM 79 weapons. They sprinted 10 yards to the marchers. They opened fire. Five lay dead on the ground. That month, Stella and I had no idea that Asada would have to spend the rest of her life in Cuba, in exile. We had no idea that the film we saw would not be enough to convict the assailants. And we had no idea that by March of the coming year we'd be sleeping in my parents' car. Several days after Nam left, days crowded with silence as Stella thought on what he had said, she called a man named Jamal. She told him she needed protection. There was silence on his end for three interminable beats. Protection from who? Jamal asked her. The system, she said. By the end of 1979, the number of people Stella knew who could hear the system without raising an eyebrow had dwindled. But Jamal used to say, just because you're not paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. In 1968 when he and Stella and damn near everyone they knew believed in revolution, Jamal had gone up against the system and did a nickel of a 10-year stint in the Stillwater prison in Bayport, Minnesota. He wasn't someone who would raise an eyebrow when someone mentioned the system. As a result of Stella's call, Jamal and a brilliantly taciturn brother dropped by Stella's house one night when I wasn't there. Jamal said, let's go for hamburgers, as he motioned to the ceiling light and the telephone, then he put his finger over his lips. Stella thought of White Castle as a temple where Satan killed you with sodium and trans fats. But this wasn't a night for insisting that Jamal sit down with her and pour over back issues of Prevention magazine. In the booth at the White Castle restaurant on 36th Avenue and East Lake Street, Stella's daughter, who never missed anything, watched as the quiet brother looked around the restaurant, then nodded to Jamal. Malika saw Jamal unwrap his hamburger and Afro-pessimism 3. Frank Bwilderson 380 put it on his lap. Then he fetched something from his pocket and wrapped it in the hamburger paper, which he passed to Stella. Later that night, Malika told me that she got up to go to the bathroom and found her mother sitting on the bed with an automatic handgun and a magazine of bullets. She watched her mother snap the clip into place, wrap it in an oil skin, and hide it in the closet deep behind the shoes. I was not yet driving a cab at that point. That would start when I moved in with Stella. I still worked as a waiter at Williams Cafe, but the restaurant was slow one night and I was sent home early. My studio was on the ground floor of an old brownstone six blocks from Lake of the Isles. The key worked but the door to my studio was chained from the inside. How I could have done that? I thought in self-rebuke. It took a moment for me to realize that, in point of fact, I could not have done that. Someone else did that. That someone was inside. I sprinted down the hall. I burst out the front door and dashed to where I could see my apartment window. The alley light lit them in silhouette. One leg curled out the window of my studio, then his torso, then the other leg. He stumbled and almost fell before he ran. Then the other one rolled out with the grace of a pole vaulter clearing the bar. His long hair flounced up and down in the low yellow light. Like a fool, I chased them halfway down the alley. Like an even bigger fool, I called the cops. When they arrived, even with the Murphy bed closed into the wall there was little space left. With one large cop by the sink and stove and me and his partner in the middle of the room. You have this wad of cash on you, or you left it here when you went to work? The one by the sink said to me, pointing to the money in the dish drainer, tip money that I carelessly left by the sink until I went to the bank. I told him I had left it there. Did you leave this Miranda camera here when you went to the restaurant? I nodded. The cop by the sink was counting. 80, 85, 90, Afro-pessimism. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-81-95 dollars in cash. 
A camera worth what to see notes? 300 bucks worth of stuff just left here? You say someone, two people. You say two people climbed in, chained the door from the inside, and then, what played bridge, had a cup of coffee? You see how it looks from where we stand. I have a right to privacy. That's what they stole. They looked at me as though I had said I have a right to shingles. My books had been taken from my bookshelf and arranged on the floor in neat orderly rows. The case to my typewriter was open and pages from a novel I was writing were spread on the desk. Whoever did this knew my schedule. They thought they had time. Time for what? You won't know that unless you investigate. The cop by the sink nodded. Investigate. Gotcha. Then he stooped and picked up two books from the floor. I.F. Stone, The Killings at Kent State, How Murder Went Unpunished, Karl Marx, The Communist Manifesto. He placed them both back neatly on the floor. What are you reading this stuff for? Not surprisingly, I soon moved in with Stella and Malika and a gun in the closet that we didn't know how to use. For we had fallen back to sleep after making love when we heard someone enter Stella's apartment. We were naked under the sheets. It was half past nine in the morning. For a moment I thought this isn't happening. Now I realize what struck such terror in me, that which I had no words for at the time. My mind flashed on the image of our Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 81 Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 811, 22 20th 945 AM January 22nd 2945 AM. Frank B W I L D E R S O N 382 throats being slit. This isn't a robbery. They want to be heard. They want us to know they're here. I jumped out of bed. My feet slapped the wood floor. I opened the closet where Stella kept the gun Jamal had given her. Stella wasn't alarmed. She told me it was Malika who'd left earlier for school. She must have forgotten something. The front door and living room were near Stella's bedroom. As she tugged into her clothes she called out through the door, What did you forget Malika? There was no answer. A chair scraped the floor. I started to get dressed as well, but Stella motioned for me to stay in the bedroom. Let me talk to her before you come out. The voice that accosted Stella in the living room did not belong to Malika. Aren't you tired of this pattern, Stella, putting me in cold storage whenever you find someone new? It was Josephine. I couldn't believe it. After what Stella had told her just the other day about boundaries, this woman had the nerve to enter the apartment, again, without knocking. Get out, I heard Stella say. He's your daughter's age. I opened the bedroom door in time to see Stella grab Josephine and yank her toward the door. Hattie McDaniel is dead. You're not welcome anymore. They were on the front porch now. Josephine didn't fight back but nor was she cowed. I stayed inside the screen door, not knowing what my role was or should be. Stella told Josephine, You've been misled. I'm not here for your amusement, and your being a nuclear physicist at the University of Minnesota doesn't make you Scarlett O'Hara. Stella, we used to be there for each other. Stella let out a shrill laugh. That's what you call it, there for each other. You're a parasite, no, a psychopath. You act like you own me. The word, psychopath, inflamed Josephine's face. For nearly Afro-pessimism, AFROPESSIMISM 83 40 years the expression on her face has boomeranged from the back of my brain at intervals beyond my control. I last saw it at the movies. The film was 12 years a slave, and a woman in the film by the name of Mary Epps looked first at her husband and then at her husband's concubine. A slave named Patsy, with the same wild eyes and thin mouth as Josephine's. In the film, Mary Epps demands that her husband sell Patsy but Edwin Epps tells her that he'd divorce her before he sold Patsy. This all takes place in the drawing room at midnight. Edwin Epps has forced his family's slaves to wake up even though they must work in the fields in a few hours and play music and dance for him in the drawing room. What's telling about this scene is the way Patsy functions as an object, but not a subject, for both Edwin and Mary. You will sell her, Mary demands. The slaves have stopped dancing. They are all in the same room with the couple that owns them but they are objects, not agents, of the discussion, even Patsy. Neither Edwin nor Mary ever turn to Patsy and say, in the case of Edwin, for example, do you have a take on this mess, or, in the case of Mary, 
How could you be so low as to steal my husband? Patsy has enough survival skills to stay silent. But this doesn't stop Mary Epps from bashing her in the eye with a large crystal whiskey decanter when Edwin Epps refuses to sell her. For his part, Edwin simply sizes Patsy, lying on her back on the floor, clutching her eye, is dragged away by two of the other slaves. He yells at them, he commands Solomon and the other fiddlers to go on playing, he shouts at the others to show some merriment and dance, he says. I will not have my mood spoiled. I don't think Josephine was enraged because she had just been called a psychopath. I think she was enraged because Stella had dared to speak. Josephine's slave had spoken, period. This has less to do with the actual word Stella used psychopath and more to do with the fact that an object meant merely for the pleasure of possession had Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 83 Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 384 gazed back at a human subject. Stella had cracked out of turn, asterisk. For years, Stella had suffered Josephine's presence and possessiveness diplomatically. In other words, Josephine had characterized Stella's behavior, really, without restraint, but Stella had never returned the favor. It was the same pavane that black women have danced with white women for centuries, where only the white woman could break the rules and take hold of the black woman. Josephine was now furious. She ran through a list of names, six of Stella's past lovers, a famous saxophonist who got his start in Minneapolis and now had good work in Chicago, a Pro Bowl linebacker who had just been inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame, Noam Davidov, the civil rights lawyer who had been in the news during Wounded Knee, her ex-husband, Uri, whom Stella had helped make his mark as a counterculture photographer, a famous oil painter, and, of course, the man named Jamal, who couldn't decide, Josephine said, if he was a revolutionary or a heroin addict. Stella shoved her. Josephine didn't skip a beat as she stumbled down the stairs of the porch, saying, now you're in there fucking a foster child. If I'm a psychopath, you're a pedophile. Stella told Josephine that if she ever entered without knocking again, she, Stella, would treat it like breaking and entering. People from the surrounding walk-ups took note of the two women standing on the gravel drive. Josephine raised her voice so that they could all hear and said, are you threatening me? First you assault me, now you're threatening me. The manager of the complex was outside tinkering on his 1976 Harley Davidson. I'd managed to avoid him up till now. His hair shagged down to his shoulders but up front, he was practically bald. He wore a black leather jacket with markings and insignias I didn't asterisk we will see later how this is not the same as a non-black subjugated person breaking the rules or the contract of their domination. Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 84 Afro-Pessimism 3 AFROPESSIMISM 85 Recognized but he had friends with bikes and the same leather jackets with the same insignias that made my skin tremor when their engines rumbled outside our windows. His name, I had learned, was Cody, and I often saw him in the company of bikers. He wore shades both day and night, and from his belt hung a leather sheath with a blade that was blacksmithed from a railroad tie. Josephine and Cody had never been friends. Josephine once told Stella he looked like a rapist. And although Josephine and Cody were not that far apart in age, Josephine, with her close cropped hair, her oversized handbag, her wooden clogs, and her black tights and shapeless tunics bore no resemblance to the women I had seen on the back of his motorcycle. But the bond they formed against Stella in the courtyard that day was formed spontaneously and with the ease of mental telepathy. Cody's feet guided him to stand next to Josephine. We're not having threats made in the courtyard, he told Stella. I went into the kitchen. I remember opening one of the drawers. The top drawer was for tableware. The middle drawer held soup ladles and kitchen knives. The bottom drawer held screwdrivers, hammers, and nails. I ran down the porch steps and over to Stella's side. She had just called them both xenophobes. All your two-dollar words and you're still on welfare, Josephine said, from behind her biker prints. Up until that moment I had lived 23 years on the planet under the false assumption that my greatest fear was the fear of death. 
but now, as I saw the gothic patterns of death on Cody's jacket and the head of a rail spike that someone had forged into a knife, I knew that I was afraid of something much worse than death. A few folks from the other units ventured near now. They asked Cody and Josephine what was going on. It was then that it struck me, the thing I had never before been able to get hold of in words. I feared a death without meaning. A death without a story to it, a chain of events that would Afro pessimism 3 pp. I Frank B W I L D E R S O N 386 makes sense to those who survived me, a clear and logical chain of events that anyone could read and, when they finished, lift their heads from the page and say, I can see why he died. It's under control, Cody told the people around us. Then, to Stella, you need to go inside. You need to get out of Stella's face, I said. My palm was an oil slick, the hammer or knife I had grabbed in the kitchen kept slipping. I don't recall how this confrontation drew to a close. I can see all four of us exchanging words and then, apparently, walking away from each other. I can see Josephine walking away, and she's inviting Cody up to her apartment for a beer. She'd never said boo to him before. I see me and Stella mounting the steps on the porch. I see what came after, because it didn't end there. What went down between Stella and Josephine can't be reduced to a fight between neighbors. The antagonism between them was prefigured before they even met. In other words, the die was cast hundreds of years ago on the plantation. The fact that Josephine was, on a conscious level, oblivious to this antagonism doesn't diminish it. In fact, when driven by the force of one's unconscious one often plays out one's role with a deeper sense of commitment to maintaining the paradigm of despotic violence into which one has been stitched and stamped from the beginning. Stella, however, was a student of racial antagonisms. Her seeming obliviousness to the irreconcilability between her position in the world and Josephine's was not so much the labor of unconscious disavowal as, I would say, a tactical maneuver of the mind, one she designed for years in order to postpone, if not avoid altogether, the very moment at which she and Josephine had arrived. The moment in which the antagonism insisted upon a stage on which it could be played out in the open. Stella, in other words, had spent years attempting to displace her Afro-pessimism 3 AFROPESSIMISM87 Reservations and Discomfort Over Josephine's Behavior as a White Person onto Josephine's Commitment to Nuclear Energy She wanted to make the conflict saint by homing in on the contradiction between Josephine's liberal politics and her reactionary commitment to nuclear fusion. This is far more manageable for a black person's mind than nightly ruminations on the ways in which my upstairs neighbor is my master and I am her slave. There's no hope for a redemptive narrative if that is the case. But this was a function of Stella's active intellectual labors. A mind game she played with herself to crowd into corners distant and dark her acute awareness not just of the power imbalance between her and Josephine, but of the rituals of terror and the regime of violence that allowed white women to see in her face what they needed to see. You can live a lifetime as a white woman's mirror, Stella once told me. She was the implement of Josephine's renewal and sense of herself. What happens when that tool talks back, when the mirror breaks itself? It seemed like four days I didn't go by without Stella needing to claim her right to privacy. Each time, Josephine seemed to harden, a chitin shell now surrounding her. When Stella called Josephine a xenophobe, Josephine looked like she'd been hit with a nasty gym shoe. There were three or four neighbors in the courtyard. They heard it too. They stopped. No one said anything. Josephine seemed to have lost the air of command she carried so effortlessly. The whole ordeal lasted all of 30 seconds, but it seemed like a three-year root canal. At last, Josephine said, I don't know what that word means. The scientist had been bested by the welfare mother. If only it was that and that alone. Josephine seemed to quake. She stood perfectly still. She didn't bat an eye. But everyone could see the crags and earthquake of shame had torn through her pride. Stella made Josephine suffer, made her watch her mouth for the hint of a smile. Look it up, said Stella. After Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 388 on a plantation Stella would have paid on the spot for her cheekiness, and paid for it in flesh.
Josephine would have had her horse whipped in the middle of the courtyard. But this was the winter of 1979-1980, and it was Minnesota, not Mississippi, and Minnesota, after all, was the land of progressives. A public whipping would embarrass Josephine and her liberal sense of ethics. And yet, rather than avoid Stella and let us live in peace, Josephine did all she could to set the stage to occasion and allow the conditions that were guaranteed to lead to her humiliation. She was a masochist, yes, but she was also in charge of the masochistic encounter. Hattie McDaniel is dead, Stella had averred. She was saying she was sick and tired of being Josephine's tool, a stage prop, as she put it. For whatever sick shit is going on in your mind, these words index the regime of violence I alluded to earlier, a regime of violence that Josephine, as a white person, had at her disposal, whether or not she ever tapped into it. For decades, I have tried to understand why Josephine, and later her two male accomplices Cody and another man whom I had never seen before took her satisfaction from our flesh. How it got to the point where our only options were to go upstairs and break her door down in an effort to find out why our skin was burning. Or to flee our home, leave completely, drop a note in her mailbox, we give up. UWIN we would not have been the first black family to be run out of town. In 1921, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street was burned to the ground, 35 people were massacred, 800 were hospitalized, black businesses were bombed from the air. And picnic lynching is not an oxymoron, but a blending of pleasures and psychic renewal. When Stella said, Hattie McDaniel is dead, she named herself as Josephine's slave. In the South, perhaps, such a naming would end Afro-pessimism 3 pp. I -N -D -D -A -F -R -O -P -E -S -S -I -M -I -S -M 89 work in Stella's favor. If Josephine had been a Southerner, she might have been immune to shame, and she might not have been Stella's friend. But Josephine didn't see herself as a Southerner. She saw herself as an enlightened Northerner. What true blood woman from the land of cotton would wear clogs and REI jackets and choose to live a mile from campus in a ramshackle block of flats where students lived cheek by jowl with a few greybeard relics from the new left. Middle-aged bohemians, and a few young, sanctified yuppies living on the cheap, trying to save enough money to cross the river and move downtown. The courts, as our complex was called, did not seem like the antebellum South. Yet, in some strange way, every single scene in America is played out on an antebellum stage. It's just that in the North it can take the actor some time to learn their lines and play their roles. Josephine didn't know how she'd been cast. The roles she and Stella had played for so long were only legible in her unconscious until Stella said, Hattie McDaniel is dead. The brilliance of recognition flashed in her eyes. The terror of lynchings, whippings, mutilations, and her people's violent consumption of the African continent unmasked itself as her birthright an inheritance she did not have to ask for. The tension between Josephine and Stella, and later between Cody and me, escalated into violence, violence that is hard to mold into narrative because violence in a narrative must have an explanation, a trigger, a contingent moment that makes it make sense. But anti-black violence won't cooperate with narrative. The explanation bleeds out beyond the actors. It is immune to rational thinking and logical predictions. It is a force from which there is no sanctuary. It is rainproof to rebuke, for it comes as enforcement followed by the law. When violence is the law, and not the effect of its enforcement, it presents the rules of narrative with a crisis because what we have is a situation that resists retelling. For the simple reason that narrative Zafro pessimism 3 Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 390 Causal Principle, the ghost in the machine we call the causal logic, or because principle, of the story, is missing. This is how a black story is jinxed. There is no ghost in the machine, the reason for the violence is beyond the grasp of reason. There's nothing, universal, about it, therefore, the only way to make it intelligible is to leave out the parts that may only be accepted by another black person, and even then discreetly. What if you belong to a race of people with a private army under the command of their fantasies? Reason would have to go to war with your regime of violence before your conditions would be ripe for you to reconsider the phantasms you had projected onto the world. 
Imagine the resources of a violent structure that can deputize the whims of an entire race. Slave narratives have tried to imagine this violence, but they have also turned away at crucial moments, moments when it becomes clear that without a casual logic the story could fall apart. In cases such as these, the solution has been to disavow the inconvenient truths and get on with narrative. This is how Northerners get along. We lived in the northernmost state on the Mississippi River, where calling people by their names Josephine, Stella, Frank, Cody, while at the same time disavowing their positions within a regime of violence master, slave, is required for the sake of racial harmony. But a thousand miles south as the crow flies on that stretch of the Mississippi from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, the antagonisms have routinely been played out in the open. If one asked Mary Epps why she bashed Patsy's eye with a whiskey decanter or why she goaded Edwin Epps into whipping Patsy within an inch of her life, as he eventually does, even she would try to find a reason, Patsy seduced my husband, which would fall apart the moment it was brought to her attention that Patsy lived without consent, without that is, the right to accept or deny Edwin and Mary access to her body. As a slave Patsy has no right to sanctuary, sexual Afro-pessimism 3, A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-91 or otherwise. Edwin Epps might also feel compelled to make sense of the senseless mutilation, I whipped Patsy at the end of the film because she betrayed me. I think she slept with Solomon and she left the plantation without my permission. He would not be consciously lying. But, much like Josephine, who couldn't tap into the core of her relationship to Stella until Stella said, Hattie McDaniel is dead. Edwin Epps would have forgotten the key word he spoke whenever he brutalized his slaves. Pleasure. I am in my pleasure. Both Solomon Northrop's autobiography and the film Steve McQueen made from it are queasy about the way society's pleasure is subtended by anti-black violence. They hold it up to us, only to disavow its depth. Josephine, with her annual subscription to Ms. Magazine, her small donations to the Sierra Club, her no-nonsense clogs, and her green Carter Mondale bumper sticker, attested and trustworthy T.A.M., was the spectator the film had in mind when it felt the need to lie. But Josephine was also a modern-day doppelganger of Mary Epps and Edwin Epps combined. The film tries to anger the whippings that a black woman receives in the rational explanations of jealousy and transgression. In other words, the narrative asks us to believe that the principal reason for so much mutilation of the flesh is contingent upon some inappropriate act, a transgression that can be named. We are told Mary Epps, the wife of a ruthless plantation owner, wants Patsy, a beautiful, of course, only the beautiful ones are wanted, and productive slave. Beaten and sold because her husband creeps down from the mansion at night to rape Patsy, an act he'd no doubt, sees as more amorous than violent. We are told that Solomon's back is opened with a paddle and a whip because he could not be disciplined or because he and other slaves did not pick his quota of cotton for the day. Jealousy and transgression put the audience at ease, release them from the horror of having to think of this violence as pleasure without purpose. Like an act of love or a song in the heart Afro-pessimism 3 peep. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 392 or skipping down the street when no one is looking, all the things that sustain human life but don't appear on the ledger. What if anti-black violence could be counted among the things that make life life, without registering as profit or loss? What if jealousy and transgression are ruses, disguises that the real reasons for the violence hide behind? If no contingency triggers this violence, how can it fit in a story? How do we make sense of a pre-logical phenomenon like anti-black violence? I am in my pleasure. In other words, the whippings are a life force like a song, or good sex without a procreative aim. Jouissance is the word that comes to mind. A French word that means enjoyment, in terms both of rights and property, and of sexual orgasm. The latter has a meaning partially lacking in the English word, enjoyment. Jouissance compels the subject to constantly attempt to transgress the prohibitions imposed on his or her enjoyment. To go beyond the pleasure principle. Jouissance is an anchor tenant of psychoanalysis. But until the work of the critical theorists David Marriott, Jared Sexton, and Saidia Hartman, that is to say prior to an Afro-pessimist hijacking of psychoanalysis, 
devotees of Lacan and Freud had not made the link between jouissance and the regime of violence known as social death. This juxtaposition, unfortunately, takes place at a level of abstraction that is too high for narrative and the logic of storytelling. Unlike violence against the working class which secures an economic order, or violence against non-black women, which secures a patriarchal order, or violence against Native Americans, which secures a colonial order, the jouissance that constitutes the violence of anti-blackness secures the order of life itself, sadism in service to the prolongation of life. One thing that makes this sadism life affirming and communal, as opposed to destructive and individual, is the fact that it is a family affair. In his book, Solomon Northup recalls episodes of Patsy's Beat Afro Pessimism 3. AFROPESSIMISM 93 Ings with details that are crucial in missing from the film. Mistress Marie, Epps, he writes, stood on the piazza among her children, gazing on the scene with an air of heartless satisfaction. The scene that Solomon Northup paints of Mary Epps standing on the piazza brings to mind the musings of Mary Boykin Chestnut, the most cited chronicler of the American Civil War who wrote, Our men live all in one house with their wives and their concubines, and the mulattoes one sees in every family exactly resemble the white children. Dot dot. All the time they seem to think themselves patterns, models of husbands and fathers. In the realm of the conscious mind, Mary Chestnut is as incensed by the licentious satisfaction white male slaveholders extract from black women as Mary Epps is, in her conscious mind, as well. But Solomon Northup's psychoanalytic labor indexes how, in the realm of the unconscious mind, this heartless satisfaction is the currency of men like Edwin Epps and their wives, despite the fact that only the former can secure his satisfaction in the open. The point to be made is that this satisfaction is shared even if its expression is not. Like her husband, Mary Epps is in her pleasure, and she is also with her children, who are in their pleasure as well. This generalization of satisfaction and pleasure, subtended by gratuitous violence against black flesh, fans out from conventional sadism between sexual partners to a family gathering of adults and children of all ages. Like the Epps's son, a boy of 10 or 12 who rides his pony out to the cotton fields and, without discrimination, dot dot, applies the rawhide urging slaves forward with shouts and occasional profanity. We would be wrong to think that the boys urging slaves forward lends purpose and legibility to the violence. It does not. Like any other child, the boy is at play. He is in his pleasure. Each time he rides his little pony to the fields, he compels an old man named Uncle Abram to be his cheering squad, his chorus to laugh, dot dot, and commend him for being a thoroughgoing boy. Afro -pes Frank Bwilderson 394 Northup's book implies, without stating directly, why this generalization of sadism, brutality is the constituent element of family bonding, cannot be understood as being triggered by transgression. It is as ubiquitous as the air he breathes. It was rarely a day passed without more whippings. Dot dot. It is the literal, unvarnished truth that the crack of the lash and the shrieking of slaves can be heard from dark till bedtime. Dot, dot quote. Patsy and Solomon, unlike Stella and me, were living in a place and time when civil society and the human were neither ashamed nor embarrassed by this. A thousand miles upriver and 126 years later, Josephine was shocked by this inheritance but it didn't take her long to recover, and to claim it. Though the structure of Stella's life, or better, the paradigm of social death, for the quotation marks are essential here, cannot be reconciled with the structure of Josephine's life, or the paradigm of social life, there is a connection. But this connection is parasitic and perverse, regardless of what the socially dead black person, i.e., Stella and Patsy, or the socially alive human, i.e., Josephine or Mary Epps, might say about their relationship. It is parasitic because white and non-black subjectivity cannot be imbued with the capacity for self-knowledge and intersubjective community without anti-black violence without that is the violence of social death. In other words, white people and their junior partners need anti-black violence to know they're alive, asterisk. If Hattie McDaniel were to truly die, Estella proclaimed, it would be tantamount to the death of a parasite's host.
Asterisk junior partners are people who are human but not white hetero males. For example, people of color and white, women who are targets of white supremacy and patriarchy respectively, and, simultaneously, the agents and beneficiaries of anti-blackness. This category also includes LGBT people who are not black and indigenous communities. They are partners because, as with white hetero males, anti-blackness is the genome of their paradigmatic positions and because they suffer at the hands of contingent violence rather than the gratuitous or naked violence of social death. Afropes AFROPESSIMISM95 This is what makes social death something more surreal than the end of breath. It is, in the words of David Marriott, a deathliness that saturates life, not an embalming, a resource for human renewal. It is perverse for many reasons, one of which is the fact that as civil society matures from 1853 to December 1979, when it all went south with Josephine, and we move historically from the obvious technologies of chattel slavery to universal suffrage, the discourse of human rights, and the concept of universal access to civil society. The anti-black violence necessary for the elaboration and maintenance of white and non-black subjectivity gets repressed and becomes increasingly unavailable to conscious as opposed to unconscious speech. I judge people by the quality of their character, as Dr. King said, and not the color of their skin, or the commonly spoken, at the end of the day. We're all Americans and we're in this together, another such malarkey of the conscious mind. But the pageantries of naked and submissive black flesh pageantries of bleeding backs and buttocks, whip marks, amputations, and faces closed by horse bits provide evidence of the role sadism plays in the constitution of white subjectivity. And 12 years a slave makes this visible on the screen, despite its repression in the narrative of both the film and civil society writ large. It is tempting and commonplace to reduce Mary and Edwin Epps's sadism to individual psychopathology. Or one might think that Edwin Epps is one of a group of exceptionally sadistic people who lived in an exceptionally sadistic time and place. But the film, and to an even greater extent the autobiography, sees, rather than narrates, sadism, the sexual perversion in which gratification is obtained by inflicting physical or mental pain on a love object, not as the individual pathology of a handful of people, but as a generalized condition, generalized in that pleasure, as a constituent element of communal life, cannot be disentangled from anti-black violence. Afro Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 396 Conventionally, the object of sadism can, tomorrow, become the subject of sadism. But the sadism that constitutes the spectacles of twelve years a slave, and which constitutes early 19th century society, is not imbued with such reciprocity. The slaves of social death cannot switch places and make Edwin Epps or his equally cruel wife the love objects of their collective sadism. If they did say in private, if Patsy beat Edwin or Mary in a private bedroom encounter, for example, it is because such a reversal was occasion and allowed. In other words, the master used his prerogative and power to play a different game. One in which he suffers because suffering fulfills his fantasy and because, unlike the slave, his fantasies have objective value. Such role reversals do not imbue the encounter with reciprocity. The changes that begin to occur after the Civil War and up through the Civil Rights Movement Black Power and the American election of a black president are merely changes in the weather. Despite the fact that the sadism is no longer played out in the open as it was in a late 140, nothing essential has changed. 5. Josephine and Cody and another man I had never seen before carried boxes and crates along the side of the house. We heard them go in the side door and up the stairs to Josephine's apartment. We heard them clinking away at whatever it was they had in those boxes. But it started even before that. I once called Cody to fix the plumbing after our standoff in the courtyard. I was in the kitchen. Stella was in her bedroom at the front of the house. Malika was in the back in her room. Cody didn't knock. He didn't ring the bell. He was suddenly behind me in the kitchen. I told him he had to turn around, go back out to the porch, close the Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 96 Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 961 22.
AFROPESSIMISM 97 door behind him, ring the bell, and wait for me to come let him in. He must have stood there looking at me for no more than 15 seconds but I knew I aged 15 years. I don't know what made him do it but he did. He didn't have the look of rage that Josephine had. He had the look of a man who strikes back in his own time. Cody's own time came slowly, in drips and drabs. He and Josephine spent more time together, not only upstairs in her apartment but in the basement, under our dwelling. We could hear them laughing sometimes. Shortly after that the radiators hissed incessantly, but only at night. When we complained to Cody, he went down to fix them and he'd pop up to Josephine's flat. In the night the radiator made popping noises, not hisses anymore. The pipes would sometimes clink and clank for a minute or two, then stop, only to start again an hour, two hours, three hours later. Sometime after that was when we saw Cody and Josephine and another man I'd never seen before scuffling down the walkway by the side of the house with the boxes and crates. We listened, our eyes now and then cast up to the ceiling, to the muffled tromp of far more feet than we were used to hearing up there. A day or two later came the muted clang of metal, sounds that were similar but distinct from the noises they had made in the basement when the radiators went berserk. It wasn't long before we felt first heat then stinging, then slight burning sensations on our skin. We didn't call them burns. Beyond our complaints to one another we didn't pay attention or seek medical advice until the itching grew into a slightly singed sensation. It seemed most intense at night. A general practitioner told us we needed to see a specialist, and the best in the field, he said, were across the river at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. I called them. They said they were booked for some time. I said, this is urgent. My name is Frank B. Wilderson 3, my Afro. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 398 Father is Vice President for Student Affairs. My partner and I have been told by our GP we should be seen by someone in your department. We were seen within the week. Dr. Vivian Jo had a full, attractive face, but her smile gave off no more heat than the stars. She could have stamped passports at a border crossing. She examined us separately, then brought us to her office and closed the door. As I recall, she asked us what we did work-wise. She thought we worked with radiation and she insinuated that there were OSHA standards that had been breached. We don't work with radiation, Stella said. Dr. Joe implied that Stella was lying because she was afraid of on-the-job retaliation, or worse because of some misplaced loyalty to her employer. She suggested that Stella and I had a moral obligation to report the radioactive waste or the misuse of instruments. If not for our sake then for the sake of our co-workers and the general public. The woman upstairs did this to us, Stella said. Dr. Joe put her pen down. I could see the gears of other options whirring in her brain. I wanted to stop this before we both ended up in the psych ward. This has been an ordeal, you can see how we're out of sorts, I said, adding we needed time to go home and thinking about it. I don't understand, said Dr. Joe. It's a simple question. How were you exposed to radiation? We're a bit confused about the details, I said. I'm not confused, said Stella. There's every indication that you both have been exposed to radioactive material. I'm at a loss as to why scar tissue is on your groin area and why it's on your lower side. We need answers. I told you why. He sleeps on his back. I sleep on my side. It's coming from Josephine's apartment upstairs. She works in a lab here at the U she has access to. AFROPESSIMISM 99 Even if she does work in a lab, it's not legal for her to take this material, Stella cut her off. You think we're lying? We'll go home, I said, and iron out the confusing details, what's the matter, Frank? Stella was livid. Are you afraid we'll tarnish your father's reputation? Why would your neighbor do such a thing, asked Dr. Joe. You haven't lived, said Stella. The Japanese internment camps didn't teach you a thing. Stella was aware that Joe was Chinese and not Japanese but as a child during World War II. Stella had seen how the word men is stuck like Velcro to a color, yellow, more frequently than it did to a specific ethnicity. At the door, Stella said. Frank drives a cab part-time for blue and white. 
I work part-time as a teacher's aide at Marcy Grammar School. He's on general assistance and I'm on welfare. Knock yourself out going after our bosses. You'll find radioactive isotopes in the seat of the cab he drives. Six our home is on the other side of campus from the hospital. We cut through campus, walking, for the most part, in silence, afraid that any word that we might say to one another will strike like flint on our raw nerves. I don't tell her how I fell for her right over there, on the steps of the armory, when she told a busload of inductees not to go to Vietnam. We pass Burton Hall, where she once worked with my father. She doesn't say how cute I was when my principal sent me to my father's office for skipping classes or smoking weed in the bathrooms. When we walk through the main gate and across the street to Dinky Town, I don't tell her the stories of days when Bob and I stole horses together up and down the street. Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 99 Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 100 went and drive Joe's office. Stella had said, "What's the matter, Frank?" Are you afraid we'll tarnish your father's reputation? She had put her finger on the pulse of a desire to be special that beat inside my heart. In my unconscious I wanted to latch on to an element of whiteness or humanness since Dr. Joe wasn't white that would set me apart from other blacks. But this desire was deeper than Stella or I suspected at the time. An unconscious wish for my father's prestige which was as faux as the prestige Solomon thought he had accrued from his skills as an engineer and his talents as a musician, to seep into my being by osmosis. I had dropped his name to get us the appointment. I would drop his name in the weeks and months to come to open other doors as well. This kind of reasoning is universal. But what is not universal, what belongs to black people and black people alone, is a deeper desire sparked by a deeper structure of oppression. When you intuit for the first time in your life that you live in a soup of violence that is pre-logical. A kind of violence that is as legitimate if it's wielded by ordinary citizens such as Josephine, as it is if wielded by sanctioned enforcers of the law. And that your father's position and prestige are no more the keys to a sanctuary than the position and prestige of someone who is black and orphaned. You are faced with two choices, stare unflinchingly at the abyss as it stares unflinchingly at you. Or take it out on the black person near you who won't leave you to your fantasy of being truly alive. Anything to not have to face the fact that your sense of presence is no more than borrowed institutionality, asterisk. This dynamic, this intra-black imbroglio, is harder to discern in the 20th and 21st centuries for the simple fact that the personas of the master class are no longer solidified in evil white men and evil white women who wield real whips on a real plantation. The asterisk Jared Sexton, Private Conversation, November 22, 2007 Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 100 Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 1001, 20 AFROPESSIMISM 101 Master has been dispersed across the entire racial spectrum of people who are not black. Dr. Joe is as much a master as Edwin and Mary Epps, the antagonists in 12 Years a Slave. In fact, the 20th century shot the Epps's through a prism, they are not just people, they are ideas. They are ideas and personas that a young middle-class black man like me had consciously fought against to the point of being kicked out of college. While deep in my unconscious I was a loyal supplicant who cared more about not simply the master's feelings but the stability of the master's world than I did about my own suffering and the suffering of Stella. It is hard to be a slave and feel that you are worthy, truly worthy, of your suffering as a slave. 127 years before Josephine, before Cody, before Urban Risers, and before Dr. Joe, the rift between Stella and me would have been clearer to see. We wouldn't have walked home in symptomatic silence, our discord would have been played out in the open. At times, Stella would throw her sense of herself as a being from a special quasi-black dimension at me the way I threw my father's status and my Dartmouth pedigree at her. She would let me know of the competence exhibited by the white men she had been with and the Jew she had married. She held them up as object lessons that I could never be or learn. 
That's how most black couples fight and argue, by firing white and non-black people at each other. No, it's more subtle than that. The bullets aren't the white or non-black people themselves but the ambience of recognition and incorporation in a world beyond the plantation. We load our guns with deadly intangibles and shoot straight for the heart. Anyone who thinks 19th century slave narratives are reports on the past isn't paying attention. Such a person will experience the analysis of Afro-pessimism as though they are being mugged rather than enlightened, that is because they can't imagine a plantation in the here and now. Afro-pessimism 3 p. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 102 But Afro-pessimism is premised on a comprehensive and iconoclastic claim, that blackness is coterminous with slaveness, blackness is social death which is to say that there was never a prior meta-moment of plenitude, never equilibrium, never a moment of social life. Blackness, as a paradigmatic position, rather than as a set of cultural practices, anthropological accoutrements, is elaborated through slavery. The narrative arc of the slave who is black, unlike Orlando Patterson's generic slave, who may be of any race, is not an arc at all, but a flat line. What Hortense Spillers calls historical stillness, a flat line that moves from disequilibrium to a moment in the narrative of faux equilibrium to disequilibrium restored and or rearticulated. This kind of change, the transformative promise of a narrative arc, belongs to white men and their junior partners in civil society, non-black immigrants, white and non-black people who are queer, and non-black women, but only in relation to each other. By transformative capacity I mean that through struggle, non-citizens in the legal and libidinal sense of the word, legal being Latinx undocumented immigrants, for example, and libidinal being anyone from a documented immigrant of color to a gay person to a non-black woman, can become citizens because they are still human. They are simply oppressed and therefore not so fully vested. But their transformative capacity stems not from their positive attributes but from the fact that they are not black, they are not a slaves. These fully vested citizens and not so fully vested citizens live through intracommunal narrative arcs of transformation, but where the black is concerned, their collective unconscious calls upon blacks as props, which they harness as necessary implements to help bring about their psychic and social transformation, and to vouchsafe the coherence of their own human subjectivity. Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 102 Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 1021, 22 20th. AFROPESSIMISM 103 Nevertheless, the slave is a sentient being. Therefore, an existence void of transformative promise, which narrative holds out to human subjects, is a painful lesson for the slave to learn, much less accept. I am not suggesting that black people should resign themselves to the inevitability of social death, it is inevitable. In the sense that one is born into social death just as one is born into a gender or a class. But it is also constructed by the violence and imagination of other sentient beings. Thus, like class and gender, which are also constructs, not divine designations, social death can be destroyed. But the first step toward the destruction is to assume one's position, assume, not celebrate or disavow, and then burn the ship or the plantation, in its past and present incarnations, from the inside out. However, as black people we are often psychically unable and unwilling to assume this position. This is as understandable as it is impossible. I was a lot like that when I met Stella. Stella was skeptical about the willingness of the FBI to help us unravel the skeins of aggression that were coming our way, from Josephine and Cody's violence to the violence of whoever did not want Stella to bring her evidence against urban risers to court. Looking back, I realized that I believed that my father had standing in the community, that his position on multiple boards and his vice presidency at the university had somehow imbued us both with human capacity. The capacity to be recognized and incorporated as something other than black. I had no idea that the FBI had tracked me for four years, that there was a file on me, nor did it dawn on me that Stella's social change activism, especially her civil disobedience against the war and her plethora of counterculture and revolutionary friends, would militate against our being helped. But those aren't even the fundamental reasons why I should have been skeptical. 
If the FBI has been tracking black creative writers Afro Pessimism 3 pp. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 104 Since 1919, if the FBI has been constantly updating and revising its list of black writers earmarked for preventative detention, concentration camps, asterisk if the FBI like every law enforcement agency in the United States, is organically anti-black then where has the line between prison and home? 7. Now Stella and I have walked the width of camp. Like every law enforcement Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 104 Since 1919, if the FBI has been constantly updating and revising its list of black writers earmarked for preventative detention, concentration camps, asterisk if the FBI like every law enforcement agency in the United States, is organically anti-black then where has the line between prison and home? 7. Now Stella and I have walked the width of campus, from Dr. Joe's office to Dinkytown, without breaking our silence. Afraid that any word we might say to one another would strike like flint on our raw nerves. I wanted to show her the steps of the armory, where she told a busload of inductees not to go to Vietnam the exact spot where I as a 15-year-old boy fell in love with her. If she wanted to point to Burton Hall, where she worked in the dean's office with my dad, and say how cute I was back then when my principal sent me to my father's office for skipping classes or smoking weed, she too walked in silence and let the moment pass. We crossed the street to Dinkytown, I don't say a word about my best friend Bob and the horses we stole up and down these streets. Our home is in sight when Stella finally speaks. Beside us at a stoplight a couple expresses their relief that Teddy Kennedy has beaten Jimmy Carter in the Massachusetts Democratic primary. We need a Kennedy, the woman says, as the walk sign flashes, to beat Ronald Reagan. We let them walk ahead of us. Then Stella speaks. We'll send Malika somewhere safe, she says. Asterisk William J. Maxwell, FBI's, How J. Edgar Hoover's Ghost Readers Framed African American Literature Princeton, NJ, Princeton University Press, 2015. Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 104 Afro-Pessimism AFROPESSIMISM 105 8A1 Two weeks after we sent Malika away. The car that I have stolen from my parents' garage is a fern green station wagon with faux wood panels and 13 stickers from the national parks we visited when I was a child. Stella and I have no more than $100 in our food stamps, of course. We've been wearing the same clothes for the past two days, for we've had to sleep in them, and we've sent Malika away, hoping she'll be safe. We'll send for her when we feel safe ourselves but when is looking more and more like if we left our home without thinking to bring Jamal's gun. Stupid. Stupid. As Stella and I roam the streets of Minneapolis looking for a place to crash, I imagine Malika hearing how her mother and I were gunned down on Hennepin Avenue. Malika is at her father, you or I's, house in Idaho. There would be no one to explain our deaths to her. More than once I want to believe that I have Stella's back, that I would meet any violence that is headed our way bravely and forthrightly, without thought of personal loss or discredit. 9 Day T. Whoa! It's our second night in the living room of Stella's friend, a white woman named Olivia. Stella met Olivia 11 years before, in 1969, at Afro-Pessimism 3 p Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 106 An anti-war demonstration, but she had only grown close to her later, when they were LPNs on the Premie Ward at Hennepin County Medical Center. It's Olivia's apartment, but Chase is her man and he acts like it's his. Thank God it's not his. We would be gone if it was. He manages a restaurant and can't watch Johnny Carson when he gets home because we're camped out in his spot. His fingertips are yellowed from smoking cigarettes and his clothes carry hints of griddle grease. I don't know if they think we're out here asleep or if they don't know the kitchen door is ajar. As a nurse, Olivia is trained to speak in soothing tones, she can wrap heartbreak in cotton. But Chase is another story. I think he wants us to hear. Olivia, don't give me that crap about repairs being done at Stella's flat. Stella's toy boy is freaking shit scared. You can see it in his face. He wants out. 
My bedding is a shag rug, some blankets, and a pillow on the floor beside the sofa. Stella is billeted on the sofa itself. I don't look up at her when Chase says he wants out. And my jet tightens when he calls me a toy boy. For two years I've wondered if Stella's friends think of me like that. A part of me wanted them to say it out loud, as Chase just did. Give it form. Make it who I am. Olivia tells him she doesn't know the details and that he wouldn't believe Stella if Stella told him the truth. You're right. I wouldn't believe her. She's had you and those dinky town freaks hoodwinked for years. You all thought she was Angela Davis. She's not Angela Davis. You're no longer Olivia from the suburbs looking for a thrill, and the war ended five years ago. The war didn't end for black people, Olivia says. Black people? Like the man who beat you for seven years. Give me a number, Chase. A number for what? Afrope. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-107, the number of years you're going to keep punishing me. He beat you, but I'm the one who's punishing you. You punish me for sleeping with Sonia's father, you punish Sonia for being mixed. Sue me, Chase, for not being a racist. Sue me for being an independent thinker. And I'll tell you this for the price of a donut a hole, before it's over her boyfriend's G on N A B I L. After two nights we leave Olivia's apartment. We don't say why and they don't ask. We drive 20 miles south to the suburb of Edina, 10 day 3. 8.30 a.m. We sit low in the front seat of the station wagon. We park down the street but not so far that we can't see the front door. When the certified public accountant pulls out of his drive, we leave the car where it is walk around to the back, where she lets us in, and slip down to the basement. It's cold down here in the cinder block basement where another white woman Stella knew from back in the day lives with her CPA husband. But we can only sleep here in the daytime. As we roamed from house to house, never telling all, and sometimes none, of our story. I noticed that we never went to any of the homes of black women or men Stella had known. Stella said that some of them had fallen on times harder than ours and that they were also either under surveillance or might end up that way if we brought this to their door. On beach. Chairs we crash by the washer and dryer afro pessimism 3 pp i n d d 1 Frank b w i l d e r s o n 3 108 without taking off our coats. At 4 in the afternoon, Stella's friend comes down to wake us. We must leave before the CPA gets home. 10.30 p.m. We drive through the streets of the Twin Cities waiting for morning when we can get some sleep. We've already learned where all the late night diners are. Day 4, 9 a.m. This morning we're stopped at the back door. Stella's friend says a neighbor has noticed. She'll die if that woman talks to her husband. She's sorry, but we can't come in. 11.59 p.m. March at midnight can be colder here than much of Alaska in winter. We sleep in the station wagon on the windless side of the Golden Gophers football stadium. We sleep in shifts so that the person who's awake can regulate the heat and crack the window now and then. If we stay here too long we'll be hassled by the cops. Day 5, 3 a.m. Downtown Minneapolis. At 3 in the morning we drive across the Mississippi River and make our way through downtown. The streets are empty. The traffic Afro pessimism 3 p. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-109 lights blink without purpose in the vacant night. Stella asks me if we're being followed. We smell like a week without soap. Eleven Chase was right. She's not Angela Davis, though folks have thought otherwise when they see her at a distance. But Angela Davis would have more people to rely on if she were in Stella's shoes. In the dim light of my parents' car, I think how beautiful she is. Despite the lines in her forehead that I hadn't seen before her lawyer Noam Davidev came to say her court date was less than a year away. The lawsuit Stella had filed against Urban Risers, a government anti-poverty program born in the era of LBJ, is going to trial in November. Since Noam Davidev came to Stella's place to tell us the date of her court hearing against Urban Risers and, by extension, perhaps individuals in the federal government, Individuals whose identities might become known when he took depositions from members of the Urban Risers board, our lives had been turned inside out. 
Last week we went to see Imani Price, a woman who once was a major player in the black community in the near north side. Maybe she would tell us who's gunning for us. When I first met Imani I was 7 or 8 years old. She was one of roughly 30 people, university students, black community organizers from the near north side, and university professors gathered for a meeting in my parents' living room. My parents had given me Negro history picture books and I recognized Imani immediately. Are you Harriet Tubman? I asked her. Everyone in the living room laughed. I felt small and embarrassed. She touched my cheek and said, Baby, that's the finest thing a man's ever said to me. Afro Frank BWILDERSON 3110 She and Arnell Price, her husband, had been on the board of Urban Risers with Stella. If I remember correctly, Stella said that Amani was innocent, though who knew what evidence the trial would reveal about her husband's involvement? The main defendant was a man named Kapile Kenyatta, a dashiki-wearing hustler who, so went the scuttle but, had worked with Darnell, and presumably, Amani, on other poverty programs besides Urban Risers, where money was skimmed off the top and where the resources were used for everything from the lining of their pockets to financing drug deals and prostitution to the purchase of real estate, such as one of the two largest homes in Kenwood, a baronial building that resembled a small Scottish chateau with a massive tower made of large hand-laid stones. This Scottish chateau in the heart of Kenwood was where Imani was living. She and Darnell separated after the last time he beat her. Darnell agreed to give her this grand house if, I presume, she agreed not to press charges against him for his last episode of domestic violence against her. Shooting up the front facade of the mansion was a large stone tower with ramparts at the top. In 16th century Scotland there would have been grain for the winter, or possibly weapons to fend off an English invasion, stored in a tower such as this. But in the enclave of Kenwood, the ground floor of this tower was a lavish study where Stella and I met Imani. The house I grew up in was less than two blocks away. For many years the neighborhood had been cordoned off by Highway 394 from North Minneapolis where Urban Risers was what people in town called the ghetto. How Imani Price was able to purchase a home in Kenwood, making her the fourth black homeowner in Kenwood since my parents broke the barrier in 1962, was lost on me when we first arrived. In my youth we had called this house a castle and believed it to be haunted. Imani said, the foundation, she and Arnell had set up, bought the house. It was Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 110 Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 1101 22 20 945 AM January 22, 2945 AM. AFRO PESSIM 111 owned by their non profit organization. But that still didn't answer my question, how did two poor black people who had always lived from opportunity to opportunity, and had no pedigree that the Kenwood Committee could accept, get the money, the means, and the opportunity to breach the Iron Curtain of Kenwood? The Kenwood Committee had rallied 500 households to try to keep my parents out of the neighborhood. The committee had even balked eight years later when a prominent black architect moved in with his family. They had tried to keep a wealthy Pro Bowl football player, Alan Page, from building a modern home there, even though Frank Lloyd Wright had built a modern home there to great acclaim, asterisk. They had turned a cold shoulder to a black surgeon who bought a mansion almost as big as Imani and Gabe's Scottish Chateau. Given all of this, how in the world did they let a woman whose husband was known to this city as a black radical as well as a shady scheme or buy the second most prized mansion in the wooded enclave on the western edge of Minneapolis. Amani Price moved into Kenwood with a north side white cat who liked to hang, and was 20 years her junior, at least. His name was Gabe and he made me feel diminished but not by anything he said or did, for he didn't really say nor do anything at all. He stood behind Amani like the Queen's guard at Buckingham as Amani sat at her desk and listened to Stella tell our story. It wasn't words or deeds that made me feel small, it was his body. The taut muscular body of a football tight end, a body that eats the way I used to eat at the football training tables at Dartmouth College, five years ago. 
what now felt like a lifetime ago, in 1975, a body that had the leisure time and the money to train at the gym, just as I once trained. Over the past asterisk in addition to having been a Minnesota Viking, Alan Page was also a lawyer, and would become an Associate Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3. 112. Two years, I had lost much of my musculature and I didn't have the same access to the kinds of food that I once had. It hurt my ego to covet a body that was no longer in the cards for me. It hurt my pride to be poor. Stella told Imani about the gun a Northside brother named Jamal, whom both of them knew, had given Stella for protection. About the clicking on the phone that started right after Stella's lawyer, Noam, left the house, about the tampering with our telephone. How we got calls in which no one spoke when we answered, about the Daniel Ellsberg leg break-in at my apartment, and how we feared we were being followed. That was all I had wanted Stella to say to Imani. I didn't trust Imani, not completely, though I knew she was a victim of domestic violence and therefore had no more allegiance to Darnell, who was tight with Capilé Kenyatta. They had the same skeletons in their closet. Nor did I know this white dude who stood behind Imani as Imani sat in her high-backed office chair behind a mahogany desk that could double as a runway. Stella didn't want to heed my warning. Before we went inside, and while we were still parked by the carriage house away from the main building, I had said that she shouldn't tell Amani everything. Amani and Arnell have dealt with state surveillance, she'd told me, their phones are always tap, and they've come home to find their house turned upside down, just as you did, Frank. That night when you came home to find that your apartment had been locked from the inside, and two men climbed out your window and ran down the alley but they've never been forced out of their home, I rejoined, Amani is going to ask why we had to leave our home. And even if she believes you, I said, why would she tell us the truth? Why would she tell us the truth? Stella had told me that the last time Darnell beat Amani, he broke her arm. AFROPESSIMISM 113, she's living with a white guy now, Stella had said, a guy about your age. He cold cocked Darnell Price, a punch so hard he flipped backward over a chair. That's why you need a young man, Amani said later that day as we sat in the two plush chairs in front of her desk. She touched Gabe's hand. She winked at Stella like they'd won the same prize. Young men know how to treat a woman. Amani told us in detail, and without being prompted, about the last few times Darnell had beat her. Stella responded with a story of her own, how Ari Shapiro, her Jewish ex-husband, the father of her child, grabbed her by the armpits and hoisted her in the air. He ran her back against a plate glass window. He didn't mean to hurt Stella. He had no idea the window would break but it did. Shards of glass dropped like daggers in a cave of ice. A glass dagger pierced her deltoid. Unlike Darnell, Uri hadn't meant to hurt Stella. He was sick with age sorrow. One night, I had asked her about the scar on her upper arm. She called it an industrial accident. After we made love, I stroked the scar and asked her the details. She nestled her head in my neck. She laughed without raising her head. She said, Bow wow, the dog did it. Then her whole body rippled in laughter against mine. I didn't get the joke, nor did I think she would stop laughing. I placed my fingers beneath her chin, but she wouldn't raise her face to look at me. She barked, several small puppy barks. Bow wow the dog, she said and she was off to the races laughing again. Her laughter was not contagious. It wasn't a happy laugh. At first I was annoyed that for the 19 months we had been together she hadn't told me, but now she was telling Amani Price, who hadn't even asked. These days I'm embarrassed by the way that I felt then. They were two women bonding over what two men had done Afro-pessimism through... Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 114 to them. The two men in the room were as relevant to this exchange as any two random items of decor. Or maybe they were speaking to Gabe and to me. Maybe they were signifying, telling us they knew that deep inside both of us lay a Uri or a Darnell, just waiting to be them. Maybe they were saying, don't think too highly of yourselves. If that's true, however, it's a secondary truth.
What's of primary importance is the way Imani and Stella, by sharing their stories, as though Gabe and I weren't there, acknowledged each other as black women whose flesh had been the sites of the most gratuitous acts of violence, interracial violence in the case of Stella's abuse by Ari, and intramural violence in the case of Imani and Darnell. It was as though they were saying, since there is no auditor for our suffering as black women, no paradigm of recognition and redress. We will be for each other the world's missing ears. As Amani heard about what had happened between Stella and Uri, she seemed to want to go back in time and protect Stella from that wound her ex-husband had inflicted on her. I often have wondered, if this communion hadn't happened between these two women, whether Imani would have opened up and told Stella what she knew about the skullduggery at Urban Risers. As if to say, I can't save you from the scars of the past, but I can shed some light on the scars that are to come. When Stella told Imani and Gabe our story, and stopped at the point where I asked her to stop, I was relieved. Gabe seemed satisfied, but Imani was not. She asked the question that Stella had told me she would ask. Why did you leave your duplex? Amani said. Stella inhaled and let the air out slowly. She looked at Gabe. He all right, Amani said. He knows all about Urban Risers. I'd tell him anyway, after you two left. Besides, he saved my life. Amani, Stella said, it's going to sound crazy. No, child, not to me. It sounds crazy to me when I play it in my mind. Afro pessimism. A F R O P E S S I M I S M 115, then speak. Get it out of your mind. This beast has so many limbs. That's what makes it a beast, child. As Stella spoke, I clasped my hands in my lap and squeezed until they almost pained me. This is what she said The white woman who lives upstairs was poisoning us. We were able to prove it but one by one the people who helped us gather the evidence, including a private detective that we hired with money Frank borrowed from his parents, backed down. In the end they weren't willing to testify. They all flaked out in the end. And this all happened after Noam came with the news of the court date and after we went to the FBI to report what was happening to us, not just Josephine, the woman upstairs, but all of it like the break-in at Frank's apartment. We don't know what it all means. Amani laughed for the first time all afternoon. You're screwed, she said. That's what it means, child. Stella wasn't laughing, and neither was I, nor even Gabe, for that matter. Stella had one question for Amani. Stella said that our only hope was to find the two U.S. Marshals to whom Stella had spoken almost eight years ago when she brought the issue of corruption to the fore. They had seemed like straight shooters, she said. She didn't want to go to the U.S. Marshal's office cold, the way we had gone downtown to the FBI. She wanted those two individuals specifically, since they had been so accommodating to Stella in the past. Amani, Stella, implored, will you make contact with those two for us, and tell them we want to meet with them? Amani shook her head. Honey, she said, leave it alone. Those two U.S. Marshals were in Capale Kenyatta's pocket. He was in their pocket. They were stroking each other's dicks. The marshals led you on. Why do you think it's taken all this time for you to go to trial? Afro Frank B W I L D E R S O N 311612, day 5. 310 AM downtown Minneapolis. I could have made the light at 3rd and Hennepin, and I would have, if I didn't need to turn. Stella is asleep and a sharp left turn would jar her. The Minneapolis Central Library is here. In the daytime it's graphite, glitter, and glass. Tonight, it's a fortress, like something from the previews of the second Star Wars film that they say will come out in May. It was a lifetime ago when Stella, Malika, and I made this library our home away from home. Stella taught Malika how to use the Dewey Decimal System and took her to the puppet shows and children's reading hours. We read there. I wrote there. Stella studied languages and borrowed sheet music there. Three people without the money or the means for recreation can live well at the library. It seems like ages since we shed the skin of that life and sent Malika to safety. It seems like a life that belonged to someone else. 3.10, 37 a.m. There's a car growing large in my rear view mirror. It's bearing down on us. The light is still red. If it doesn't stop it will ram us from behind. 
Stella hasn't seen it because she's asleep. 3.10, 38 a.m. Why can't I take my foot off the brake and floor the gas pedal? I can't scream. I can see Stella in a neck brace. I can see myself Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 116 Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 11 AFRO PESSIMISM 117 folded into a wheelchair. I feel a clutch in my chest but I still don't move. Just before it rams us from behind the car swerves. It stops beside us. Two lean faces leer at us. The driver revs the engine. It's a souped-up Datsun 240Z. The motor growls again. They're teenagers in leather jackets, not men. They want to know if we want to drag race down Hennepin. The light changes twice before I can stop shaking and drive. 3.20 a.m. I drive on Hennepin the length of downtown, and follow it even as it turns toward uptown at the Basilica of St. Mary where my parents have a pew. At Franklin and Hennepin, the Lowry Hill liquor store has dark and blinkered. I can almost smile at those nights right at closing, when Dad would careen this fern green and wood paneled station wagon that we have now stolen into that parking lot. Under the liquor store's neon sign, he'd leave me in the car with the engine running. Hans Knudsen, the night cashier, had a soft spot for my father, which helped a lot at closing time. Gophers were down by a field goal, Dad might say, by way of apology and explanation, and Hans, who might have just turned the inside lock, might smile and say he knows how it is, as he unlocks the door and lets Dad inside. Stella wakes and turns the radio off. We aren't married, she says. You don't have to put yourself through this. She wants me to say I'll stay to the end, whatever the end might be. Perhaps she wants to tell me that she too is afraid but she wants to be brave for both of us. Afro Pessimism 3 P Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 118 3 hours 26 minutes and 0 seconds A M It starts to drizzle as we pass the Lowry Hill liquor store. Raindrops pearl on the window and whisper in the tires. I turn the radio back on. The tenor saxophone of Jean Ammons lays some leather on a ballad I've heard Stella play on her flute. She taught me the lyrics. But it's not a night for singing. We drive on without the human voice. The saddest of instruments. Where should we go? She asks me. I say I don't know. We've run through all of her friends. Most of my friends are away at college. Some live at home with their parents. But we can hardly rock up to their houses with our story and all its moving parts. The one who isn't at college or at home is dead. While I was at Dartmouth Bob Stone went to prison. We didn't write for the four years I was gone, not even during the year he spent behind bars. Rumor has it he was raped inside. All I know for sure is that when they released him he walked down to where the trains passed the river and lay down on the railroad tracks. They're going to hate me even more, she says, and I know by they, she means my parents when they get back from Moscow and find out you took their car. They don't hate you and they won't find out. You are a long tall dad said he liked my corn cob pipe when I worked in his office at the university. It was like the one his grandmother smoked. You told me. She was standing right there. She didn't say anything. I knew Stella meant my mother. She must hate me now that we're together. Why would she hate you? Because my dad liked your pipe. I'm sure she wonders what's wrong with you. I'm not the first old woman you've been with. Afro pessimist. A F R O P E S S I M I S M 11940 isn't old. I'm old enough to be your mother. You would have been 16. It's my way of saying, I'm sick and tired of your negativity. Sick and tired of hitting set at strangers' houses with stories about being followed, about Capelay Kenyatta and his henchmen, about Josephine poisoning our flat with radiation, about the FBI and U.S. Marshals and whoever else doesn't want you, okay I, you, Stella, not me, to blow the lid off corruption in some poverty pimp program no one gives a damn about. I want to go back to Dartmouth. And that's enough about my mother. But I say none of this. Stella goes on as if she hasn't heard a thing I thought. If I were her, I'd feel threatened. All the older women you've been with. I tighten my grip on the steering wheel. My gaze is fixed on the gloom. A friend of my mother's, a woman she was in college with in New Orleans. 
sometimes left my parents' cocktail parties to come upstairs and tuck me in bed at night when I was nine years old. Her name was Leontine Dupre. Her father was a sporting man down in New Orleans, and though I never knew exactly what that meant, from the way my parents laughed when they said it I knew that it was not an occupation to aspire to. Leontine Dupre would sit on the edge of my bed as I lay there. She balanced my globe on her knee and marveled at the way I explained the topography and climate of far-off places on the globe that I would visit one day. When I was in my last year of high school, she and I went into business together, selling Amway. Once, we turned my parents' huge living room into a theater with folding chairs where 50 people from the president and vice president of the local bank to folks my parents called my little hoodlum friends from the black part of town. All sat together in the same sweaty room listening to the pyramid pitch of a major dude from Headquarters in Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 119 Afro-Pessimism 3 p. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 120 Michigan. My parents returned from one of their European sojourns a day early and walked in on the whole affair. I don't think my mother ever spoke to her friend after that. Then there was the Rada Priestess in Trinidad. It was just five years ago and I was a sophomore studying abroad. I thought my mother would be pleased since she came from New Orleans where voodoo, though in a fragmentary way, was practiced by people in our family's past. But she could only see the woman's age. I could tell Stella that story. I could lighten the mood between us. But I don't have the will to meet her halfway. 3.29 a.m. At TWE and TY 4th and Hennepin I can see up ahead the Uptown Diner. When I was a junior in high school it was called Embers and I worked there as a busboy and flirted with a grown-ass woman. As I cleared the tables of dirty dishes I tried out tired lines, you ladies need an escort to the after party, like a forger passing bad bills. One night a Pan Am stewardess, they weren't called flight attendants at the time, called my bluff and took me home and fucked me blue. I've got a long layover in Malaysia, the stewardess said before sunrise. Take my car. It was a turbocharged Trans Am. This happened more than once. Once I drove her car home at 6 a.m., I sat at my parents' kitchen table in the morning, still smelling of sex. My mother, who had seen this car once or twice before and knew no girl at my high school had given it to me, came down in her robe and looked at me sideways. Did she charge this time or was it for free? I can tell Stella this story and give her a sense that come what may, I am always on her side. But I drive in silence with a clenched jaw and my ass on my shoulders. Afro a F R O P E S S I M I S M 121 331 A.M. It suddenly dawns on me that we have abandoned our apartment without taking Jamal's gun. A fine rain coats the windshield. The streets are deserted. And I feel no need to see clearly. Colored beams from streetlights splinter on the glass. Stella tells me to turn the wipers on. More than anything, I want to go back to school. More than anything, I hate myself for this feeling. I keep thinking of the grown-ass men Stella has been with whom I can't hold a candle to. None of them would be driving aimlessly through the night, running from Josephine and the people who don't want an Urban Riser's trial. Men like Carl Eller, a Pro Bowl defensive end, or her ex-husband Uri, a Jewish biker and drug dealer who left her and the daughter they had together. Men Stella had shaped her life with when I was just a kid. What are you doing to men's men, none of I keep more it's AF Afro pessimism 3 pp I N A F R O P E S S I M I S M 121 331 A M It suddenly dawns on me that we have abandoned our apartment without taking Jamal's gun A fine rain coats the windshield the streets are deserted and I feel no need to seek clearly Colored beams from streetlights splinter on the glass. Stella tells me to turn the wipers on. More than anything, I want to go back to school. More than anything, I hate myself for this feeling. I keep thinking of the grown-ass men Stella has been with whom I can't hold a candle to. None of them would be driving aimlessly through the night, running from Josephine and the people who don't want an Urban Riser's trial. 
men like Carl Eller, a Pro Bowl defensive end, or her ex-husband Uri, a Jewish biker and drug dealer who left her and the daughter they had together. Men Stella had shaped her life with when I was just a kid. What are you doing to protect my daughter? Uri said to me when we called him after seeing Dr. Joe. He knew the answer to that. He had just spoken to Stella. I didn't need a dressing down from him. I should have shaken my head when she handed me the phone. I felt like a runaway slave who crossed the river and left his family on the other side to meet the bloodhounds alone. What are you doing to protect my daughter? That's what Uri said from his cabin somewhere in mountain time. Fuck you, Uri, and the horse you rode in on. I said, what do you expect, for me to get a gun and go upstairs and bust Josephine's door down? Uri didn't say anything. I thought, at that moment, that I had won. Cat got your tongue, white boy. But then Uri said, you don't have a gun. In my mind's eye, Uri was shaking his head. Jesus. Put Stella back on. Afro. Frank BWILDERSON31122 Over the next two-week period we asked some of our friends to spend a night at our flat. We wanted to see if they experienced the same sense of heat on their skin that we thought was the source of our burns. But we didn't tell them what Dr. Joe said. We couched it in terms of the noise and the racket that Josephine and Cody had somehow created in the radiators at night. They slept on the sofa outside of our bedroom. In the morning they told us that they felt strange sensations in their skin. One of them was a concert pianist whose sense of touch and hearing were as wired as the sense of smell in bears that can smell anxiety on a human body from five miles away. He said he had dreamed that he was on fire. He went to the bathroom and washed his face in cold water. At breakfast we would tell our friends what drive. Joe had said. They all said they would give their testimonies and sworn affidavits when the time came. Olivia, whose partner, Chase, would soon want nothing to do with us, was so concerned for our safety that she brought rolls of aluminum foil and a bucket of thin nails to the house. On a ladder, she nailed huge swaths of foil to the ceiling. She was satisfied with herself when she came down from the ladder. You're not the only one, she said to me, who's going to have their gonads burned. This'll give him a taste of their own poison. But all of this wasn't good enough for me. So I went to my parents with an honest lie. I told them I needed money to get myself together, stopping short of saying that I planned to return to Dartmouth. The money in hand, Stella and I took the bus to the suburb of St. Louis Park. The private detective that we hired came to the house the next day. I can still hear the rapid-fire frequency of audible clicks, and the way Stella gasped part in horror, part in vindication. As we watched him wave the wand of his Geiger counter around our bedroom in the living room. Today, as I write, I still feel the horror that we felt at that time. But the feeling of vindication that Stella and Afro Pessimism 3 p AFROPESSIMISM123 I had shared has gone. Today, as I write, I wish his machine had made no sound at all. He promised us he'd write a report we could take to the police. We thought we had what we needed to go to the authorities. A white detective was going to give us his report from the Geiger counter. Our friends would tell the court about the sensation of singe they felt in their skin. And then there was Dr. Joe. So we went downtown to the FBI, as well as to Tony Booza, the brand new chief of police who was known as a Democratic Farmer Labor Party reformer and not a friend of the cops beneath him. There were three agents in the conference room of the regional headquarters of the FBI. The agent who asked all the questions was a white woman. It would be wrong to say we were on cloud nine as we walked the streets of downtown from the FBI to Tony Booz's office. But it is right to say we were proud of ourselves and, the suit against urban risers aside, we both had hope in the system. Stella had calmly and meticulously told the female agent why this was a federal matter. Josephine must have violated some federal laws by bringing hazardous material home from her place of employment. That was the first reason. In order to explicate the second reason Stella told the agents the story of her suit against urban risers and all of the strange forms of low-intensity harassment we had been receiving since Noam Davidov came to the flat last fall. 
If Josephine had been recruited by shadowy figures who did not want Stella's secret recordings of Urban Riser's board meetings and the furtive copies of invoices and other documents that could prove embezzlement and collusion on the part of people in the government to be made public, then this was more than a police matter, it was something the FBI should look into in an effort to guarantee our safety from March to November. If this were a novel, I would write it in such a way as to give Frank and Stella a bit more common sense. They wouldn't act so rashly. Afro-pessimism Frank B.W.I.L.D.E.R.S.O.N. 3 124 They would know not to be so naive as to think that one federal agency would help them investigate a can of worms that could lead to the indictments of an unknown number of people in another federal agency. In order to keep two black people alive long enough to win a large settlement and send their colleagues to jail. That wouldn't make narrative sense. But it wasn't a novel and we were tired and hurt and bursting with hope. A week went by and no one called, not even the private detective. We went back to the FBI. This time they were hostile. The white woman even yelled at me when I asked her to tell me what steps she had taken to investigate our claims. She told us we had to leave. There was archness in her voice when she said, The only reason we listened to you at all was because of your father and his position. She flung her arm toward the Mississippi River, at the university. The second time we went to see him, Tony Buza told his secretary to tell us he was gone. We thanked her and said we'd try to get him next week. Instead, we sat for at least an hour on a smooth wooden bench down the hall from his office. We saw him come out of a door a ways down the hall from the door to the reception area. He had taken two or three steps in our direction before he saw us. He turned and walked briskly in the other direction. We ran down the hall as fast as we could. The reformer's face was wild with rage as he told us to leave him alone. One by one our friends told us they were sorry. Sorry, but they couldn't go through with it. They all felt bad about backing out, and consciously, we did not hold it against them. I think that Olivia might have felt the worst about it. If we needed anything, she said, anything besides her testimony, she would be there for us. The concert pianist had just been accepted to medical school. He told me his dad told him to have nothing to do with me or with Stella and her case. I asked him when, precisely, his father had warned him off. AFROPESSIMISM 125, he gave me a look that said he didn't know what I meant. Did your father raise this out of the blue? I clarified, before you told him about the night you spent on our sofa. Or did he give you this advice after you told him about spending the night? He didn't answer me. He didn't have to. I asked him, I begged him to let me speak with his father. Someone got to him, I explained. Someone's getting to everyone. But he just held both his palms in the air and shook his head and walked away. It took me an hour to go by bus to St. Louis Park where the private detective's office was. Like Booz's secretary, the detective secretary lied to my face. He's been on a case in North Dakota, he'll call you first thing when he gets back. We were on the second floor of a modest office building. To her back was a large bay window. He scuttled through the parking lot. I told her to turn around. I called her a liar and I ran. I took the stairs two, sometimes three at a time. I know he heard me as I ran through the parking lot and told him to stop. Five maybe ten yards away, we made eye contact in his side view mirror. He drove away. For several nights the noise in the radiators and the burning sensation in our skin continued. Stella called the management for the third or fourth time since this had begun. Stella's name was on the lease. She told me they told her that Cody had told them that we were lying, that Stella had physically assaulted Josephine, that we were disruptive elements living in the courts, and that a person was living there at me. Who shouldn't be there? Translation, we might have to raise your rent. The hydraulics of forces known and unknown had become too much to bear. I stole my parents' fern green station wagon with faux wood panels and 13 stickers from the national parks. Stella and I made sure that Cody saw us vacating the flat. And Josephine surely saw us from her upstairs window. Afro
Frank BWILDERSON 3126 It says the faces of all the people who put us up. I marveled at the way Stella could hold her head high when she asked people if we could stay with them. She was calling in her chips for gifts of her time and guidance that she had given to them over the years. A young white woman said 10 years ago, as a student at the U, she'd learned more from Stella than she had from any of her professors. Stella seemed to be whatever these white people wanted her to be, a source of psychic sustenance, Hattie McDaniel to Vivian Lee. I grew hot with shame whenever we rocked up to the house of someone from her past and she fed them what they needed in order to let us stay. But she spoke to them as if access to their homes were her birthright, and in some true way it was. But something always happened, a parent of the young radical that Stella had groomed might not want us there anymore, or our presence through the calculus of someone else's life into disarray. And we had to leave. A few nights before we ended up at Olivia and Chase's place, we both had a eureka revelation. Josephine and Cody thought we'd left for good, we surmised. If we parked my parents' station wagon by the university and walked six blocks late at night, we might be able to sneak back in the flat and sleep in our own bed. We thought if we were careful not to flush the toilet until we were sure Josephine had gone to work and that Cody wasn't around, if we used flashlights at night, and if we let the blinds stay closed, we might be able to stay for a couple of nights without notice and without being burned, assuming they thought we were gone and had dismantled whatever they'd used on us before we sent Malika away and vacated the premises the first time. Forty years later my chest still tightens and I feel a phantom wound on my skin near my groin when I think of the morning we woke up in our own bed to the sound of tires crushing the gravel in the courtyard. We peeked through the blinds. We didn't recognize Afro Pessimism 3 pp. INDD 120. AFRO PESSIMISM 127 The car. It was more pristine than any car that usually came to the courts. The woman from the FBI got out. I was stunned by a rush of joy. Just as I thought at last we'd LL get justice. As she walked toward the house, she veered to the side. We heard the muffled spike of her heels on Josephine's steps. They were up there for 30 minutes or more. Then the same muffled sound of shoes descending, but this time it was doubled. They stood outside next to her car talking amicably. As they shook hands like old friends we knew we had to leave again. 13 37 a.m. Uptown Minneapolis. Stella says she knows an ex-weatherman. We can crash at his crib. Not only had the weathermen and women found safe houses for the Black Liberation Army, but they had made false driver's licenses and purchased guns in shops where black buyers couldn't without being put on a list marked in need of surveillance. When the war ended they grew tired of the rank isolation of being on the run. They missed their moms and pops and their friends, but most of all they came to the realization that they were not black, they were not genealogical isolates slaves whose relational status had been denied them from the day they were born. They had chosen this life of armed response against the state. They woke up one morning and realized that the color of their skin meant this isolation wasn't a fait accompli. In September 1979, Jaleel Muntaki, a Black Panther turned Black Liberation Army soldier, sent a communique from prison that expressed his sense of betrayal on the part of the kind of white revolutionary Stella and I were on our way to see Ap Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 128 by 1973 to 75. Euro-American revolutionary armed forces refused to give meaningful material and political support to the Black Liberation Movement, more specifically, to the Black Liberation Army. Thereby, in 1974, the Black Liberation Army was without an above-ground political support apparatus, logistically and structurally scattered across the country without the means to unite its combat units. Abandoned by Euro-American Revolutionary Armed Forces, and being relentlessly pursued by the state reactionary forces Quintelpro, FBI, CIA and local police departments, at UWENTY 6th and Hennepin, I parked near a phone booth. Moonlight glistens in the rain-slick street. 
I asked her why she didn't mention her weatherman before. She tells me he could still be under surveillance. No cars are behind us and, as far as I can see, from here to TWE and TY 8th Street where a nip in humps in a small bridge over the railroad tracks there is no one ahead of us either. How will we know if he's not still under surveillance? We won't know, she says, unless they want us to. And that could be worse than not knowing. On the southwest corner of TWE and TY 6th and Hennep and I am 8 years old again, with two wrinkled dollars for a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. My mother is waiting in the car. This is the only KFC with elegance, my mother tells me, the only one wedged in the protruding corner of a stylish Victorian complex of flats. Reminiscent of the triangular flat iron building in New York. The door is built into the base angle of the building and above the threshold twirls a giant red and white striped bucket with the colonel's face emblazoned on it. This is the memory that floats back to me as I watch Stella put coins into the telephone. How I loved buying food for my mother. Afro pessimism 3 pp. Indd 128 Afro pessimism 3 pp. Indd 1281 22 20ths 940. Afro pessimism 129. I loved skipping into KFC beneath that giant candy cane striped bucket of chicken that rotated on a rod above the door. But at night, however, I dreamed the striped bucket fell on my head and cracked my skull. I would wet the bed and wake up hungry. It's raining harder now. Stella cradles the phone. She slides the door and sprints to the car. I lean over and open her door. How much did you tell him? I ask her. I said I'd explain when we got there. I plead with her not to tell him about Josephine. And don't tell him that we saw the FBI agent who was supposed to be helping us go into her flat. He can handle it, she says. She tells me he's seen and heard of worse. I gird myself. I follow my breath in and out of my nostrils. Count to ten and hope to die, the saying goes, and don't say anything else. But she can read my mind. There's more than a hundred thousand dollars at stake, in this case that'll take urban risers down for corruption, she says. We could be in Spain or Morocco right now. I wouldn't be on welfare. Malika would be here, if all I wanted was the money. 3.51 a.m. A dark form draws nearer in the rear view mirror. But we are still arguing and it doesn't take shape as a word in my mind. Now cats of light claw in the mirror. I floor the accelerator. Don't speed. Stella warns. He's in my ass. Slow down, the streets are wet. I slow down, as she says, but he draws up to our bumper and Afro pessimism 3 pp. INDD 129 Afro pessimism 3 pp. Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 130 blinds us even more with his high beams. I speed up and she says, you're going to get us killed. 351, 308 AM. I switch lanes from right to left and for a few seconds the car behind us comes into focus as something more than a hulking shape in a shroud of light. I knew it wasn't a patrol car, no rotating beacons of blue running the width of its hood, no protect and serve painted on its sides. Nor does it seem like a watch commander's unmarked sedan. Mosaics of soot and salt are splashed on its flank, suggesting an absence of institutional care, no indoor garage. No slew of men pressed into service for her cleaning and upkeep as the case would be if the car belonged to the cops. This car is driven by someone who doesn't keep a record of his kills. I press down on the gas, though I know I don't have the nerve to drive at the speed it will take for us to get away. He swoops in behind us. 3 hours, 51 minutes and 45 seconds a.m. I'm not hallucinating. He's so close he'll ram us from behind if I stop or slow down. I suddenly know why Stella won't settle out of court. She wants to see the face or faces of the force behind the torment she suffered during and after, and, in some strange way, even before, her ordeal with urban risers. She wants to flush them out into the open. Tonight, I want the same thing, to know, to see the face behind us. I grip the steering wheel as I would his throat. Fuck the dumb shit. I jerk the steering wheel to the right. No Frank, but all I hear are my needs. We lurch into the right-hand lane. Then I slam the brakes. 
still as the body snaps forward and back like a punching bag, and the car that Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 100. AFROPESSIMISM 131 was behind us lurches forward in the left hand lane. Now he starts to run. Nope you don't, I think. I must see your face. Down this wet city street we race at 50 miles per hour. Suddenly he slows, as though he wants to be caught. Holy shit, we don't have Jamal's gun. 3 hours 51 minutes and 47 seconds AM. I turn to my left and see that he is alone. Rage roils in my brain because he will not look at me. From what I can see, he doesn't look as I thought he would look. I have thought about him many times since the day Noam Davidov came to the house with the news of Stella's trial date. And his somber admission that though he was her lawyer he couldn't protect her in the months between his visit and her court date. J. Edgar Hoover has been dead for eight years, asterisk still, I thought when he caught us he'd be a plain clothes man dressed in grey flannel drab. A face that was pink and whisker free, a spit and polished pig. He doesn't look like that at all now. I can see hair like his flouncing up and down on that night when two men rolled out of my studio window and hightailed it down the alley. Is it the same man? I wonder. I want to see his face. Three times I look at him and then quickly back at the road so as not to run a light or anyone down. Though no one seems to be out at this hour. His hair drapes down to his shoulders. His profile reminds me of Uriah Heep that angular rogue from David Copperfield whose veneer of humility proves as empty as his morals, a man whose hands are always moist. And like Uriah Heep, he is pretending that Stella Asterisk he was the first director of the FBI and died on May 2, 1972. In Dinkytown, one could buy tie-dyed t-shirts that read J. Edgar Hoover is alive and well in hell, the day after he died. Afro, Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 132 and I are not even here. He drives down this street with the two of us speeding next to him and he won't look my way, just as I am not looking at Stella, though she is yelling, telling me to leave it alone. I yell at him, as though I think he can hear me through my glass in his. I spin the steering wheel to the left forcing him to veer into the oncoming lane. Yeah, that got your fucking attention. He swoops back into his lane. We're jostled like ragdolls in the inside of the car as I veer it away from him and the right front tire bounces up and then off the curb. This time, when I look at him, he's holding a gun. 3.56 AM. A moon swims out of a cloud. It pours crushed glass on the face of the lake. The engine hums as the station wagon idles on Lake of the Isles Parkway. Stella is saying, what possessed you to run down a white boy with a gun? She rotates her head to ease the pain in her neck. My temples are buzzing. I feel lightheaded and sick. I know I can't vomit, in this car of all cars but my hands won't let go of the wheel. The spacious home where I grew up lies three blocks north on this lakeside parkway and six blocks up the hill. Across the lake there's a hole in the night where a stone church stands vacant as any tooth, and a hole where my grammar school has carved itself into the gloom. It's strange the things that pierce your mind in the moments after you think how you could have died. Seven years have passed since the last walk my father and I took around this lake. It was summer. A hint of algae blossomed in the breeze. I was 17 and the world was new because I was new in it. I was being courted by the Dartmouth football coaches even though I was still a junior in high school. Dad and I were just a few paces from where Stella and I are parked. We were standing by a willow at the water's edge. I told him I was going to Berkeley, I said I needed to be nearer to the revolution. Not on Afro-Pessimism 3 p. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M-133 my dime, he said. That's when we saw Walter, Fritz, Mondale being pulled toward us by Lonnie, his rough collie. Lonnie strained at his leash as we talked in the thin shade of the willow, asterisk. Senator. Mondale wore penny loafers and the arms of his sweater were crisscrossed over his shoulders and neck. He had lazy eyes that gave his face a quiet kindness which belied his record on the Vietnam War. Mondale asked my father if he would stand for the House of Representatives. It probably wasn't the first time Dad had been asked to run for public office by a highly placed notable. 
Nor was it the first time he said how honored he was by an offer he would have to decline. He didn't want to leave his job as a professor and a dean. Besides, he wasn't sure that Kenwood's Republican incumbent could be beaten. At the curb of the parkway, Mondale turned and said, What are your plans after Dartmouth, son? First off, Mr. War Criminal, I'm not going to Dartmouth. I shrugged. I smiled. I told Mondale that four years was a long time, that I didn't even know what I wanted to major in. Thank you, said my dad when the senator was out of range. Answer me, Stella says for the second time. She rubs her neck, and she might have whiplash. Don't sit there like you don't hear me, Frank. The smell of puke is rising in my esophagus, churning with the rank smell of my body. An odor that I had only ever smelled on a subway in New York, when the doors opened and a man who lived rough got on. His pants looked like they had been soaked in oil and stiffened by the sun. What, I wondered, as he held the hand grip and looked right through us, is the story behind that kind of smell. The bile clogs my throat. I opened the door. I slump out and retch over Senator Mondale's shoes, a yellow spume that smells to me like lunch meat and the fecaloid rot of a swamp. Asterisk the dog wanted a walk, not a chin wag. Afro-pessimism 3p. Frank B-W-I-L-D-E-R-S-O-N-3-134-4-A-M. -E Chase saw right through me, I say. After Josephine ran us out, I began thinking about leaving. We don't even know what or who we're up against. My brain and my stomach want to explode. Stella holds me as I cry. I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin, because I'm the man and I think that it's she who should be crying, that I should be comforting her. I would look up and kiss her, but I have Mustang breath. When you have a child, you learn to hide your fear. She may have felt me flinch in her embrace, for she's quick dad, I'm not saying you're a child. You didn't leave. She kisses my forehead. I tell her that I'm sorry that my having lost it caused her pain in her neck and shoulders. Sitting up, I start to massage her, but she says we should be going. 4.45 a.m. The Seward Neighborhood Lace doilies drape like toupees on the mantel where framed family photos are displayed, toboggan sledding in Theodore Worth Park, a summer picnic by the band Shell at Lake Harriet. But no black and white scenes from the days of rage, asterisk, no portrait of Ho Chi Minh, no echoes of my expectations. Stella had said he'd been a weatherman, but it hardly seemed like the home of anyone who had fought the cops in the streets of Chicago or bombed the U.S. Capitol. And the man asterisk outraged by the Vietnam War and racism in America, in what was called the Days of Rage. Hundreds of weathermen wielding lead pipes and clad in football helmets marched through an upscale Chicago shopping district. They pummeled parked cars, smashed shop windows, and engaged the police in hand-to-hand -hand combat from October 8 through 11, 1969. Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD AFROPESSIMISM 135 himself had the ambience more of a therapist than of someone who'd thrown his body on the wheels and gears of the machine when the machine became odious and made him sick at heart. I see you're not flying your freak flag, she says. By which she means, you've shaved your beard and cut your hair. Stella and I are slow to sit down. I needed a job, he says without arch or irony in his voice, and ignoring the disappointment in hers. So I joined the human race. He asks us what brings us to his house at four in the morning. I wish he would offer us some food. But he serves only tea and honey. Tell him about your suit against urban risers. Tell him about the clicking on our telephone. Tell him why Jamal gave you a gun. Tell him about the break-in at my flat, how my books were lined in need garden rows on the floor, my type print pages scattered with care. And not a cent was stolen. Tell him that Amani Price alleged Capilay Kenyatta and the U.S. Marshals were in each other's pockets. Tell him you strained your neck as I swerved down Hennepin's wet streets playing prey and hunter with a man who enraged me because he wouldn't look at me. How a mongrel once looked at me with more connection when it raised its head from its scraps, how we made a U-turn in the middle of the street. And for some unknown reason he let us get away. But, please, Stella, don't tell him about Josephine. Stella isn't listening to my thoughts. She tells him the story from the beginning to this moment. 5.30 a.m. 
He asks her if there's more, and she shakes her head. He takes the teacups to the kitchen. When he returns he asks her what she wants from him. Salmon-colored light bleeds through creases in his Venetian blinds. We hear the hum and whir of thick-whiskered brushes Afro-pessimism 3 pp. INDD 135 Afro-pessimism 3 Frank B W I L D E R S O N 3 136 Cleaning the streets. The world is waking up. He then tells us that he's sorry but we can't stay here. I am livid. I tell Stella that I told her he wouldn't believe us. Stella asks him if that's true. There are three possibilities, he is trying to say as I get up to leave. But do I think the feds recruited Josephine to poison you? That's one possibility out of maybe three, but it's not one that I believe. Come on, I say to Stella, I've heard enough. 14 My father and I have hardly spoken since I got kicked out of Dartmouth College two years ago and I told him I wasn't going to return. So much for a seat in the House of Representatives. Mom and Dad are Democratic Party stalwarts whose oldest son is a communist. Life isn't easy for them. It's April now, and we've almost forgotten those March sheets of rain. I've just turned 24. Last month I stole my parents' car while they were in Moscow, or Peking, or was it Bremen or Belize? A two-month tour studying the pitfalls of Soviet mental health clinics, three weeks of consulting to Chinese special education administrators, a Ford Foundation study of German urban renewal, or a rescue mission of American students who smoked too much dope and we're bounced into jail in Belize, I don't know because I don't live with them anymore. Dad contacted me and asked if we could meet on Hennepin Avenue at the Uptown Diner. His full-length black leather coat made him look like Shaft with a pipe instead of a gun, asterisk. I wore an Army Navy surplus coat and my hair was cornrowed under a skull cap. He does asterisk John Shaft was a black pie, played by Richard Roundtree, in the original 1971 film Shaft directed by Gordon Parks. AFROPESSIMISM 137 missed the dinner menu and ordered a beer. He did not come to the point. But he knew Stella and I had taken his car, he might have even sensed our smell in it and known that we slept there. When I neither confirmed nor denied what he said, he changed the subject. He told me that the Iran hostage crisis had now gone on for more than 150 days. He said it was bad for Jimmy Carter's 1980 re-election. He reminded me of the importance of going to vote, by which he meant the importance of voting for Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale so that Reagan, Bush wouldn't win. I almost told him that I was going to vote for the Ayatollah Khomeini, since he and the Iranian students had released all the black embassy staff, as well as the women, the previous fall during the first days of the occupation. But my father and I had been estranged for almost two years, and sarcasm is the last refuge of the week. And even though the burns on my inner thighs had stopped stinging, and were now just a low, hot itch, I wanted him to hold me. I wanted him to let me cry. I was tense. I thought we were meeting so he could tell me, the set of face to leave Stella. She was, as he knew, 16 years older than me and had a child half my age. I thought Dad came to speechify on the pitfalls of entering a ready-made family, with a woman on welfare and her biracial kid but he never showed dissatisfaction with anyone I'd ever dated and, besides, he liked Stella, for they had been colleagues in the College of Education at the university. I didn't balk as he went on about voting, but when he asked when I planned to go back to Dartmouth and finish my degree, I pushed back from the table. He held up his hand. Forget Dartmouth, he conceded, I need to tell you something. He said he shared a pew at the Basilica of St. Mary with the regional director of the FBI, Special Agent Lindbergh. As he spoke, his face was creased with concern. When Dad and Mom left Mass Afro Pessimist Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 138 Last Sunday, Special Agent Lindbergh pulled me by the button after church. This is where my memory plays tricks on me. Sometimes I remember my father saying that Lindbergh told him to tell me and Stella to leave it alone. Sometimes I see us sitting in the booth at the diner and he tells me this. Special Agent Lindbergh shares a pew with me. He told me that you went to his office and spoke with his agents. 
When I remember it like that the words leave it alone are not on Dad's lips, they are uttered through his eyes. Dad didn't ask me what the it was that I and Stella must leave alone, nor did I ask how Lindbergh explained it, or if he even did. Looking back on it now, I'm reminded of a scene from a time before diners and station wagons, a time when we were still chattel slaves. It's a scene from the film Twelve Years a Slave. Solomon Northup, the slave who, in 1853, penned his life story from which the film was adapted, hangs by his neck from a tree. The tips of his toes touch the ground. It's the only thing that keeps him alive. From the balcony of the big house the overseer wields a shotgun and looks down on him. Slave cabin doors start to open as the slaves begin to go about their day. No one looks at Solomon. No one asks what the it was that got him strung up in that tree. They just tend their meager gardens and fix their meager meals. They know the folly of calling up to the overseer for an explanation. They know it would be suicide to cut Solomon down. They know how to go unnoticed. If I'd been asked 24 if it was me or dad hanging from the tree, I would have said me. But now I know it's all of us, Solomon, Stella, me, Malika, my mother and father, and all the people who came out that cell tree by a day and didn't see a thing. And Special Agent Lindbergh was in the balcony looking down on us all. We left the uptown diner together. As I opened the door of a blue and white cab I drove part-time he hugged me until I felt his life begin to wake in mine. In the crush of his arms I almost cried. Your Afro-pessimist. AFROPESSIMISM 139 Our eldest child, he said, in a voice I hardly recognized. Please call your mother. We love you. I should have driven straight north on Hennepin through downtown and crossed the Mississippi to southeast Minneapolis where I had lived with Stella and Malika until we sent her away. Instead, I drove west three blocks and parked by the shore of Lake of the Isles. It was the shank of the evening. A man and a woman in a canoe picked their way through the lily pads to the shore, where a willow I had known since the age of six dipped its beard in the water. Now the sun was setting behind stone mansions that slumbered along Lake of the Isles Parkway. They looked like bunkers abandoned in war. A loon food. In grade school I had played bantam hockey when the lake froze out to the island where a loon now hid among the reeds. I was six blocks from my childhood home but it felt like a foreign land. I'm sure Special Agent Lindbergh was a pious man, most people were who sat in my parents' pew. But the quality of his character is not what's at issue, nor should it be if we want to understand Lindbergh's paradigmatic position compared to that of black people. Less than nine years had passed since a group of anti-war activists broke into an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, on March 8, 1971, grabbing whatever documents they could find and in that way exposed the labyrinth of violence that J. Edgar Hoover had created. Thanks to the investigative research of William Maxwell, we know a good deal about this violent labyrinth that protects our freedom. Maxwell's FBI's How J. Edgar Hoover's Ghost Readers Framed African American Literature Broke the Story which revealed that the largest African-American literature department does not exist on a university campus but is a part of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In fact, the year 2019 marked the 100th anniversary of this department within the FBI whose special agents read and analyzed the nation's black poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction. But Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 140 This literary, investigative department is not just an FBI think tank. For 100 years it dug its secret talents into the lives of black writers by harassing them at home and overseas. By adding or subtracting their names to a running list the FBI keeps of the most dangerous by which they mean influential. Black writers who should be rounded up and incarcerated in an internment camp in the event of widespread unrest in the black community. This FBI department has even launched literary journals to help special agents capture New black writing from emerging black writers, the FBI keeps lots of unpublished manuscripts of black writers on file and it keeps tabs on their authors. As much as it does on established writers, asterisk. So, 
we have the impact of libidinal economy, the phobic notion that blacks are and always have been a threat to stability, coupled with the structural violence of state capacity. The Federal Bureau of Investigation's African American Literature Department, which was started in 1919, when J. Edgar Hoover read a poem by Harlem Renaissance poet Claude McKay, If We Must Die, a poem that was a response to the anti-black race riots of the 1910s. Hoover would have been more strategic as a crime fighter if, instead of demonizing McKay for writing a poem about self-defense, he had set up a white American literature department so that he and his agents could take the violent pulse of white civil society. Since the riots McKay referenced in his poem were the violence of lynch mobs that invaded the black community. The FBI example of literary lockdown can help us reimagine black incarceration, not as a place in space and time, that's only one iteration of incarceration. But to think of incarceration as a paradigm of permanent and ongoing containment that non-blacks would Afro-pessimism calls human beings pass in and out of. But one in the which black people greet them upon arrival, bid them farewell when history liberates asterisk for Maxwell's book FBI's. AFROPESSIMISM 141 them, and remain, awaiting the next provisional round of unfortunate souls. There is no golden age for blacks before the criminal law. Structural vulnerability to appropriation, perpetual and involuntary openness, should be understood as the paradigmatic conditions of black existence in the Americas, the defining characteristics of New World anti-blackness. Policing blacks in the colonial and antebellum periods was... Dot dot. The prerogative of every white they could assume the role or not and was only later professionalized. As the modern prison system emerged out of the ashes of Reconstruction, this raises the next conundrum. One in which for black people it is impossible to discern where the violence of the state ends and the violence of one's white neighbors begins. It was this conundrum that forced me and Stella from our home. 15 Hanover, New Hampshire, May 1980. The students, the professors, and even the deans on the College Committee on Standing and Conduct are not the same as the ones who kicked me out two years ago and told me to get a job in a corporation or enlist in the Army before I petitioned to return. I pruned my afro and shaved my beard, and I wore a blue necktie in lieu of an elegant noose. A dean asks me what I have been doing for the past two years. Like windows to compartments in a train passing swiftly on the track next to mine, I see the answers flicker by. I hitchhiked in a blizzard from Minneapolis to Columbus, Ohio. I smoked hash with a wounded Green Beret who picked me up at the St. Croix River. He was tattooed with bullet wounds on both Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 141 Afro-Pessimism 3PP, INDD 1411, 22 20th 945 AM January 20. Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 142 arms from his wrists to his shoulders, where the flak jacket caught the spray as it crossed his chest during the Tet Offensive. I slept in a homeless shelter and worked a labor. I hauled garbage in Columbus. I tripped on LSD for the 11th time, a squirrel in a park dropped an acorn from its mouth just to tell me, Jesus saves. I know Jesus saves, I said with impatience, but where the hell does he shop? The squirrel jumped out of a bag, it got all sitity and told me it could not divulge such details. I came down off my high and went back to Minneapolis three months after you kicked me out. A four-night stint as a stand-up comic in a country and western bar, they wanted Red Fox, who, as it turned out, got his start with Malcolm X before he went mainstream, but I gave them Lenny Bruce. I didn't last the week. For a month or two I worked for Prince, as a bouncer at his nightclub in a hollowed-out Greyhound station in downtown Minneapolis, just a block off Hennepin Avenue. I got a beatdown from two drunk-ass white dudes and a woman in the middle of the club. But the College Committee on Standing and Conduct should take into consideration that I stayed on my feet for a minute, at least then, my hands and knees did their best. Was it strobe lights or the stars that exploded in my eyes when the woman hit the back of my head with a mug or a bottle of beer? She rode my back like a steer and all kinds of niggers rained down on my neck from her sweet blonde mouth while the men kicked me in the ribs. I earned good money waiting tables. But that didn't last and I don't know why. 
or, I do know why, but if I told you you'd have to hear the rest, how I fell in love with Stella, how we were stalked by ghosts. The train passes. With its windows of unspeakable scenes. I give the Dean the other truth. Freelance journalism for Twin Cities newspapers, I worked as a researcher for the Urban League. A PR person for the Legal Aid Sociafro Pessimism AFROPESSIMISM 143 Eddie of Minneapolis, and I studied Dickens and Hardy for two quarters at the University of Minnesota. The Dean, as I speak, is reading my updated file. As he reads, he says, there are gaps between jobs that are unaccounted for, and almost nothing here on the last three months. 16 across the green are Reed, Wentworth, and Fair Weather Halls, the long white colonial buildings with their latticed windows winged with shutters painted Brunswick green. I smiled to myself remembering my first night in my Fair Weather dorm room six years ago in 1974 and wonder who that newly minted man was. Staring up at the ceiling as he lay in bed and wanted to leave. Now students and alums decked in green sweaters with white D's emblazoned walk up and down a sunny main street as though they have nothing to fear. There's a scent of pine needles in the air and conifers smother the mountains that surround the town of Hanover. People here say it hasn't been this warm in weeks. The grass on the college green is dry. In an oak-paneled phone booth in the Hopkins Center I feed the coins lot with quarters. Two years have gone by. Long enough for me to have forgotten why I stopped calling home from this booth that's third in the line of booths. There's graffiti here that reads, The nigger is living proof that the Indian fucked the buffalo. But the quarters have dropped and her phone is ringing and today I'm too happy to be hurt. Stella, they let me back in. Oh, that's great. How? They were confused about the charges. In the end the dean looked at the last lines of my sentence, from 1978, and said, it's Frank B W I L D E R S O N three one hundred forty four to get back, and you have to show that you've inculcated the esprit de corps of an Ivy League institution. So we put it to you: in the past two years, have you inculcated the esprit de corps of an Ivy League institution? Like there was more than one answer. Everyone on the committee nodded when I answered, and that was that. I'm going to start house hunting be back by, say, Saturday, and we'll come out together and then send for Malika. I'll be an Ivy League graduate soon. I'll get a fancy job and pay for you to finish your BA. After the trial I'll have my own money for school. We're coming back in November for the trial, right? Well L, yes. Promise? We'll go with Gnome to and from the courthouse. We'll just be in Minneapolis for a few days. It could take longer. Okay, Stella, as long it takes. 17. There's a photograph of Stella that I took with my Miranda camera in Morocco. We were on a key in Tangier about to board the hydrofoil to Gibraltar. It was taken four years after that night on Hennepin Avenue, the rock of Gibraltar, Spain, and a blue, misty sea lace the background behind her. At home, in the darkroom, I felt a tremor of grief when I saw how worn thin was her smile in that photo. It made me think of the way she looked when we left the house of her weatherman friend and sat in the uptown diner. Planning our next move in a room drizzled with insomniacs and a rendezvous of strangers at the counter by the coffee urn. Vacation photos shouldn't remind you of Afro-Pessimism 3 pp. A-F-R-O-P-E-S-S-I-M-I-S-M 145 That kind of past. I stayed in the darkroom and superimposed a photograph of colored lanterns I took on the outdoor patio of a Chinese restaurant in Torremolinos. That the I might be distracted from that night on Hennepin Avenue. 18 Before we left the ex-weatherman's apartment he had tried to explain as best he could why we couldn't stay. I don't want to think that my tribe is hardwired for evil, he had told us. Then he said when the Vietnam War ended and the weather underground started to disband, some people who wanted to go on fighting went south and infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. For a long time he had tried to forget the stories one of them told when he returned. He said there were no limits to the imagination down there when it came to the violent acts committed against black people. They get migraines, his friend said communal pressure on the brain, if they go too long without killing someone or burning someone. Stella, I can fight the war machine but I can't fight that, he said.
The U.S. Marshals won't let you bring those tapes and invoices to C.O.U.R.T. The ex-weatherman said even if the U.S. Marshals weren't running interference for Capel A. Kenyatta, some agency was. The FBI scares me, but it's only f they he s for a long then he I don't eighteen that the I a vacation photos shouldn't remind a f r o p e s s i m i s m one hundred forty five that kind of past. I stayed in the dark room and superimposed a photograph of colored lanterns I took on the outdoor patio of a Chinese restaurant in Torremolinos. That the I might be distracted from that night on Hennepin Avenue. 18 Before we left the ex-weatherman's apartment he had tried to explain as best he could why we couldn't stay. I don't want to think that my tribe is hardwired for evil, he had told us. Then he said when the Vietnam War ended and the weather underground started to disband, some people who wanted to go on fighting went south and infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. For a long time he had tried to forget the stories one of them told when he returned. He said there were no limits to the imagination down there when it came to the violent acts committed against black people. They get migraines, his friend said communal pressure on the brain, if they go too long without killing someone or burning someone. Stella, I can fight the war machine but I can't fight that, he said. The U.S. Marshals won't let you bring those tapes and invoices to C.O.U.R.T. The ex-weatherman said even if the U.S. Marshals weren't running interference for Capel A. Kenyatta, some agency was. The FBI scares me, but it's only fear, he admitted. Everyday people like Josephine terrify me. It's like looking at the face of my mother or of me. I'm terrified by the intimacy. That female agent from the FBI might have just made a routine visit to Josephine. The facts of the matter aren't the point. The point is, it's the North but it's just like the South. By which he meant, you can't tell where the people end in the pig's Afro-pessimism 3 pp. I am Frank B. W. I. L. D. E. R. S. O. N. 3 146 begin in the Hall of Mirrors through which Stella and I were running. Then he laughed for the first time that morning, but it wasn't a laugh that gave him relief. The pigs and my mother, or the pigs and me, for that matter. He stopped. Then he said, you know me, Stella, I was in the trenches when I thought it made sense, but I can't fight an army of ghosts. It's because I believe you that I'm asking you to leave. Afro 147